so that at least we are sure that uh, uh, we have the NACI Council's approval to kickstart. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Um, program director, thank you for this uh, brief moment. I won't be very long because we already opened this particular colloquium last night. Um, and we offered a few uh, key remarks uh, at that, you know, in terms of the opening session um, last night. But I'm just going to highlight a few key issues. Um, one is around the centrality of the role of, um, of NACI, which is primarily to stimulate uh, discussion um, and, and generate insights around the role of science, technology, and innovation, um, uh, including how effectively it is working, and offer the necessary advice uh, in respect of society, in respect of the economy, and where such advice actually needs to have a particular uh, impact um, um, uh, on society and the economy uh, and enable policy uh, choices um, that actually need to guide the governance of our, of our system. Um, the minister implored us last night in his um, presentation to be a bit more robust in our discussions, um, to look at a far broader range of issues that actually require us to um, consider the role of science and technology um, uh, in industrialization uh, through innovation uh, and the impact uh, of science and technology on society and how these bring the necessary solutions towards um, our, um, uh, uh, our growth and development as, as, as a society. He also indicated the, 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 the approach that the government is following, which is largely through a whole of government approach, uh, which requires a strong coordination um, and a lot of uh, support towards implementation, um, uh, particularly with a view towards the implementation of the de decadal plan that the minister also indicated um, is one of the key instruments around how we're driving science and technology innovation and indicated that this is now being driven through the Interministerial Committee on Science and Technology and Innovation, which is chaired by the Minister for Science uh, uh, and, and Technology. And fortunately, as um, the CEO also indicated um, yesterday, NACI plays a central role in providing um, insights or, or support to that particular uh, committee of, 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 of cabinet. We, we highlighted a couple of things yesterday and, and some of those are around, are around the concerns in respect of investments and participation of the private sector um, on science and innovation um, and how this impacts the, the growth uh, of, our, of, of our economy, but also how that impacts around socioeconomic economic development. We also had a discussion yesterday, although I'll be very briefly, around issues of, of climate change and how science and technology needs uh, to be used uh, towards uh, dealing with the, the right kind of solutions to enable uh, the economy and society to be re resilient to the impacts um, of, 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 um, uh, of, of climate change. Today, we continue with even much more robust discussions led uh, by uh, some of the, the esteemed colleagues in the room um, uh, that are going to be focusing uh, uh, also on the decadal plan. Uh, and this will be led by a discussion presented by uh, the Deputy Director General, uh, who's, in the, who's in the room, uh, Dr. Dan. Um, there will also be a discussion on the, the science and technology in development, sustainability, uh, uh, transitions and, and inclusivity, the STI investments and incentives, the STI and COVID-19 pandemics and the future pandemics, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, education and uh, training and innovation. Program director, I think that sums up 
uh, the kind of areas around which we, you know, we would be having a range of discussions. These will also be facilitated through panel discussions. We hope all the participants that are in the room, as well as those that are online, um, will participate in these particular discussions. Um, with those few words, let me say welcome to all of you, uh, the Deputy Director General representing the department, the members of NATKI Council, uh, the Secretariat, the, um, the, the experts that are helping us in these discussions, the panel members, we really appreciate your contributions and your participation. We hope that today will be very fruitful to all of you and that we would come out of this particular um, colloquium uh, with further insights around how we drive um, the, uh, the, 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 the national system of innovation towards a much more impactful and developmental uh, society. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I was wondering, Chairperson, if people would clap hands for you. Yeah. See, if not, then we're going to make sure that they don't they don't enjoy lunch. Eh? <laughs> because, you know, um, yeah, so. Colleagues, Africa needs needs to to be needs to 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 be rejuvenated. We are of the view that if Nigeria and South Africa could strengthen its cooperation, uh, Dan and Hillary. And given our bias here, if they could utilize STI in, as a catalyst for uh, creating an inclusive and sustainable social economic development in the continent, then Africa stands a chance, a real chance uh, of reclaiming its rightful position in the world of nations. This is part of the reason why we have thought, let's have a discussion. And let's explore what these two giants, economic giants in Africa uh, are thinking about uh, what needs to be done in the next 10 years. But we also want to explore uh, possibilities of how the two systems can cooperate towards a common vision. Uh, Dan Tutoit is well known to most of us. He, he, he holds, is currently the Deputy Director General International Cooperation and Resources uh, at the Department of Science and Innovation. He's a diplomat. Um, so he's a real diplomat in a true sense of the word. So it's not that he's working in the international is a is a diplomat, well trained diplomat. Uh, he had worked at uh, the previous foreign affairs department, which is now Terco, uh, and he has served as well uh, in Europe and played a central role in the establishment and management of uh, European South African science and technology advancement programs, and a range of other uh, areas. The system. The NSI has benefited uh, greatly or immensely from various interventions which were partly initiated and led uh, by Dan. Dan, let me invite you to do your presentation. Um, let's welcome uh, Dan to do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Mapuli Mulungisi, for that uh, introduction. Good morning, dear, dear colleagues and friends. Indeed, thank you very much for inviting the Department of Science and Innovation to present not on our decadal plan, but on your decadal plan, specifically within the context of reawakening Africa and advancing development in our continent. Now, in reflecting on what I should say on the decadal plan and also speaking with my director general last night, we were wondering if I should even do that because the minister very eloquently 
spoke last night about a strategic intent of the plan in Dr. Tseli's presentation, given Naki's cardinal role in the preparation of the plan, many of the aspects were, were explained. And I'm sure many of, well, all of you in this room should have already seen the slides I'm, I'm going to, 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 to show, because if you've not seen them, I should have respectfully wonder where you've been for the past two years, or something's wrong with, with our consultation process. But, but all, of that, all of that said, there's never too uh, much of a, of a good thing. And as I've emphasized, this is our plan, South Africa's plan, and um, it, it's always good to, to, to just refresh um, us on the latest developments. And I'm going to be very brief on the actual reflection on the plan. I mean, the bad news is I have 27 slides, but I can already say I'm going to rush through them at breakneck speed to leave time for, 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 for discussion. But as Mulungisi said, uh, the focus really in addition to, to, to just uh, presenting the plan is to look perhaps in a little bit more detail on the focus on internationalization within the plan, and then very specifically looking at our commitment and our ambition for enhancing uh, intra-African and pan-African collaboration through the decadal plan. So this slide I'm not gonna talk about, we all know the context, but what I should say this morning is a bit of a reunion for those in the science and innovation policy community. And I see many of the founding mothers and fathers, Professor Maharaj, Professor Khan, Dr. Bokmaria, and others here, who we have to thank for the journey we have walked over many, many years, and others as well, to, which led to the um, preparation of the, the Cadel Plan. I'm not going to say anything about the global context or the local context, the unfolding global developments, increased insecurity, uh, decreased commitment to multilateralism, cl um, climate change, the poverty, the persistent inequality of poverty in our country. This all shapes our thinking of the, the Cato plan. And of course, uh, Dr. Sely spoke about it uh, la la last night. Point just again here to interview many of, uh, to, to emphasize many of you played an integral part in the background work, the analytical work, the preparatory work, which shaped the Cato plan. And again, here I should, uh, emphasize our thanks, Dr. Sele and Dr. Mukwele, to Naki for, for, your, for your work, which informed the preparation of the, of the plan. Then just perhaps to, to, to just remind us, what do we seek to achieve? We, again, the emphasis is on we, because it's a collective plan. We want to, to truly further enhance this national system of innovation of ours, make it more inclusive, make it more co coherent, better coordinated, and above all, responsive to the needs for our South Africa. That requires us to, to work together to create a more enabling environment for innovation in South Africa, bolster and enhance our human resource development for science and innovation, expanding uh, and transforming our research system. And of course, all of that requires funding. So we need to, to, um, to enhance in, uh, increase investment in science, technology, and innovation. And the, the critical important point here is to come to the Specific theme for this morning's address is that expanded and strategic internationalization is see as a key cross-cutting and enabler for the development of the national, uh, uh, for, for the implementation of the Decadal Plan. Um, the minister and Dr. Sely spoke about this, this last night, the focus of, of, of the plan, making sure we impact, got the warning, the advice from Naki concretely through science, technology and innovation, on socioeconomic development, but at the same time, continue to work to reinforce and develop our national system uh, of innovation. Of course, the, the plan introduces the, the key societal, multi um, uh, disciplinary societal challenges to which science, technology, and innovation is required to, to respond. So, we not, it's not technology or scientific discipline specific, but it's all about how do we harness the possibility of knowledge and innovation to respond to the challenges. Of course, the important point to emphasize as well is that the commitment to investment in basic research, fundamental research remains as, as, as strong as ever. The minister spoke about this last night and he said the address key, the key sort of golden thread which runs through the societal challenges identified is the um, support for the just transition. Um, this slide was in Dr. Teles um, presentation as well. The, the new governance framework, not only foreseen, currently being implemented, we've already had a first meeting of the Interministerial Committee, second one is foreseen within the com coming weeks, and preparation is ongoing for the first presidential plenary um, to be convened um, in March of 2023. 
And of course, key, the outcome, the output to which we are working for is this first adoption of the innovation and skills compact, which will, which, which will be really that, a compact, a commitment by senior government leaders, senior scientific leaders, senior industry leaders, senior civil society leaders on the various interventions which are required in order for the potential of science and innovation in South Africa to, to uh, be unleashed. And, and there are already a number of themes currently being further developed for inclusion in that compact. This range from education and skills development, arresting intellectual property leakage, uh, very important, uh, how do we use public procurement, which is currently underutilized as a tool for boosting innovation, um, looking at the governance of disruptive technologies, for example, the impact of ethics, uh, of, of artificial intelligence on ethics, et cetera. I see some of you are taking um, photos of the slides. We certainly can also email this to you. Nothing is secret in here. And we, I even have a longer version than a 27 slide version as well with more detail. <laughs> with, with, more, with, with more detail. Yeah, if, definitely. Um, we, after extensive consultation with user communities, with, with, with the community, we have now converged on these first three grant societal challenges, which will be at the heart of the, the plan, climate change and sustainability. No surprise, given the, the education crisis in South Africa, how do we future-proof education and skills development, and indeed reflecting on the, on the future of society. Again, we're, we're happy as a department to engage with you in more detail on this, but that's not the object for this morning. Uh, objective for this morning, in addition to the grant societal challenges, the plan also proposes these large-scale science, technology, and innovation programs, innovation for a healthy population that builds on our historic investment and development in health innovation, innovation for energy security, one of the flagships would be the hydrogen economy, and then innovation for a capable and inclusive state, and the minister spoke about this la last night. And then we forgot to uh, an economic growth, the dual approach, how do we enhance the competitiveness of traditional mainstays of the South African economy, manufacturing, agriculture, but also unlocking new growth opportunities in the digital economy and the circular economy. And here we'll be working very closely. I see our colleagues from the DTIC and other sister departments here in making sure science and technology is infused within the various sector master plans currently uh, being developed. Also important cross-cutting theme of the decadal plan is the transformation of the system. Yes, we speak about demographics, we speak about institutions, we speak about spatial um, uh, transformation. Last night, the minister also folk, uh, emphasized the focus on the district development model. So in, in all of the different interventions and programs being proposed by the decadal plan, transformation features very, very prominently. And this, to, to conclude, perhaps, sums it up for me. What is the decadal plan? It's really an opportunity. Everyone in this room, and I'm privileged to, over many, many years, I've worked with many of you, not only cares about South Africa, but we deeply care about the role science, technology, and innovation in South Africa should play. And this is an opportunity for us to achieve that greater impact. And it's all really about partnership. It's about enhancing partnership by improving our governance, being much more focused from a policy and a strategic perspective, and then given, we should be very honest, in an environment which is constrained from a funding perspective, making sure we make those investments more, more uh, efficient. And yeah, this is our plan and your support for its implementation will be absolutely uh, essential. So I'm about halfway through and now coming to the specific focus, the international cooperation component. The decadal plan assumes, and I don't think anyone will disagree in this room, that international cooperation is imperative for science and innovation to progress in South Africa. We know that's been demonstrated across the world throughout ages. Knowledge advances when one works together, when you share experience, when you share expertise. We need to access international resources, international funding. We need to advance the, the uh, agenda of our own continent and contribute to the global uh, multilateral effort on science and innovation. So that's imperative for South Africa to um, have a dedicated science diplomacy strategy. Science diplomacy, unfortunately for me, has become one of those buzzwords like fourth industrial revolution, big data, et cetera, which we throw around a lot without necessarily always reflecting about what it means. But, but this definition for me really, really sums it all. It all speaks to South Africa. We need international cooperation. We need diplomacy for science to advance. Also, all the big 
topics on the international diplomatic stage, currently a science intensive, whether it's pandemic disease, whether it's energy security. Uh, and indeed, in the current environment we live in, with increased polarization, uh, multilateralism under threat, I, hopefully I mean, all, we all will agree that um, international relations need to be infused by the values, the principles of, 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 of science, of global solidarity, of transparency. Um, so we therefore believe that for South Africa, it's important to have a dedicated science uh, diplomacy strategy um, to advance science in South Africa, but also to support our, our foreign policy. And, and you see there on this slides, what are the key um, science diplomacy priorities uh, for, for the DSI? And this all then found its way into the dedicated chapter in the decadal plan, which looks at expanded and more strategic international cooperation. And there are six key interventions which are proposed. In the first, first instance, to undertake and for South Africa to be part of truly transformative international research and innovation uh, partnerships. Secondly, that to enhance our human resource development for science, technology, and innovation through an increased international mobility, student training, researcher exchange, um, that we will specifically focus on international research infrastructure partnerships to support research infrastructure development in South Africa. And then coming to my specific focus to promote and enhance science, technology, and innovation capabilities in Africa. And, and the point here to, to emphasize, which I always find is extremely important, this is not only if, from an altruistic perspective, from uh, the, the commitment South Africa has, and we have that sincerely, to advance the African Union Agenda 2063 to support regional integration in SADC. It's absolutely imperative in our own national interests. For, for science and innovation in South Africa to prosper, we need to be part of a, of a growing and a vibrant regional and continental ecosystem. As the same, same applies for from an economic and political perspective, we cannot be in isolation here on the southernmost tip of Africa. And therefore, this commitment to build African capabilities and capacities is very much in South Africa's own national interest. And then to relatively newer areas, then looking at my DTIC colleagues, specifically identifying the opportunity for greater synergy between international partnerships in science and innovation and international trade, and then also working together on promoting foreign investment in the science and innovation system. So then to conclude, what does this mean for us? Hopefully making the link with what Professor Nyang will present from Africa, from an African, African agenda. Um, I said one of our objectives is to, to in, undertake truly transformative research and innovation partnerships. Now, if the likes of uh, Professor Khan or Razigan and others will analyze the history of South Africa's investment largely through the NRF in bilateral or even multilateral R&D partnership, you will see a huge bias towards collaboration with the global north. And there are many reasons for that. It's not a value judgment. That's just the, the reality. Uh, relatively small investments in collaboration with other partner African governments. So we know that is something which has to change. And, and, and it is a political and a strategic objective for our department. And we would be desperate. I could say this as having the responsibility by my government to, to work in this area, to have a bilateral partnership with Nigeria, for example. There are good examples, good collaboration with Kenya, Egypt, most specifically in North Africa, um, some with, with, within our own region. And what we truly want to do is, is to have truly joint partnerships, which will be joint, jointly funded by us and our partner government. So there's, there's, there's true commitment. So this is, this is a strategic objective. Our National Research Foundation, Dr. Nelwa Mondo, I think I saw him this, this year, uh, has been leading really pioneering work to, to work with sister type agencies elsewhere on the continent to develop their capacities for, for, for research funding. So this is a strategic priority. This type of bilateral collaboration, also regional collaboration, should become part of the lifeblood of, of science in Africa, and it will be one of our strategic focus areas um, in, in the decadal plan. Secondly, we speak about international mobility. Yes, we, I think we all appreciate its value. Minister Pandor always used to say that no one in South Africa should get a PhD without having spent some time abroad, at least, because in addition to augmenting our own capability, this inherent value in international exposure, what really concerns us, and again, I think Professor Khan will probably know some of these statistics, they have very few South African postgraduate students at other African universities. I mean, it, it would be anecdotal. I would be happy to be proven wrong. But even the pan-African university institutions, such as those, there are never any uptake 
from South Africa. And again, there are reasons. Today's not the, 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 the day to discuss this, but we need to know this is something which has to change. In the interest of science, we need to have a next generation of South African scientists whose primary networks is also with their own continent and of course the, 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 the global South. And if we look at, and one can have another debate on the success and failures of European integration, but one of the successes of European integration has built upon the, the Erasmus programs and student mobility. We need that, we need that in Africa. So this will be a strategic priority for us to work. And then of course, research infrastructures are a critical enabler for uh, international science, science collaboration. We also know that specifically the large scale instruments, these are very expensive, they need partnerships. So we will be continuing our work to with partner countries develop regional and continental research infrastructure. A very specific focus on the enabling infrastructure which is, which is needed for, for open science, for data intensive science. We speak about high-speed research networking, uh, uh, the, the cloud, the databases, high per, um, performance computing and, and, and others. So this will be a, a strategic priority. We need this as the backbone of uh, continental and regional collaboration. Um, Promoting and enhancing the, uh, the, the STI capabilities of Africa, we continue, we will engage in the African Union and the Southern African Development Community, which is our structure, seeking to reinforce and bolster those. But also, and you said I'm a diplomat, but sometimes I have to be a bit critical, uh, not only always say the political correct things. I think all of us in the room also know many of the challenges, which we're not blaming anyone, because after all, who's the AU and SADC, it's us. But, but I was spent last week in an African Union specialized technical committee on science, technology, and innovation. And with a lot of respect and appreciation, it was one of the more challenging meetings in recent times because I'm not actually sure what we did. And as Africans, for me, the, the shame which, which sits upon us is that if you look at most of these programs, they're all implemented with donor funding. So how can we ever implement and direct our own programs? If as African government, speaking to myself, uh, you said, inquire, why don't we make these investments? Uh, I think, uh, and this is enough negativism for a Friday morning. One, one of the shames which should sit on us is, many of you will know, the AU has for many had a scientific prize for scientific excellence in Africa called the Kwame Nkrumah Prize, named after the course of one of champions of, of decolonization and independence on our continent. That price has been discontinued now for two years. The reason was because the EU stopped the donor funded program. Now that for me, it's, I don't even need to comment on that. So I mean, that's a dynamic we need to change with greater responsibility and, and more critical uh, engagement. We are very keen to look at, of course, if you know, we're gonna build the science and innovation ecosystem. There, there needs to be market opportunities in our continent. We have the Africa continental free trade area. So we need to interrogate what does that mean for r and services across borders in, in Africa. What opportunities are there then for entrepreneurs and technology, knowledge intensive companies to first of all build their markets elsewhere on the continent? So this will be a specific focus of work. And then to conclude, continue to work and promote international investment. That's something the minister said last night, making sure that international funding and international investment do not distort our own national and continental agendas. And for that, looking at what are the institutional capabilities. And I know NACI recently um, organized a very thoughtful and reflective seminar on the type of institutions, a foundation for research and innovation funding in Africa may be required. So this, these are the, the key interventions which are then proposed by the, by the decadal plan. And we certainly look forward to continue to work with all of you in partnership to, to truly reawake our continent and to advance its inclusive and uh, sustainable development. And it would be a miss for me not to use this opportunity just to remind you all that South Africa will be hosting the World Science Forum from the 6th to the 9th of December in Cape Town under the theme of science for social justice. And we certainly look forward to, to all of you there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, yeah. Well, it means we're achieving our objective if we can shake the diplomat a bit. <laughs> Colleagues, we are just waiting for Hillary stepped out to just to the bathroom quickly.
Is there anyone with a burning question to them or comment? Just quick reaction to Dan's presentation there, Rasina. The lot. Well, run out of the lots now. I'm not running an auction. Right? <laughs> so, no, I mean, it's really important, even as we understand the concept of diplomacy. Uh, Diplomacy doesn't mean cowering down. And I'm really worried that that's the sense that seems to pervade most, yeah? We walk around begging bowls. But you're, you're also raising critical issues, Dan, in terms of our responses. And if we were to appreciate what our national objectives are within that, it becomes much easier to understand who is working with us and who's working against us. It's really critical. It's not just about distorting agendas. There's a contestation taking place. And I really would encourage that we pay more attention to that contestation as well, and then appreciate why it is that people are trying to pervert our development. Thank you. No, no, I, I said it was just an immediate. Uh, Professor Inyang is here. Just note your questions. We'll raise them when uh, our brother is, is done. Let me invite you, uh, Professor. He's a former vice chancellor of Botswana University. Um, he's a visiting international research fellow at the Institute, Africa Institute of South Africa, which is part of the HSRC. He's a world renowned researcher and educator in areas such as environmental science, engineering, geohazards, and energy systems, and so forth. He's also a member of the Education Caucus of the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development and served two terms as chair of the Science Advisory Board uh, of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He's a former president of the African University of Science and Technology. Um, it is my pleasure to invite my brother to share with us um, what you have done. By the way, he led the actual plan that is going to be delivering. He was responsible for it. So we know whom to take to hold accountable if Nigeria doesn't succeed. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. His introduction is longer than my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much. With acknowledgement of uh, the excellent presentation uh, that Minister Nzimande has for many years uh, championed the cause of African development and the acknowledgement of others that I can't forget, Dr. Shedrak Mofoli and um, NASI Executive Director. For many years, we have discussed this African development issues. ESI DG, Dr. Phil Njawa, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right because I, we're discussing it the other day. And um, so many DGs, uh, DDGs of um, the, um, uh, the um, agency that uh, rules here and signs. Um, of course, we know of uh, Dan, who for so many years has championed the course of African integration, especially in the area of science and technology. And I'll say some things today to further confirm initiatives that uh, he has uh, been the critical factor uh, in uh, bringing to bear, which uh, led us actually myself and uh, Dr. Toguzani of HSRC sitting there to go to Nigeria and try to uh, uh, establish interlinkages that I'll report on today. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll rush through it. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, even in this room, I can recognize so many people that have interacted with over the several over several years on issues of science and technology. Uh, the South African Decadale Plan actually mirrors some of the things that we've done in Nigeria. I was really shocked yesterday as I sat and uh, listened and also went through some of the tidbits and the bullet points that highlighted some areas of uh, focus. And even today too, a very important remark made by Dan just a few minutes ago, 
uh, that the South African interests must focus on um, expanded and strategic internationalization. We know there are very many countries in Africa and that uh, some of them, uh, unfortunately, the socioeconomic status, talk about Togo, talk about Burundi, talk about countries like that. Uh, they have to be handheld in certain areas of science and technology and brought up by the big countries, South Africa, very important uh, uh, economy in Africa. Nigeria with its population of 220 million people, these countries cannot just be led by common sense. It has to be led by really uh, deeply analytical, uh, stealthy activities in science and technology with that as input. As we know, the stealth, the wealth and the health of nations uh, really are dependent on how much they can create systems to extract the intellect of uh, their population uh, to produce goods and services to serve their societies. And the Americas, the European countries and so forth have done that. Now the Southeast Asian countries have followed. Uh, with the Africa 2063 agenda, uh, much before that was released, President Thabo Mbeki of South Africa, was, I was then in the room, and President Obasanjo, who, is, who also loves science very much, got together to develop the uh, South Africa, Nigeria Binational Commission, knowing that these are two big countries in Africa, not only for science and tech, but for the geopolitical interest of, of Africa. They needed to do that and they did. They established that commission. And now, uh, several years later, uh, let me give great, much credit to DSI and to Dan himself and uh, others, other units within this entity led by people like Mampei, uh, who now reactivated things. When that commission by national commission was established, um, you did not have what we typically call and everybody recognizes you as a plan of action. The plan of action is important because it is the compendium of specific activities that would support such uh, international agreements that are at the diplomatic level. So right now, uh, with the help of DSI, and I have been uh, brought in, um, uh, let me reveal that although I have Nigerian origins, but I'm a Nigerian American uh, whose real job starting next, next month is a US ambassador, distinguished scholar to Ethiopia. But uh, I'm, I am, uh, I am um, a hyphenated Nigerian. So I also consider myself African <laughs> so very deeply so. And um, I will help in this process. Um, what are the, uh, if I can see very well from here, I'll take a look here. What are the components of this important? Can I go down there as a, yeah. As a common picture sometimes? Oh, great, yes. What are the uh, components of this agreement? The components of this agreement. So we have the Nigeria South Africa Binational Agreement and the Department of Science and, uh, and Innovation of South Africa is uh, this one. Okay, yes. I, I get <laughs> I get, that tells you how long I have been away from the classroom. <laughs> yes, so um, the Department of Science and Innovation has been the instigator of this. Uh, it has uh, brought me into South Africa. And then uh, we have uh, then put a lot of meat into the Binational Commission at both the ministerial level and the agency levels. Uh, especially in Nigeria, where we have just returned. Dr. Togozani of uh, HSRC sitting there and myself were sent out there. We engaged the Nigerian government uh, to establish a plan of action with some specific focus areas for the collaboration. Uh, one of the areas that we touted on both sides 
is space sciences and its application in agriculture. We recognize that um, over Africa, data are not available at the temp uh, spatial temporal scale that will be used to do things at the level of provinces, uh, villages, and in some places, states. So uh, South Africa and Nigeria as countries that have invested in space sciences. They are very strong there. They even sent two satellites into space in, in Nigeria. And then those should have ramifications and utility in agriculture and many other areas, climate change and so forth. So uh, that's one. Uh, there's the, of course, uh, when we talk about climate change, we should not forget that the Africa has so many other environmental challenges, dust generation, solid waste management in communities, and many, many others. Then, uh, of course, in that one, let me report that there is already interaction and collaboration between the South African Space Agency and SANSA and the Nigerian Space Agency. We had meetings there on that. Climate change mitigation and adaptation. You all know that uh, South Africa has its new NDC, the Nationally Determined Contributions, and it's a big challenge to cut down emissions from what it used to be to what it needs to be in the next few years. And imagine a country like Nigeria with so many refineries not working, uh, oil pipelines, emissions at a grand scale in South Africa as an industrial country. So if South Africa and Nigeria collaborate in that sector, it is very important because um, the environment is interlinked. Air pollution problems in Botswana will transfer to South Africa and South Africa transfer through the continental circulation pattern. And um, so improvements in one country may not suffice. Other countries have to join in too. And it is Nigeria's responsibility and South Africa's responsibility. And a few other countries, Egypt, for example, to take part in such a, a bilateral and multilateral agreements. Sustainable energy systems, that relates to that. South Africa wants to go with wind and many other sustainable energy systems. Nigeria wants to do the same. Climate finance and just transition, we just made on that. Uh, climate finance is many uh, leading countries in the world that emit more than South Africa and Nigeria want uh, these large scale transformations in the energy system. There are financial and socioeconomic uh, ramifications. And then there must be some sort of uh, market incentives for South Africa and Nigeria. And science and technology should be in the leadership of that argument and uh, trading agreements and so forth. Then uh, manufacturing and entrepreneurship for a very large country that has a lot of unemployment like Nigeria, 220 million people. Uh, manufacturing is important, but then we also know that you have the third in the fourth industrial revolution uh, coming. Is are these countries prepared for the social transformations that will bring and the indulgence of certain technologies as well? So. Um, uh, these are some of the areas I cannot finish this without um, mentioning the need for an African Continental Research Foundation. This is very important when we have argued this at the African Academy of Science. Some folks have said, okay, that will spoil the systems that are already in place. What systems are in place for a continent that is so large and does not have a Continental Research Foundation? We know that the European countries each of them has a national science funding entity. And in addition, they have superimposed on that the European Continental Science Foundation. Even in the United States, we have a very elaborate one that involves even the uh, small businesses in research. Uh, it's not so much the creation of the research products, it's the uh, diffusion of science and technology into society at all jurisdictional levels. And there must be an entity if Africa is to meet the commitments that is made in the 2063 agenda. And some of the areas that have been highlighted in the STISA 2024, which is supposed to support the uh, 2063 agenda. There must be an African Continental Research Foundation 
And it has been my suggestion that South Africa should take the lead in it. It has the best scientific infrastructure in the continent and the others will join too and the Nigerians have promised to join. Um, I have talked about this, but let me very quickly for the next five minutes, uh, Chairman, if you would allow me, uh, talk about the components of the Nigerian Science and Technology Plan 2030. I took the leadership as the primary author of that for the president of the country and, and his cabinet. Um, so um, the objectives of uh, what we call the NTSIR 2030 are not so dissimilar to that of South Africa. So it's just to improve uh, the well-being of the people and these uh, types of generic statements, they are all there. But first, let's go to this. Before the NTSIR 2030, there was the National Economic uh, Recovery Plan, and I will say, Dr. Scheller, I listened to you yesterday. Don't apologize for linking STI to the Socioeconomic Development Plan of uh, South Africa. Uh, without that, the public will not see any utility of STI initiatives and why they have to fund it. Uh, it has to be rationalized on the basis of the improvement of the quality of life of the people and to achieve South Africa's national aspirations. And without such linkages, uh, it is very difficult to get support for STI, as you all know, in budgeting processes and so forth. Uh, this is uh, the picture we developed. On the right-hand side, you will see uh, what I would call the mechanisms for achieving this. On the left side are the national aspirations uh, some of which come out of national development plans, these typical five-year plans. I think South Africa has its own too. Uh, so we had to sit down and try to justify those uh, mechanisms for achieving this. The main things, macroeconomic policy improvement for a country that size, economic diversification from what? Economic diversification away from oil and gas. And there's got to be other things. Uh, uh, competitiveness improvement with countries in its socioeconomic class, Brazil, India, incidentally, South Africa is part of BRICS and Nigeria is not, has been trying to be. We will try to get South African support to get Nigeria into BRICS because it belongs there socioeconomically. Uh, then jobs creation is the same thing that uh, we emphasized yesterday in the minister's talk, education today, uh, Dan Dutoit has uh, mentioned that, and so did uh, Dr. Scheller. Science, technology, and innovation is part of that. Uh, let me say that even though it's been isolated into a different uh, single separate, it really permeates all the other ones. It permeates science and technology is an enabler of the implementation of national socioeconomic development programs. Then uh, we also developed this. This is to show research focused areas because we mentioned research. And you can see the similarity between these research areas and those that uh, Dan just uh, talked about a few moments ago, and those that were also highlighted yesterday in a variety of species. Uh, Africa cannot uh, really Nigeria and Africa cannot really be second fiddle in any of this. People like to say applied research and uh, this was uh, um, theoretical research. Uh, applied research might help us deal with the present, but Africa must deal with the present and cover the future as well. So both applied and uh, theoretical sciences are, are germane to Africa's development. You cannot play second fiddle now or in the future. So there's got to be some level of balance and that's how we approach it. These are the technological areas that Nigeria felt that we cannot uh, concede to foreign countries, uh, especially the advanced countries. There could be collaborative agreements, of course, because uh, Advancement in science and technology have occurred mostly through interactions among countries. Uh, one country learns technology from the others, but these are the technologies 
with respect to engagement. And then this, um, these are the major, major industrial sectors. You mentioned mining today, I think yesterday as well. Mining is important for Nigeria, but it has to be sustainable mining. And we can go into details in this, there's no time to do that today. I have the full report that I will give to Dr. Shelley uh, to distribute to those who are interested in it. Um, we mentioned internationalization many times here yesterday and today. Uh, what, is, uh, what are Africa's priority areas in science and technology? This are the these are 24, 2024 elements. How are we going to impact that? I will show you the interconnections we have drawn uh, between this. These are what I would call the largest scale or largest scope focus. That's the SDGs, which is global. Uh, you see the uh, 16, uh, is 17 actually, 17 SDG uh, aspirations, I would call them. Then we have to migrate from that to the continental programs and players. You see Africa Agenda 2063 and African Action Plan. Those are all there. There are some players like African Development Bank. They are very important as a continental bank for doing things in the interest of Africa. And then uh, heeding the uh, uh, interests and also the uh, suggestions and, and, and urges of the large countries, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, Kenya, Morocco, and a few others that are leading continents with respect to the economy of Africa. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot say that we will not include the immense expertise and, and programs of support that the European countries and uh, Canada and the United States have given in the past. Let me not forget Japan. Um, so European Union's development plan, I must have done something. Did I do something wrong? I <laughs> uh, hope you will come back. Okay, let me, let me continue for two more minutes. Um, uh, essentially, we have established a relationship between uh, those programs that are at the continental level and global level with the Nigerian National Science and Tech Plan because we cannot say that you know, we will go and do uh, SDG programs separately and uh, 2063 Africa Agenda Program separately, they have to be integrated, but we have to have um, a template in which we mark off uh, those things that are aspirations of those programs and see how the Nigerian plan has covered them. Uh, that is the uh, best and most uh, cost-effective way an efficient way of dealing with that. Uh, so that has been done. The question with all of this, which is what I will conclude with, is where will the resources come from? Can government be the only uh, funder of these kinds of programs? We came to the conclusion that no, it has to come from five sources. And uh, that has been instituted into the policy of the country, how these programs will be funded. The federal government is to fund it 50%. Uh, the industrial sector is to fund it about 15%. And interactions with international agencies will fund it about 15% as well. Thank you very much. 15% uh, as well. So let me pass forward. Uh, first, before I get to that, I wanted to indicate that one of the things we have included directly to treat that directly is Nigeria's national, nationally determined contributions to climate change programs. Why? Because uh, as constructed, that will involve uh, wide scale impacts through the economy and implications. So we can't leave that out and treat that as a small project. The transformation of the energy system of any country as we have found in the United States, uh, it's, it's very, very indulging across all in the, in sectors of the economy. So we must make sure that uh, the full strength of STI is directed towards accomplishment of what the country has uh, promised to do for the international community and for the 
uh, energy sustainability of uh, her own citizens. Uh, so this is Nigeria's uh, plan for that. And South Africa has its own that is even more elaborate and far reaching. And ACI has to be deployed directly to it. Funding, I just mentioned funding. This is a funding outlet. It's been done in three uh, stages. The short term period has already passed. So we are now in the second medium term period. And then the long term period, you see the amounts that we have outlaid. These will be provided by the country and through those uh, the contributory schemes that I mentioned a little earlier. Um, program configuration, stakeholder engagement processes, all of those we have uh, allocated monies to. And this is the government allocation of 50% that I was talking about, a national research and development fund of 15%, public-private partnership of 15%, international science promotion and R&D funds through granting from agencies, uh, you know, UNESCO and others like that. Uh, we don't expect much from there, just 10%. Venture capital funds. It's not just for donation of these funds, is to engage them as well. Because without them, uh, as I said uh, in a, a meeting last week, uh, much of what we have used in the United States to go to space, even the failed one about last week, which I'm sure we will uh, try to reconstitute things and send the satellite up. And much of that knowledge came from small business innovative research plan. At one point, I was the chairman of that in the United States. Uh, so it, it is uh, not right to think that uh, the only the CSIR institutes and the uh, universities will produce the knowledge base needed to make advancement in STI to uh, raise the standard of living and all that of the country small businesses. And I remind people that before Einstein came over to the United States to Princeton University in 1961, he worked in a factory and gained much of his knowledge, much of the antecedents to his uh, uh, big theory from working and looking at how machines operate and so forth in, in Europe. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to brief you. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Colleagues, let me, let me take um, maybe in the next five, 10 minutes. I saw the hands earlier of people who wanted, there was a hand beside on my left and then uh, the other one at the back. And then just shout your name as well. Benny, are you able to roll around with Mike? Mike. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. It's such a difference. So it's more just calling out, it's focus on the positive and the opportunity that sits in front of us and think together on what this up. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Petros? So good morning, everybody. And thank you for the good presentation, uh, Professor Inyang. I just want to ask one 
Uh, so when, when you were trying to link the Nigerian SPI plan to the national uh, development budget, you used the economic recovery and growth plan of 2017 to 2020. Is it not a short-term focus? I saw Nigeria now got the NDP 2021 to 2025. Uh, how aligned is it the plan with the Nigerian NDP 2021 to 2025? Maybe the plan came after, after the SPI plan. Not the time right, to do some the alignment. And maybe the last question is to mention South African Nigeria collaboration like climate change and education plans. What type of the involved can collaborate? Thank you. Um, okay, any other comments, colleagues? It's not just questions, comments as well. Uh, Tina, are you able to check what's going on uh, online? And then read for colleagues, for Dan and Hillary. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from Lisija online. It reads, a macroeconomic data room is essential to attract fund of funders globally. How shall this requirement for a continental knowledge management system begin to be designed using the UN SDG 17? Okay. Um, Dan and Hilary, would you like to respond? So the issues raised. Yeah, um, well, I think Alison's comment was just a very positive comment, which, which I agree with. And then the second was a question for Hillary. I think the last question, if I, if I reflect on, on that. You spoke about the African knowledge management system. I mean, it, it, it goes back to the point which I spoke about, and that's the operationalization of various institutions and programs we have already at the level of the African Union and the Southern African Development Community. There's, for example, um, the African Observatory for Science, Technology, and, and Innovation. There's in the, the Africa Scientific and Innovation Research Council. It's, very much as we have this cadre plan in order to have different institutions and programs in South Africa work together more efficiently, better coordination. That's very much uh, required at a continental level level as well. We don't always have to reinvent the wheel, but to start using what we have and, and make them more effective. There are two uh, question comments that um, I had alignment plans, STI plan with the uh, Nigerian National Economic Development Plans. By the way, those National Economic Development Plans are done on five year basis. They have been done in five year basis since independence in 1960. Um, the reason that we configured uh, the time frame into three segments is that we were aware that governments will come and go, different governments. So it deal with the five year segment, one with the five year segment with modification. Other policy elements they would like to bring in. In 2020, definitely made the place of the country and was brought on by the government. If comes into the next year when they have their elections, they can revisit the objective.
done uh, within the context of the uh, politics of uh, that time frame. Uh, second, the question was what kind of uh, things are done with respect to NDC? We know that although NDC is about energy transformation, but energy transformation is sufficiently profound that uh, it tends to uh, have ramifications through the socioeconomic system. So it cannot be energy alone. Uh, they are trying to do some structural adjustments right now. We know that the country uh, is not bl blessed with wind resources like South Africa. So they are going to have to look at uh, solar energy as a big one, but they have to do that at commercial levels, not uh, mother and father small shops. That will not support the energy requirements of that country. So there are committees now, the Energy Commission of Nigeria is actively looking for ways of um, having a portfolio energy standards, just like we have in the US. In the US, we, we have, um, uh, we have um, constructed a system in which sustainable energy is to take 30% of the energy supply of the United States. It cannot go full blown because our system is based on coal. Uh, coal, we cannot make that transformation so quickly. But in any case, Nigeria is also doing that. And that is also within this uh, binational agreement that I talked about that uh, Dan and DSI are resurrecting. So that's what is being done there. In terms of uh, energy, we are targeting um, uh, modification of fuel, uh, biofuels, uh, gas, which put it less than oil. And then, uh, of course, solar energy, because the country is located on the equator where it's on solar intensity is very high. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so cementing the relations between South Africa and Nigeria, and, and you have our full support uh, uh, as, as the system. Thank you very much, Hilary, uh, for being able to come and join us and share um, the insights from our uh, sister part, country, Nigeria. And then Dan, thank you very much. You, you could see colleagues, they want to see this decadal plan. And so Dan has committed that perhaps you'll get a, a version of the presentation, which is PDF. We, we, you, you, you can share with them. Right? And we can, we can share the of the table plan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any of you haven't seen it? Um, do, just don.toya dst.gov.za. Please feel free and touch. It's a draft, but as part of the consultation, we're happy to share. So let me invite the next panel, including uh, Ms. Fonega Kumalo. Uh, once again, please uh, join us here. You, you know, just uh, Dr. Stembiso Mien. Fiona uh, will join us virtually. Emran, uh, Paddy, we invite you here. Um, so I can command you, former statistician general, once in a while. So colleagues, we will, don't worry about, about time. Uh, the time that uh, Rebecca was gonna use, we have uh, reappropriated that to Dan and Hillary. We have redistributed. Over to you, Afun. Um, thank you, CEO. I was a bit worried about time and um, the fact that it's a Friday. So on a Friday, you find that, um, you know, after lunch, it becomes a, a graveyard shift. So we may have to make sure that we stick to time.
Okay, I forget every now and again that I have to wear glasses. Um, I saw my eye specialist and um, I thought there was something wrong with my eyes. And he said, no, ma'am, it's an aging process. So <laughs> this is what you have to do going forward when you are reading um, some notes and documents. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, to this first session um, discussing the STI, development, sustainability, transitions, and inclusivity. Um, uh, the Nike chair has already given us um, the overview from what happened last night. Um, we also got the overview from uh, Mr. Dutoit. Um, last night we uh, received a keynote addressed, addressed by the minister detailing the importance of um, the advisory council, the importance of R&D and innovation on job creation in the country. Um, before we dive into the discussion, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, we've got, I will start with Professor Rosigan Maharaj. I've got the whole page, so I will try to, <laughs> I'll try to uh, just uh, give some highlights. Um, Professor Maharaj is a concurrently is concurrently the founding chief director of the Institute of Economic Research and on Innovation at Swana University of Technology, associate research fellow of the Tellers Institute in Boston, and an elected member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Let's welcome uh, Professor Maharaj. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we should also thank the facilitator for not boring you with the whole thing about me. Uh, <laughs> So, good colleagues, uh, thanks very much for the invitation and uh, being asked to join in this panel itself. Um, you know, the, I, I've listed out a number of points, and I've done this, which is quite different from what you are used to seeing me on podiums, a lot of slides, a lot of data, and then we get to what is it that the information tells us. But we're in a different mode. And I really want to convey some of this through what we are doing as well. You know, so it's really important that we see, as the minister mentioned yesterday, as Shadrach, as Mulungisi have been emphasizing, we are learning. And this is something we should look at how we can enhance our learning. Yeah. And I want to emphasize a particular aspect within that towards the, uh, the points that we want to pick up in this panel itself. So by way of introduction, colleagues, you know, uh, all of the uh, speakers last night mentioned anniversaries, et cetera, taking place. Well, I want to also remind people about a commemoration, and that's just in three days. Yeah? We will be commemorating the 45th anniversary of the killing of a key intellectual of all of us. Yeah. So, the death of Steve Antubico is something that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to, especially in this domain about science and technology and innovation. Biko's life, you know, drew together many of the elements that we ourselves are still engaged with. When he led the walkout and the establishment of Black consciousness itself, there were particular material aspects that were being engaged with. And out of that, a wider social sense emerges. These are issues that we should draw in for ourselves today and where we are as well. It's hugely worrying for me that the struggle that's brought us to where we are, yeah, 
is something that is considered of the past. Colleagues, history has not ended. We are making history. So please remember a key point, besides bridging the divide between what happens in academia and what happens in the community, key message of black consciousness. Yeah. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And I really am quite concerned about our capacity to learn and expand our minds as opposed to constraining it with the no normative assumptions. Nice, pretty words, but bereft of meaning and the capacity to bring about real transformation. Yeah. So we norm towards the rhetoric and we can show the comparisons. You look at it, South Africa, according to GDP figures, I have to speak very carefully here. According to GDP figures, and we know it's an imperfect measure, all of those provisos, South Africa last year was the third economy in Africa. And our pathway with the recession in front of us, maybe a double, where will we be? This is not a situation of South Africa sitting as the most advanced industrial space on the continent. Yeah? And that's the second important feature we need to bear in mind. There are things that have happened in our most recent past that have eroded some of the capabilities and capacity, and we have failed them to reinvest in the ones that we require. That's why when Mungisi showed us that graph and said we should not continue bemoaning it, it's almost a straight line. Yeah? And that's in terms of our gross expenditures on research. So I'll quote another uh, person much older than me with a much thicker beard. In 1852, when he said, and I have to change the first word, of course, to people. People make their own histories, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it, they do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves. Uh, and I'm emphasizing this point, colleagues, because I worry sometimes about us choosing the circumstances that we'd like to operate. We articulate it and we put plans and strategies against those. I mean, that is not the endeavor of science. That's what consultants and business agencies do. You know? Under the uh, circumstances, how do people then uh, encounter this? It's under circumstances directly encountered. What is our environment? What are we materially confronted by? Objectively, you know, we should have a capacity to measure these things. So these are given to us but they are also transmitted from our past. So our colleague from Nigeria mentioned the importance of the present and the future. Africa is also constrained by a past, and that past, my worry, is being reproduced inside the world systems that we occupy today. So colleagues, our starting point is really, if you look at the title of the session, we also have to appreciate, we live in underdevelopment, unsustainability, exclusive economic systems, and an intransigent political economy. So that sounded very harsh. I look at all of you looking a bit shocked. It is Friday, colleagues. Yeah. So I really want to use this opportunity to encourage. We must deepen our criticism, colleagues, of what's taking place around. Our contemporary co uh, conjuncture is made up of a variety of moving parts. We have different views about it, and we must really be encouraged to bring the contestation of those views to the fore. Yeah? Us norming into systems, thinking some other countries have got it right, has been completely disproved over the last two and a half years of those of us that have survived our histories. Yeah? The contradictions and crises of our combined and uneven world system is leading to, and we are living through it right at this moment, increased geopolitical frictions and fractionalization. We are inside a Cold War 2.0, while the environment is warming up at an extraordinary rate. I'm teasing you because this was comments from our Africa Institute from Russia about the Cold War and its effect. Those in Europe called it a Cold War. For us in Southern Africa, it was a hot war. People died here. Yeah. Globalization exists, and it's not something that we can extricate ourselves from. 
because of the way in which we've combined ourselves into it. International production, distribution, consumption, and waste value chains exist. We are party to it. We are party inside it. But what did vaccine apartheid show us? What did the World Trade Organization's intransigence over the request from India and South Africa to hold off or at least waive patent restrictions against the production of vaccines on our continent itself for ourselves? I hope you're also noticing something from Biko coming across. Yeah? We are on our own, and you can add however you want to describe yourself before that. Remember, we are African in that. Third point, the ecological catastrophe is accelerating and climate change is undeniable. And continuously, we are confronted by this. We have, through the offices of the Academy of Sciences, an excellent forum on the just transition. But having fora establishes a space between us assessing what's taking place and then the praxis. Colleagues, we've seen what happened in KwaZulu-Natal, the devastation, the floods, etc. I've been there just a week ago, uh, thanks to our colleague, Fiona. <laughs> I'm seeing rebuilding. I'm not seeing any of the lessons of climate change being put into the rebuilding taking place. Yeah. We still have a similar form in which the municipal regulations are driving the reconstruction. And it's not as if we don't know climate change is going to get worse. Fourth point, scientific and technological advancements are proceeding and it's widening. We can expect that on the 25th of November, according to the United Nations, excuse me, party as well, we will be 8 billion people occupying this planet. <laughs> if we don't have more ideas, we should be worried about ourselves. <laughs> so if we expect these new ideas, we need to ask ourselves, how much of those new actually contribute to the global knowledge commons? How much of it is being enclosed and appropriated through intellectual property restrictions? How many of them exclude us from participating? So it's really nice to hear from the minister, Ndisi Shedra, that the Open Science Initiative is advancing and we are invited to be inside that engagement. We really must pick up on it. The labor process transformations that are taking place, this influences the future of work that everyone will agree to. But how many of you pay attention to the fact that the society that we have, the contemporary conjuncture, is based on a wage nexus? You exchange your labor for your right to survive on the planet if you don't own capital. How is that going to be impacted by the labor process transformation and the future of work? What about the issues of basic income grants as means to address the, the real challenges that we have? Just two more of these critical points. I really like the fact that this has been raised, emphasized by Dan, by Hillary, et cetera. African integration and innovation should not be separated. And why I'm saying this, colleagues, is on the definition of innovation being creative destruction. So as we integrate Africa, the things that don't work, we should not be clapping hands and pushing them forward into our future. As much as we've learned, they didn't work in the past. Yeah, collaboration, mobility, and strengthening domestic accountability, even within African integration, is critical. Yeah, we've worked on, together with Dan and others, the SADC training program for parliamentarians and policymakers. We need to take these into and work with the people so that when you're confronted with STI plan or program or budget proposal, it's the gravity of it is understood, not just that they feel that they said. <laughs> The gravity of how important it is investing comes across. We shouldn't be needing to make the case for investments now. Huh? SDG progress on the same level uh, in work we do with the Diplomatic Academy, and I teach there as well, on all our indicators. You're going to see this come out of the General Assembly uh, meeting soon. We are not making it. <laughs> in fact, on some of those indicators, we are running in the opposite direction of where the indicators should be taken. COVID has uh, COVID uh, has actually accelerated that, right? But then at the same time, the World Meteorological Organization produces the um, uh, state of the weather report. This 2021 edition has got a special focus area on Africa as well. 
And if we just read through the list of deficiencies, deficiencies across the continent itself, and you look at the capabilities and capacities embedded, not even like physically just across the road. <laughs> yeah, that's South Africa's weather cells. So we ask ourselves, how can we maintain such an infrastructure locally when our weather is continental and global as well? We need to look at how these products and services are also shared across the continent. We cannot continue on the system that only supports a golden bullion against the interests of a global south, which is increasing in number. Last point, the sixth point here is the hollowed out state and repurposed state apparatuses resulting from corporate state capture. We are still digesting huge amounts of reports, but colleagues, we cannot leave this outside of the realm of science technology because we also need to creatively destroy what advances or supports corruption itself. Included in this is us rebuilding trust and increasing the resources to surprise the enterprise, colleague, both public and private, of science and technology, not just the private over the public. When we are told we can expect foreign direct investment, we can expect a whole range of things to flow. Colleagues, we were in these trenches in 1993 being promised the exact same thing. 30 years later, where are we on a sliding scale, colleagues? Yeah? So in this public engagement in agenda determination needs to be pushed much more strongly it cannot be that we only work off the institutions we have as the supply side. We need to bring in, in a much stronger form, the demand side articulated in such a way that the institutions that we have then build the capacity to respond to the challenges. Yeah, colleague. So, sorry, I'm taking this time. By conclusion then, colleagues, I raised really challenging issues, yeah. But as we think about this future, we must also, I think, appreciate the idea. We need to widen the discourse beyond merely institutional representation. This worries me a little bit when I see organograms. Yeah? We see which institution is represented. We don't see or acknowledge what interest is represented by that institution. And because of that, we deny the possibility of a battle of and for ideas. And really, if we're involved in science, we've got to appreciate that's the contestation we should be uh, contributing to. Yeah? In recognizing science and technology as global public goods and services. Yeah? We got to 8 billion because we've shared our ideas and evolutionary, we've gotten here. It's not because we took our ideas and hidden in our pockets. I keep making this comment. If the intellectual property on fire or using sharpened stone tools demanded receipts, where would we be today in world systems? Right? So contestation between competing worldviews and reconciliation with material and objective measures are critical and crucial. So it's lovely to hear about the data portals, the statistics, uh, indicators, et cetera, but and others, we need to use this. It's not just us having a set of data available. The, this data must feature in our conversations. And really, that's the, the bottom line here in terms of the public engagement that still remains important. My last comment, and really the deepest provocation here, innovation should seek the creative destruction of all that constrains and restrains the realization of a better life for all, with the possibilities of us sharing moderate prosperity amongst us, but all of this needs to be framed at the level of maturity we've achieved. Eight billion people, yeah. an ecological civilization awaits us. And we must really be concerned about seeking to reform that which we are in, which is incapable of sustaining us in the space that we're entering into. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, that was rich, and um, I think it's um, getting us thinking. I don't want to take too much time so that we've got enough time for discussions and also to open questions um, to the floor. Next, I will invite Dr. Mieni. 
I also have a, uh, an entire page, Dr. Bini, so I will try to just be brief so that we've got uh, plenty of time to, to have discussions. Um, Dr. Stembiso Mieni is a senior lecturer in the housing discipline and was research associate of the SARCHI, Chair in Applied Poverty Reduction Assessment in the School of Built Environment and Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu Natal. He is a co editor of the recently published book titled The Political Economy of Government Subsidized Housing in, the South, in, in South Africa. Sorry. He is a Canon Collins Educational Trust and Ford Foundation alumnus. He is currently a uh, he currently participates in the viability and validation of innovation for service delivery program. Let's welcome Dr. Mien. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the introduction. And also, thank you so much from the, uh, the previous speaker. Uh, I think you have given us something that we need to, to think about very broadly. And what is also very important, I think the Chair of NAC yesterday raised also a very important point, that science, technology, and innovation it's got the potential to, uh, to increase growth in the society, but also to address poverty where possible. But we also become very concerned when STI also has got a potential to also reinforce social exclusion and also inequalities in the society. I think that is what brings us together. Uh, in this point at this point now because we are more concerned about why then we find some difficulties in terms of addressing poverty inequality and some of the uh, uh, other things related to that but also i know that the, the cao normally asks a very important question in terms of in all what we are doing how can we therefore be in a position then to say, this is really uh, contributing to what we call the quality of lives of our society? Because that's what we are uh, aiming to do uh, in most cases. Uh, without wasting time, I've just titled my, my presentation, looking towards what we call the transformative innovation policy in South Africa. I know that some colleagues around here, they work around that space, which is an emerging framework, which uh, a number of colleagues have already said that they are working in it today. So, but what is also critically important that I also want to look at uh, in my presentation, more particularly in line with inequality, but also in line with some current debates which are found around what we call sustainability transition. Uh, around that debate, uh, there are two concerns, or more of that, that within that research or within that debate, uh, there is less when it comes to spatial dimension. Uh, I think that is critically important on the basis that we have always been told that geographically there is an uneven development. So therefore, how are we attending to that? But also at the same time, the also other aspect that I also want to drive my presentation once uh, I'm presenting is also what we call the, the gender dimension. At what level are we mainstreaming with an intention to address some of these inequalities? Because we cannot assume that now that we are in a, a transformation phase, but the issue of women are always taken on board even within the STI, we need also to start to engage that, whether uh, women are given enough opportunities when it comes to that. But going back to 
uh, my presentation has already said, is that I will talk with what I know. We know some of these problems. We know that there's poverty. We know that there's high income and also wealth inequalities more particularly in our country. We also know that there's high unemployment and also gender inequalities there. But if you look at the segment of society then, we can therefore realize that the youth are the ones who are mostly affected and also black women when it comes to some of these challenges that we are always talking about. And if you look at our uh, 2020 general household data, I think it's also very clear that we are sitting at 24% of, uh, of people living in what we call extreme poverty, and also 33% live below the poverty, uh, below bound poverty line. I'm sure that my next colleague will emphasize to that point because I assume that he's more, uh, uh, you're more qualified <laughs> to talk about some of those issues. So therefore, I don't want to temper that much with that. Uh, but what is more important here is that we we also aware that uh, COVID has also contributed uh, to these what to to some of these challenges that we see. As I've already indicated, that my part of what I'm I'm looking at is uh, the issue that when it comes to women, they are always mostly affected uh, by some of these things. I think uh, the acting CEO yesterday they mentioned that there seems to be what we call the gendered poverty when you look at some of these things. I think I was talking to us this, uh, these figures, as you know of, as they are part of the South African challenges and also issues of inequality, even when we compare it with our, within our BRICS. Uh, but there's also another dimension. Uh, maybe this is also linked more particularly because of the discipline where I come from. And also the previous speaker has also indicated in line with this then, that what is it that we have learned more particularly during floods in Wazul Natal? And what we have also observed is that we'll know that we are having a serious problem where we are talking about 16% of people living in informal settlement. And that's a challenge that we are facing. But uh, within that challenge, we ask ourselves that we have got a Department of Human Settlement that is strongly focusing and trying to address some of these challenges, but this is still continuing. Then we ask ourselves at what level can then science, technology, and innovation can be able to play a role. And we, do, and we do know that there are some initiatives uh, more particular around this. Uh, to date, we talk of the 3D, the 3D printing, but we're still not yet aware whether that is going to contribute to, to the decrease of this high rate of uh, informal settlements there. But we, we had already had some of the other technologies in place just like your IBT, we need to start to ask questions. Why are they not then making some major changes in our society? Is it because of the level at which they are not acceptable in our society? Or is it because of the regime when it comes to the, to the housing sector that had already been created uh, in terms of the fact that people are, are used to brick and mortar, so therefore they are not welcoming you technologies which are being put in place there. So the question there is that how then do we dismantle that regime? Yes, we do understand that there will always be violent protest, but are those not really getting or are helping us then to bring some radical changes in the process? So I think you, you, you raised a very important point that in as much as we continue to develop, but we seems to be Institutionalists will say there seems to be an, uh, an institutional layering rather than institutional conversion, because there are some instances where we require some institutional conversion in our system there. But the question, how can STI be able to play a role in terms of bringing that uh, institutional conversion in our system? Uh, as I've already indicated, 
that part of what we also do is that innovation policies or plans are also very critical that we need to also take them into consideration, more particularly if you want to address issues of poverty, inequality, and also sustainability. But the question, how do we ensure that there is an integration in the public, uh, in the public sector itself? Because what we have seen in previous research has been that there seems to be a tendency even within public sector institutions of working in silos. How then do they become integrated? In it? Because as I've already indicated that we know the problems. Until when are we going to be hiding under, <laughs> under the banner to say, we do have policies, but the problem is with implementation. If we know that the problem is with implementation, what are we doing with that? Because we should have been responding and we know where the problem is. So I think we need to think a bit in relation to that. Yeah? But the also other aspect, as I've already indicated, that the issue of gender inequality, yes, it's really affecting our, uh, our, <coughs> our, it's really a problem in our society. As we also know that is women, uh, unemployment and also poverty is affecting them. So that what we need to uh, try to, to respond to it. Uh, I indicated earlier that I framed my discussion in line with the transformative innovation policy. So I will not be able to talk about the three, uh, uh, the three frames of innovation there. We are aware of them. Uh, the chair once spoke about part of that, but the part that I'm framing my work was in line with the, the third frame, which uh, normally explores issues around governance arrangement, because I think part of the challenges are centered around uh, part of the government arrangements then in terms of who's managed to do this and all different things that we always, we always find in the in, in this. But what is also important within this uh, framework is an element of learning and responsive and responsible research and innovation. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about learning, the importance of learning, co-learning, co-creation of knowledge and also production. Those things are very important. But at the same time, when you are looking at them, then we should also avoid silencing other voices because it's also very important. Uh, because I'm also aware that even when I'm talking about women, more particularly in this uh, aspect, I also aware, I'm also aware that they are not homogeneous. So therefore, there are also other, other categories that they are also affecting them. The issue of race, ethnicity, and all different aspects of them. So the question is, how can we be able then to use STI with an intention to draw that balance in our society? And I think that is very important. Uh, there is a sphere of government, which I, I always believe that the it's, it's somehow flooded with a lot of responsibilities. I don't want to say with less support. The local governments fear. Everything stops with them. We have got a number of plans that are in place. We can talk about your IDP. They will say the IDP has to be there and then budget will flow through that IDP. But on the other hand, it's the very same sphere that we are also aware that we, all, we often discuss about issues around what we call uh, there's an institutional incapacity uh, within that sphere. And we know the problem. But the point I'm trying to drive here is that uh, in as much as we work, as part of the work that we are doing with uh, DSI also, uh, is that we need to try to introduce some innovation strategies and plans because, the, because of the role that municipalities are given in terms of the Municipal Structures Act and also in line with the Municipal Systems Act in terms of participation. And yes, we're also aware that when it comes to uh, the policy design at a national level, it's very important but the local government's fear needs to be capacitated when it comes to the issues of innovation. So the minister spoke about uh, the fact that uh, there's a digital platform, uh, which is a municipal uh, 
municipal innovation maturity index, which I happen to be to be working on that one, to be driving that one. But there are a lot of things that we are also that we are also coming across more particularly in our uh, in our uh, in our local government sphere. Then, so I think uh, with that said, then we may have these uh, decision support tools but they also require a bit of a political will because it's one point to say we have got a platform, but I know that the platform is designed to assist municipalities in terms of understanding their capabilities. Yeah? But the question I know as I've been working within that sector in terms of how long then it takes you to go through in terms of ensure, because at the end of the day, I think it's somewhere intending to help municipalities. Uh, as I've already indicated, uh, that uh, the maturity index then is aiming to close that gap through the measuring of innovation capacity in municipalities, then of which is the work that maybe in the near future we'll start to be talking about uh, it more. Then, uh, now I come back to the last issue that I spoke about uh, the issue of uh, the mainstreaming of. Uh, gender, more particularly in the national systems of, uh, of innovation, that which I feel is also very important. Why I'm saying it's very important in this case is because we should not claim that science, technology, and innovation, they are neutral. They're not neutral. So they, as I've said earlier, that they may have a tendency to be able to uh, perpetuate or to reinforce social exclusion uh, in one way or the other. Why I'm saying they are not neutral, we need to understand the society where we're coming from. Our society has been a patriarchal society. If then that is the case, obvious when you start to talk about issues of inclusiveness, it needs, you need to have a directionality when it comes to that so that you can be in a position to know uh, in terms of how then you address that because you will be trying to run away from uh, and, uh, either entrenching or reproducing the existing, uh, the existing inequalities. All what we should be driving for is how then do we mitigate that? But also in South Africa, as I've already indicated, that we know the history of exclusion uh, in one way or the other. But also this point is also trying to drive us. I know that when it comes to party politics, for example, you know that the issue of gender equality is spoken a lot when it comes to that. But the, the question now is, uh, when are we going to start to talk about that, more particularly uh, within the national systems of innovation? Because that is also very important to start to think about, uh, about some of those things. Why it's so important is because we need to recognize some of uh, the hidden voices and even some of the innovators that we need to also, uh, that they can also be able to assist uh, in the system. Then. So we need to agree that there are gender gaps, but for us to be able to know that we can be able to address that, the question is we need to start to disaggregate data in line with, well, with an intention to, to understand then uh, in terms of where people are located. Why I'm saying this is because we know that uh, within that space then, uh, women empowerment would become, becoming, there are also developers and also consumers also to that of technology. But also at the same time, as I've already indicated that whilst they are consumers and also developers, but the system can also be excluding them uh, in the process. The question that how then do we, uh, do we also address uh, some of, of those things there? Uh, I think with that said, I've already spoken about the issue of, in terms of the co-creation of knowledge and also you know, innovation and also policy agenda, which have to be somehow community driven, but also at the same time, uh, an issue of learning will also need to uh, take place also within that. Uh, just as a way of concluding, more particularly in line with that, I think I've already indicated and presented a bit of uh, evidence in line with inequality in South Africa, starting with poverty, but also in line with uh, what I think uh, the issue of uh, gender dimension is supposed to be looked at. 
And I've already indicated that there is this contestation and there's this intersection when it comes to the issue of gender, race, and class that we need also to be aware in whatever strategy that we are trying to introduce in our country. Because at the, at, at the end of the day, we should not be reinforcing the social exclusion whilst also perpetuating marginality uh, on, the, on, on the other hand. So in line with that, then I think inclusive innovation approaches, they are possible, but also we need to be also very cautious in terms of how then do we mainstream gender in our, in our design then, but also at the same time, how then do we also try to integrate or to, to use these emerging frameworks so that we can be able to deal with some of the challenges that we have in our society. I thank you so much, colleague. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mieni. Next, we will call up um, Prof. Trigena. She is joining us virtually. Do we have her? All right. Good morning, Prof. Morning. Just as a quick introduction, I did tell you that I did forget my class. A quick um, introduction, uh, Prof. Trigana holds a, the DSI NRF South African Research Chair in Industrial Development and is a professor of economics at the University of Johannesburg. She has published widely, received awards and, and grants for her research, um, led large research projects and serves on the boards of various journals and book series. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm visible there on the screen. Uh, there seems to be a bit of sound interference. Um, hopefully it can be resolved. Um, thanks for the invitation to, to speak at this important event. Um, I hope that the fact that this is billed as the inaugural colloquium uh, suggests that it will be a recurring event in, in, in future. Um, and apologies that I can't be there with you uh, in person. Um, I've been asked to confine my um, input to just five minutes, um, so I'm going to uh, to be quite brief. Um, I hope that my my slides are visible. Um, so uh, first of all, just uh, linking uh, STI and socioeconomic development um, with inclusivity, which was part of the framing of, of this particular session. Um, I think I'm going to, because of time, uh, take it for granted that everybody here in the audience is, is broadly familiar with the, the importance of innovation, as well as familiar with the triple challenges and the broader socioeconomic challenges facing South Africa, which have also been covered um, in the previous uh, two presentations from our fellow panelists. Um, so I think we, we all recognize the importance of innovation as an enabler and a driver of economic progress. Um, and I think as, as well that uh, the form of innovation um, can be more or less inclusive um, and can have different uh, distributional outcomes along various axes by, by race, class, gender, which have been mentioned, as well as by age, uh, spatially, uh, rural, urban, formal, informal economies, um, and so on. And some aspects of this relate to, to the type of innovation, including but not limited to the technological content, um, the, the application and where or uh, in, in what uh, innovation is implemented, who owns and controls it, um, who, who captures the various benefits of innovation, uh, access to technology, um, uh, not only through IP, but uh, broader access in terms of costs and so on. Um, so these are some of the, the, the aspects of the inclusivity of innovation. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's now widely recognized that inclusive innovation can be part of contributing to, to a more innovative and, and more sustainable uh, development trajectory. So linking this to, to policy in a broad sense, um, I think underscores the importance of, of policy interventions, uh, not only to promote innovation um, and to uh, stimulate uh, innovation activities, but also to specifically promote inclusivity um, in innovation processes and in innovation um, outcomes, which are, of course, not the same thing. Um, and that uh, a, a catalytic uh, innovation-based uh, approach um, integrated across policy domains 
um, could be fundamental to a shift away from, from, from business as usual. Um, of, of course, the integration across policy domains uh, will be very different, um, whether we're looking at uh, education policy, uh, uh, health policy, energy policy, and so on. There will be commonalities, but there'll be also very important differences. And I think that this shift away from uh, a business as usual approach is, is obviously crucial when we look at the, the depth of the socioeconomic challenges uh, facing the country. So I'm gonna then uh, uh, speak a bit more broadly around uh, linking innovation and technological upgrading with uh, industrialization um, as my own area of uh, specialization. Um, and I think in, in uh, recent years, there's been growing importance, um, growing recognition of the importance of innovation for industrialization, uh, for structural change um, and for catching up. So there's developing countries uh, are catching up uh, with, with advanced economies. Um, and whilst there's a, a long-standing literature and, and policy discourse around uh, structural change or structural transformation, in some ways we can see innovation and technological upgrading as the micro foundations um, of structural change. So it's not only in terms of the shift between sectors and industrialization and the macro um, and, and meso aspects of that, but at the firm level, um, identifying the importance of innovation and technological uh, upgrading as part of those micro foundations. And this is relevant amongst other things to, to competitiveness, uh, to, to capabilities, to, to keeping pace, to the, the complexity and sophistication of, of products, um, to upgrading within global value chains and, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, if we look with, within uh, industrial production, uh, what we call uh, medium and high tech industries tend to be closer to the technological frontier, an important source of, of, of spillover effects and, and, and linkages. Um, complex products can, can serve as, as, as growth product, uh, growth catalysts, relevant as well to, to competitiveness, technological deepening and upgrading, and, and so on. And also co uh, comparing uh, medium and high-tech industries with more low-tech industries, we find that MHT industries don't follow the same uh, kind of uh, inverted U path of industrialization and deindustrialization as do low-tech manufacturing industries. So even when we look at international patterns of, of, of deindustrialization, um, initially in advanced economies and more recently in, in middle income countries as well, where uh, manufacturing tends to grow and, the, and then decline, we find that uh, medium and high tech industries actually don't follow that path. So they're actually, um, in particular for high tech industries, um, in, instead of accounting for a declining share of uh, GDP and employment after a certain uh, sort of, uh, turning point, they actually follow um, a sort of a monotonic upward uh, trajectory so that they, they actually become, account for an increasing share of, of both employment and GDP um, at high levels of, of income per capita without having any kind of turning point. So this suggests that they're kind of part of a feasible um, uh, industrialization development uh, trajectory, even at rising levels of, of income per capita. They also have a link with the, uh, the green transition um, as we find that MHT industries are, are less carbon, um, carbon dioxide intensive uh, than uh, low tech industries. So it can be part of a, a green industrialization and uh, uh, pathway. But um, technological upgrading, whilst uh, important for late industrializers, is, is particularly challenging for, for obvious, obvious reasons. Um, so this, I think, brings me to um, my next uh, slide, linking innovation with uh, productive uh, capabilities. So here we're thinking of uh, production and, and uh, technological capabilities as the two key uh, components of, of uh, productive capabilities. Now these develop through a, a long process of learning um, in the production process at the firm level, um, but also uh, at, at the meso level. Um, they're important for, as well as being derived from, um, innovation, learning, upgrading, and can be uh, key components for, for possible leapfrogging um, to, to uh, more advanced production. Also important for withstanding competition from, from imports and, and growing exports, and more broadly for, for growth and catching up. Again, most challenging, yet most uh, needed perhaps in, in, in developing countries. Um, and at the firm level, um, provide opportunities for latecomer firms um, to catch up and to, to push into the production of, of more complex products. So I conceptualize this as a sort of an um, iterative uh, relationship between country level productive capabilities um, in terms of countrywide uh, education and, and skills, digital infrastructure and other forms of uh, um, infrastructure, um, innovation systems and so on, and, and firm level productive capabilities. 
Um, and the country level productive capabilities are not just an aggregation of firm level capabilities, but actually also feed in, 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 into those. And that there's also an iterative process um, between these uh, different levels of, of productive capabilities and what are often thought of as outcomes in terms of structural transformation, industrialization, um, upgrading, catching up and, and growth and so on. But I think what is often not recognized is that these capabilities are also endogenous to these. So they're also built up through the practice of industrialization and, and, and so on. So um, by industrializing, by implementing industrial policy with all of its successes and uh, challenges, this actually uh, builds up productive capabilities because only to some extent can they kind of be built in abstract through training or whatever, they actually have to be built by doing. I think my five minutes is, is already up, so I'm not gonna go through this. It was really just to give a, a, a sample of, of, of some of the current research which we've been doing over the last uh, year or so related to innovation and, uh, and capabilities. Um, from uh, issues related to uh, cap um, technological upgrading and the effect on uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, innovation in South African firms and the impact on employment uh, at, the, at the continental level, um, the impact on COVID survival, on uh, export performance and, 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 and so on. Um, we're also in, in the field currently for the, the second wave of our uh, survey of uh, innovation in small and micro um, enterprises in Johannesburg. Um, and have a number of uh, research papers uh, uh, using that, that data. So that was really just to give a, a, a brief sample of, of some of the research uh, related to, to this topic. I think I'm gonna have to leave it there because of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I see that you got your PhD from Cambridge. I was once at uh, Newnham College once upon a time. Um, we will call up next, Dr. Lihutla. I will not uh, give a detailed introduction. I will just say our former Stats General um, is, is coming up uh, to give us his uh, view, uh, his experience and expertise in this topic. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, I have a long presentation. <laughs> uh, because uh, this. Just, just to, to make sure that you don't have a long presentation, uh, you've got five minutes. Oh, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in order to make my presentation very short, I try to look at the classics and uh, from the classics one has really to look at Marx because he's covered quite a range of subjects, including technology and information technology. Just by way of introduction, he says that just as the individual machine retains a draft-like character, as long as it is worked by the power of man alone, and just as no system of machinery could be properly developed before the steam engine took the place of earlier motive powers. So too, large scale industry was crippled in its whole development as long as its characteristic instrument of production, the machine owed its existence to personal strength and personal skill and dependent on the muscular development, the keenness of sight, and the manual dexterity with which the specialized workers in, in manufacture and the handicraftsmen outside manufacture wielded their dwarf-like implements. So you cannot be dwarf-like in technology. And therefore you cannot be necessarily, in fact, essentially you cannot be private. So this is technology defies private because private is the driver of poverty. I mean, we talk about uh, the, the, the tragedy of the commons. Private is the tragedy of the commons. It privatizes and locates means of production to itself. 
chair yesterday, we said the sovereign wealth. You cannot have sovereign wealth in South Africa because the mines are privately owned. In no way, everything underneath the earth belongs to Norwegian citizens. That's why they can have private wealth. They can have, or rather, sovereign wealth with which they can drive the things they want to drive. So where we are now, we are nibbling on the sides. So why do we think we will succeed? I'm terribly skeptical about this, although I'm an eternal optimist. But I tell you, I'm very skeptical about this. And my co-presenter said, he said, we have got very good policies. We are just bad at implementation. Surely there's nothing further, further from the truth than that. We are hopeless in design, completely hopeless. You can't say you, you cannot implement something that is defective by design. And our systems are defective by design. So I want to go through the anecdotes. One of those is the myth of coordination. Coordination by itself is a useless term. Who is the coordinator of a car? You see coordination in the car as it moves. It's not a precedent of activity. It is an antecedent of observation, of a code, something that is coordinated. So if we emphasize coordination in implementation or in, 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 in design, coordination is superfluous to the system. And anybody who wants to coordinate, you know, is superfluous and useless. Coordination is a result, not a precondition. Go to the Ministry of the uh, uh, DPME. They'll tell you that uh, we monitor and we evaluate. So they use the verb, we monitor and evaluate. When it comes to planning, they say we coordinate planning. They don't plan. So they are superfluous to the plan. So let's think about what the minister said yesterday on the district development model. You cannot have a district development model within a macroeconomic framework that is liberal because it doesn't look at the economics. It says the world is the way it is because it has to be that way. It doesn't look at the economic, cultural, geography. It doesn't look at that. It says urbanization is the way it is because it has to be that way. So you cannot talk about the DDM. I and mean, when I read the DDM, and I read the economic recovery and reconstruction plan, they don't relate and they can't. They are just two documents that come like that. And then of course, the president says it will be looked into. District development model can be an instrument of empowerment, provided it is driven from a different macroeconomic framework. So my scenes in Spatia, I went to see Andrew Donaldson and said, Andrew, as a statistician, my role is to connect with the lists of uh, things, and those lists are houses and so on. And so on. Why don't we come together as government and ensure that this ambitious space, um, space program doesn't come to departments with a begging bow? It can't be cannot be correct because all of us have to act on space. But where space and department of, uh, uh, um, not monitoring, but the one on a uh, surveyor general, they come with a begging bow. It means we have not understood the power of the district development system because those institutions cannot be forced to come with a begging bow in order to get aerial photography and so on. That thing has not changed up to this day. Our Hatrebus book, uh, that place there, the Hatrebus, it comes with a begging bow. You cannot, in this world, manage with a begging bow. And we continue to be begging bow. Um, so, Department of Agriculture comes, let's say comes, they all engage geographic information systems uh, institutions, we all pay them. They are happy that we are not coordinated. And they, they, they go all the way to the bank. So you cannot have a state that is so weak 
in key strategic investments. Now, uh, the verification of certificates. We are talking about Africa integrated in terms of academia. <laughs> Anybody who comes from outside South Africa, from South Africa had studied on the African continent, each one of them has to send something to SAKWA. And the SAKWA guys look at each name and their things. I mean, we are talking about standardization. It can't be standardization at the individual level. It's standardization at the systems-wide level. So they know what comes from NCI in Cote d'Ivoire. They know what comes from the University of Botswana. When you come with your certificate from University of Botswana, it must be standardized against South Africa. But now the macroeconomic system says you must pay for each verification. And people are forced to do these funny things. So I'm skeptical. Uh, we are not engaged with the coal crisis in Europe. That is buying coal here now with the energy crisis. We don't hear a word from the, the public officers in South Africa, from the politicians, from the president. They say nothing about that crisis. I believe we need to care for the planet. But the key question is, is Europe caring for the planet? Is it forcing us to go and care for the planet when they themselves cannot care for the planet? They've just shown us now, but our parliament is not seized with that matter. We, we've got to get these things right. In fact, for me, if we care about the planet, the first part will be caring about the people who stayed around the coal mine areas and their health has to be compensated for years of suffering. Then I will know that we can care for the planet. I think we are caring for the other P, which is profit. And that's why the coal is flying out of South Africa at 10 times the price. And then we are burning the planet. And we are village here says, in our village, we are not burning. We are going for the greens. We can burn the planet in Europe, it's okay. Who gains in that burning of the planet? Is the profiteers that actually are taking the coal. So the path we are, on the scientific journey, it's one where science is not common sense, but science drives change. Does measurement matter? I doubt it doesn't. And I, the less said about it, I come to identities, identities in Africa. <laughs> you know, Africa, by 2050, every person on earth will be an African. Every third person on earth will be African. And now the digital native will be a digital native, but Africa doesn't have digital assets to identify. So the Africans are going to be recolonized digitally. That's, that's what's going to happen. And I, we started a motion, a movement as African statisticians on uh, civil, civil, civil registration and vital statistics. That thing has been taken by somebody else. The ministers go there, congregate annually on these things so or every two years for dance and song. The people, there are people who have taken that idea, are running with it and are going to monetize Africans. That's what's going to happen. Digital colonization, it's here, it's here now. And that's the responsibility of science and technology. The ministers now meet every two years as we design, but they go there for dance and song. There are people who have taken the knacks, and South Africa held those people here. I argued, I protested, I said, the agenda has been seized underneath our nose streets. We set this thing in motion in 2012. And by 2018, Minister Pando, and Minister Mutsuadeli hosted those people who have stolen the agenda, which does not even belong to the African system. It is run by some, you know, some private agency. And it is managing what is a critical asset where every third person on earth by 2050 will be African. They are monetized, they are going to monetize that. <laughs> 
These are things that we have to look at and address very sincerely. Sovereign wealth. <laughs> Do we have sovereign wealth when we have privatized the mines and everything? You cannot have sovereign wealth. So is our macroeconomic system inclusive, sustainable, developmental, or what is it? It is not. So you go to government tomorrow, that they tell you they're begging bowel, they'll say that there's no money. Now, when you embark on a journey like this, you cannot embark on it within a context of a neoliberal framework. It is impossible to execute. It belongs to the myth of political will. Political will doesn't exist. You've got to will it by pushing, by rational thinking. What we are trapped in is a capitalist system and we want to play and survive within it and hope that we can achieve this. It cannot be achieved in the context of the capitalist system. So, as I started uh, and talked about Karl Marx and the dwarf character that is trying to change, not going to change until we understand that statement uh, by Karl Marx against a dwarf character, technology has no space for a dwarf character. But capitalists want to capitalize on the technology to own it. They own it, yet it must be a commons. And they argue that uh, the destruction of the commons, no, this technology, the advancements that we are in at the moment, where access to resources and access to life doesn't depend on whether you work or not. Because that you, you, human beings with the advancement of technology need not work. They need to be in the space where they can talk about how well we are as society at large. Because that part has been resolved. The contradictions of production have been resolved through industrialization and science. And we here have been at the center of that science. And now it is for society to benefit from the expanses that science has made possible. The capitalism that we experience at the moment of massive, only nine men in the world own the wealth of half the population of the four billion in the world today, nine men. How come that is the case? It can't be right. It cannot be right. And as we go on to this journey that we start today, that's the revolution that we have to fight. So the decadal plan is defining the political system within which the world should exist in the future. A world of abundance and not a world of scarcity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Leo Putla. Uh, Chair, Dr. Tzale, we have run out of time, but I would like to ask for at least five minutes uh, to open up for questions from the floor. Any questions for the panelists? We have a mic. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for really great presentations. A lot to think about. I've put it all together as politics and economics. Um, 
Years ago, I had the opportunity to sit in on a portfolio committee on science and technology as it was then. And this is for you, Dr. Mieni. The, um, the person presenting was challenged by a member of the committee. Why is it, they were asked, that in my village, we've still got no piped water? What are you, the scientists, going to do about it? And the person thought very carefully and said, well, you know what, um, honorable member, it's not a technology problem. We've got all the pipes and pumps and everything. It's a political problem. And there was silence in the house after that. And I stand by that. Politics is everywhere and everything. And the other speakers have made the point um, more clearly than I am able. The second is just to challenge my friend Paddy. You talk about sovereign wealth, but what was articulated here yesterday and came out of the 2012 review was the idea of a sovereign wealth fund. And you can set that up anywhere. It just requires, with respect, political balls. Because you just have to take on the private sector, whether they are wholly independent or working with you as joint ventures, you tax the bastards. That's it. After that, it's another political problem, which is called honoring your people and not stealing the money. So compare and contrast. Uh, Qatar, Norway, Nigeria, carry on. Singapore, it's up to the political leadership and the extent to which they held accountable. Full stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other question or comment from the floor? We've got the question at the back. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My, my thought process is around the question of self-sufficiency. I don't see Africa developing when we're importing everything, when our manufacturer, in terms of building a house, agriculture and all these other industries are the foundation. The services sector, in my thinking, is the roof. Manufacturing is what is missing in the country. If we're importing everything and Africa has to create close to 500 million jobs immediately, as soon as possible, how do you get that to the political establishment of the continent that they agreed is killing all of us? We're not going anywhere as a continent if we can't even manufacture toothpicks. You have to import everything, the clothing on our backs, the infrastructure that is all, all, all around us, majority of it is imported. If you have farm workers that are earning less than manufacturing workers, and the, the last six technical recessions in my mind, South Africa came out of it on the back of agriculture. What potential is there in manufacturing and what are we doing about it? I looked at what Rwanda is doing in terms of having a dedicated satellite for basic education. Where are our leaders in terms of that thought process in order to take and elevate our education system? Because we have brilliant teachers, but there are sections and portions of our population where that level of education is inaccessible. If we're going to bring everybody else along, shouldn't we use the best tools at our disposal to make sure that that becomes a reality? Thanks. Thank you very much. I will just um, quickly read uh, the questions and the comments from online. We've got um, questions and comments from Abida Dawood. I want to make sure that I've got everything. Just by saying agreed, it would also help if the African Union uses the African Academy of Sciences as a think tank in a more formal manner. Can the panel please comment my point above that the AAS 
should be a formal think tank for the AU as critical for STI development and sustainability at a continental level. Then we as academics will be informing STI policy on the continent in a more effective manner. And he continues for Dr. Mieni, I agree with all you have stated, but take into account that Prof Maharaj has stated that the issue of corruption being a serious issue perpetuating poverty, you need to address this head on in an addition to SDI capacity, gender gaps, ETC, especially at a local um, government level. I think there's one more. Excellent and enlightening talk, uh, Dr. Lihutlam. I recently heard that access to databases such as weather databases are exorbitantly priced and requires that higher level planning, or dare I say it, coordination <laughs> um, for pricing in addition to the GIS that you mentioned. Thank you very much for all the questions and the comments. Um, so, um, as I said, we already have run out of time. So I think just one minute uh, to respond to the comments and just um, uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. Maybe let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Timing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, no, I won't make much time. In a slide that was presented earlier, we saw this idea of reawakening. I think if we were to take this seriously, we need to be woke to what's happening around us and stop seeing things through the filters through which it's presented to us, whereby it normalizes aberrant behavior. You know, over last night and today, we're hearing huge amounts of radio commentary about a single individual passing. Yeah, this is out of our 8 billion. How many did we lose during COVID-19 and do we pay attention to it? This is what I mean. We cannot com continue to normalize the things that are wrong in the world systems and expect it to somehow miraculously get better. That's what science is meant to do as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, th th thank you very much. Uh, I, I really think that uh, revolutions are etched in science. And uh, when you deal with political, si political economy, uh, not political science, but political economy, it actually draws its power from science. And we here convened to look at the science system are central to those changes. At the moment, the world of internet, the world of all these things uh, that uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. But for as long as we allow accumulation to be the way it is, the capitalist system, they'll extract value from us and it can be extracted now by nine men from everybody. So if there is a revolution, it is etched in science. And we've got to go and read Marx, Engels, and Lenin on this. They give us a very clear path towards the collapse of capitalism. And that is driven by science. This is the work that we are doing. If you are not politically conscious around political economy in driving science, then this science is going to be exploitative and it will have all these billionaires that do not know what to do with the money and they are thinking of escaping to another planet and leaving us all here to suffer. This is the role of science. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there's a question that maybe I should be responding to, uh, which talks about the issue of corruption. Uh, I'm not sure how to engage it, but I always believe that where there's corruption, there's principal and an agent. So, if then there's principal and the agent, sometimes we fail to draw a line in terms of who are the perpetrators between that. Because the private sector itself cannot be able to exclude themselves from corruption. The public sector itself also 
they are always lambasted with that. But all what we are seeing in terms of corruption, we are seeing new forms of corruption that are taking place, of which in one way or the other, one may caution that science, technology, and innovation, or those who are working in that space, must not find themselves being in a position where they are used to implement these new forms of corruption when it comes to that. And lastly, uh, also when it comes to that, I think my other colleagues that I'm with them here in the panel, I think they are questioning what we call uh, the geographies of authoritative knowledge. I think it's, it's high time that we need to trust sometimes what we develop amongst ourselves as South Africans. Because I, I, I came to at a point where in some of the work that we do, we find that in the global north, they become more interested with that. But we are also very afraid of the fact what uh, Dr. Next to me have said, that you develop these ideas, they come the next day, they steal these ideas. Then how do we protect them? Let me end here. Thank you so much. And let's not forget uh, Prof. Fiona online. Um, can you please give us your closing remarks? Um, thanks. Uh, I'm not, not going to respond uh, directly to any of the questions, just to make a very brief reflection on the panel as, as a whole, um, in terms of the contributions and the, the, the questions and comments. I think a number of them were animated by what I might call the, the political economy of innovation. There was one of the uh, sort of the underlying uh, themes of a, a number of uh, the comments and, and, and so on. Um, who does innovation? Who benefits from innovation? What's counted as uh, innovation? Uh, what innovations are supported? Uh, what innovations happen and, and who has access to them afterwards and so on. Um, so I think it's it's been uh, quite helpful to sort of take a step back from some of the immediate issues and 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 frame uh, these, these very fundamental questions. Um, and uh, I believe that in the in the remainder of the the colloquium as well as the after, we'll also be able to have the opportunity to link some of these broad questions some of most of immediate policy issues, not that everything uh, can be reduced to, to policy, but issues of IP, issues of innovation incentives, um, and, and, and uh, broader support and, and, and so on. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Uh, I know we took too much time, more than what uh, we allocated, uh, but I think it was uh, well worth it for everybody. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Colleagues, thank you very much for your patience and intelligence. We're just trying to make sure that we, uh, we allow more time for engagement um, while, of course, cognizant of time. Um, so the last panel has simply taught us to behave differently. So the issue of time must also be subjected, and I suspect it must get subverted as well. Huh? No, colleagues, we would like to give you a 10 minutes comfort break. Huh? So when you come back, we'll swap the, the panels. Uh, the one that was gonna follow the one after. Uh, so we're going to take the STI COVID-19 and future pandemics when we come back because uh, the chairperson has an emergency. Um, at home. So she needs to leave immediately after the panel. If uh, uh, Dr. Morfe and and colleagues, uh, Dave Kaplan and, and Anastasia, if you, you could just bear with us. Okay, so let's have a comfort break. Uh, I don't know what time. Michael Khan, what time is it there? It's 11. Please, 10 past. And then let me ask the panel. Uh, that will be presenting if they could make their way um, so that we don't waste time, you know.
grab your coffee and then you can you know have your coffee here while we are engaging
Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, colleagues. It's 10 minutes past 11. It's time for us to resume with our next sessions. Hello. <laughs> Can I ask you all to please take your seats so that we can start? We are one hour behind schedule. Um, thank you. Welcome to our next session. I'm Dr. Buitumelo Pagati, one of the Nike Council members. Um, I'm full-time uh, based at University of KwaZulu-Natal, the Department of Surgery. Can the door please be closed? Thank you. So we'll start our session with a presentation by Prof. Glenda Gray, who's joining us online. And um, Prof. Prof. Gray um, has got about 10 minutes and following her talk, we will have various panel members who will be discussing various topics um, under the, the theme STI, COVID-19 and future pandemics. Before we start, who is Prof. Glenda Grain? She is the first female president and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. She was the chair of the Research Committee on COVID-19, bringing together scientific evidence and experience to the Minister of Health and the National Coronavirus Command Council. She is an NRFA rated um, scientist, qualified pediatrician and a co-founder of the internationally recognized perinatal HIV research unit based in Soweto. Her comprehensive bio is available online. Prof. Gray, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to just spend um, 10 minutes talking to you and I'm going to give you eight, eight lessons. So um, let me start off by saying um, on the 3rd of March, um, the DG, uh, the DSI DG phoned me, and I was about to board a plane to 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 Durban from I mean to Cape Town from Durban, and he said to me, Glenda, what's the strategy for uh, the COVID pandemic? And uh, uh, I said, DG, I'm getting on a plane. And when I get off, I'll send you a a first draft. And I spent the, the an hour and a half on the plane thinking about how we should respond to the pandemic. And um, after that, I. I I circulated the plan to a couple of people, including Lynn Morris, who I see is there, to get some advice and insight. And more or less, um, that plan uh, was our, our yardstick to which we, we stuck to, to respond to the pandemic. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the role of the DSI to forcing uh, me um, and our scientists to, to have a strategy that worked, worked very well and, and um, was incredibly uh, productive. So just in introductions, COVID did demonstrate the need and achieved a massive global collaborative scientific effort. And what we saw was that scientific researchers pivoted their existing expertise towards COVID, and we were able to leverage a decade of investment in projects and platforms, and the MRC and DSI reallocated and raised substantial funding towards COVID R&I, and um, we also saw new funders emerge that were non-traditional. It also taught us um, the urgent need to establish capacity for local manufacture of PPE and other medical devices, diagnostics and vaccines. And this has been accelerated on, on all fronts. It also showed us the importance for uh, collaboration, cooperation, agility and rapid response. And this has been achieved at an unprecedented level in South Africa. So these lessons um, and, and our capacity showed us new ways of working together and we should harness this and perpetuate these, these efforts to capitalize on the gains made uh, so we can fully localize research and production in South Africa. Not only did we, were we able to do a lot of um, our R&D, but COVID also demonstrated the need to document the impact of pandemics on social um, society and, and human well-being. And I'm sure a lot of people on the panel will, will talk to that. But in terms of the lessons, I have eight lessons. Um, the first thing that we, that we knew we had to fund um, in, um, in the SARS-CoV-2 was surveillance. And here we saw uh, the importance of genomic based surveillance uh, that uh, developed and that, that the, in this network were able to identify variants, variants of concern uh, long before any other parts of the world. 
we also saw the, the importance of SACs as uh, cyclic thresholds from the work that we do on, on um, PSR swabs, looking at the viral load. And this gave us an indication ahead on whether the community viral load was going up and down and was a hallmark to, to start watching out for a next wave. Excess deaths um, was an important uh, surveillance because this showed us the true picture of mortality during the pandemic. And setting, setting up wastewater surveillance was important because this served as an early warning system. Hospital surveillance was also important because it showed us the natural history um, of COVID-19 in our country. We have a huge um, epidemic of HIV and TB, and we weren't sure what was going to happen in our country once SARS-CoV-2 came in. So setting up these systems was critical in able to us to respond properly. What was also important in terms of surveillance was the kind of commitment that um, DSI through SHIP has made towards um, a diagnostics um, to help surveillance. And the first thing is the Hyrex uh, Biosciences. This is a software that helped us enable to identify in automatic um, SARS-CoV-2 variant typing. And this was an important innovation. And in fact, the second day I was at the MRC, this group came to me um, and showed me their their, their, um, their platform and we invested in this for HIV and then TB and we were able to pivot this to SARS-CoV-2. So a very important um, uh, investment that we made in 2014. And this now um, um, uh, is used um, even outside South Africa and around 29 countries, including 11 other African countries. The network for genomic surveillance was a, fund, a co-funding between the DSI and MRC that was launched in June 2020 with five of the largest national health laboratory labs in South Africa and now, new, and now 10 partners. And this monitored the emergence and the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to inform our rapid response. They were able to work with international science and we were able to understand the protection of vaccines afforded against these variants because we were always four or five weeks ahead of the rest of the world to understand vaccine effectiveness. And this has helped, obviously not only helped um, pivot science, but also uh, led to a lot of, um, um, uh, of publications. And this is just the team um, th throughout the country that, that worked tirelessly to give us the data that we have to inform where we're going all the time. Wastewater surveillance was also important. And um, we were able to, um, with funding from the DSI, expand our wastewater surveillance to include uh, four HDI university part partners. And this is an important skills transfer and capacity development that'll serve us well in the future. And we're establishing now expertise in monkeypox and measles and other issues. And wastewater surveillance will become a thing of the future to try and pick up um, uh, pandemics. What we also learned was the importance of um, um, international collaboration and working at an international level with big data and sharing data so that we could work together and respond adequately. Our third lesson was the investment in diagnostics. And I wanna just take you through the th three things that I think are critical. Uh, Leslie Scott, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's continuous quality monitoring of CT values. And this is important because it helps us um, monitor um, SARS-CoV-2 variants as well as looking at uh, 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 predicting um, uh, the, when the when community uh, viral load is going going up and helping us to make a response and this um, bi-weekly creation and dissemination um, helped us uh, to respond um, on a on on a on a on a weekly basis. Vivesh Khanna from Vits and hopefully he's also in the audience um, was the person that helped who that grew SARS-CoV-2 in his lab. He's originally a TB scientist and he grew this uh, this this culture he uh, SARS-CoV-2 in his lab. And having these controls um, helped the NHLS teams uh, for proficiency testing for the SARPRA validations, and it's now used in 26 countries. And this is a really cheap investment. I think this, this whole endeavor cost us less than a million rand. And then um, moving forward, we were also able to develop and manufacture COVID diagnostics that have been proved by SARPRA. And again, um, a wonderful collaboration with TIA um, and the um, DSI. We also learned that it's important to continue to invest in basic science. And yeah, it's just the data that, um, that was important. We have a, a great understanding of, um, of immunology now of, 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 of um, SARS-CoV-2 and the relationship of uh, uh, um, immuno immune responses and, and, and vaccination. Um, having invested in pseudovirus and live virus assay for HIV, we were able to rapidly move this, um, this, this platform and, and respond to uh, SARS-CoV-2 ahead of many people in the world. Lesson five was the investment and the importance of investing in vaccines and therapeutics. And when we did our, our plan, uh, we always knew that um, we didn't have enough money 
to to invest deeply in vaccines and therapeutics because the, this is the, these kind of trials cost 135 million dollars a pop. But we also knew that we had to work internationally to bring vaccines to South Africa, as well as looking at how to to invest locally in vaccine development um, and um, and support the local manufacturing of vaccines. And one of the the spins off has been the mRNA technology transfer hub, um, where um, a, an MR African mRNA vaccine has been identified. It's, it's now going through preclinical testing and we hope to put uh, this vaccine in humans um, early next year. So another wonderful collaboration um, um, which has been made possible uh, both by local innovation and um, the support of the government. The next lesson is about investing in capacity development. And so very early on, uh, we knew that the public and private sector weren't going to be able to respond. And so we uh, got Solidarity Fund to invest in, um, in developing uh, academic laboratories to go to scale in HDI um, labs so that um, if the, the public and private sector couldn't manage testing, we could leverage this capacity. And this has been very important because it's also helped us in roll, roll out our wastewater surveillance, having invested in this capacity um, in these labs. And this is just an example. We just opened up this lab um, in, at the University of Zululand, where we'll be able to continue our wastewater uh, uh, surveillance as well as, um, as, as well as work on malaria. Import, important too is not only to be able to invest in, 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 in science development, but also into invest in capacity development in biomanufacturing. And here we are working with the Patrick Sun Chiyong Foundation. We have a hundred million grant for over three to five years to develop um, people from from school leavers to PhDs who can help in the in the biomanufacturing um, pipeline in South Africa. Lesson seven is the important to invest in understanding the human toll in a pandemic. And I'm just going to just say that um, uh, we, if we ha we had wonderful data coming out on a, on in during, during COVID that tracked um, employment, tracked access to grants and tracked childhood and, and household hunger and looked at the, the human and, and, and social toll of COVID. And these are critical because it helps us understand uh, the impact of our, our mitigation strategies um, on, on, on human and mental health. Just looking at the, the issues around schools, we also know that um, the, the mitigation strategies did mean that in South Africa, around 400 to 500 students dropped out of school altogether between March 2020 and July 2021. Lesson eight, and this is my last um, lesson, is to invest in protecting the healthcare worker and the health system. We saw a, a complete lack of resilience of the healthcare system and any future uh, pandemic preparedness must make sure that our health system is resilient and can and, and cannot um, drop the ball when it comes to cancer, um, HIV and TB. And here we see um, how HIV and TB diagnostics and monitoring plummeted and um, and not and, and not yet get re reaching pre-pandemic areas both in in India and in South Africa. So in terms of a future preparedness framework, um, obviously the importance of surveillance and and with surveillance becomes diagnostic investment, and that's critical. We need independent and transparent investigations into origins of of pandemics. We need a health system that's resilient and and healthcare workers that are protected. We need mitigation strategies that don't impede economic activities and schooling and prevent corruption. And we need vaccine and, th vaccine and therapeutic investment with regulatory support, as well as um, making sure that we understand the toll um, of these pandemics on, on human well-being and mental health support. So in a future pandemic preparedness um, in South Africa, we would like to see everything from generic medicines to disease modeling to diagnostic capability clinical research, um, lab research, the issue of zoonotic and One Health, regulatory capacity, the issue around intellectual property, um, um, being able to move, move, uh, move emergency supplies, um, having robust health systems and making sure um, that, um, that this, this all takes uh, um, under a, a policy development framework. So I'm gonna end there and um, allow the other panelists to, to talk as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for sharing the lessons that we, that we learned uh, pandemic. And thank you for, for honoring the time. I'll now call upon our panelists. 
Um, the next one is Prof Simbai, who's also joining us online. Briefly about Prof, he is the interim CEO of the Human Sciences Research Council, an honorary professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at the University of Cape Town. He's also a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Over to you, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. I'll speak as a social scientist, uh, basically uh, describing the role that humanities and social sciences research uh, can play. Those of us who work in public health, uh, particularly on HIV, have long known about the importance of behavioral and social factors in health. Therefore, it is not surprising that applying solely biomedical approaches only provides some, but not all of the answers needed to address any new epidemic. It's therefore critical for social sciences and humanities to be used in to help in addressing health issues. Indeed, many lessons have been learned uh, over the years, even from the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014 to 16, and more recently uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Essentially, uh, evidence shows that not only Diagnostics and vaccines are essential, but we also need uh, information that's collected by uh, humanities and social sciences, uh, which is very critical, and thus uh, ensuring the inclusion of all relevant disciplines. So, uh, Basically what we have learned, there are many lessons that we have learned, uh, including how under DSI, uh, we, we came together to work particularly focuses on humanities and social sciences research. I'm sure Professor Saletti, who is speaking at the end of this uh, session, will talk about the National Policy Data Observatory uh, so I will not cover that. But essentially the point is that at the start of the institution, every research institution scrammed uh, by itself to find out what it is that they could do uh, to contribute towards the fight against COVID-19. And using their own resources, they were able to kickstart some relevant research. And, and this is where DSI's own agenda to coordinate these processes, particularly amongst its entities, um, is, is a good illustration of what lessons we have learned. But Professor Saletti will elaborate on that, I hope. Essentially, the idea of a war room is not new. Um, indeed, a few years ago, the Department of Health, with support from Virgin United, did try to set up a NERV center to bring together all relevant uh, information, starting with HIV, uh, and in particular, including spatial distribution. This is akin to the model that's used um, in the US uh, by CDC. For some reason, that initiative uh, felt to become a reality. But uh, there, there are many lessons to learn uh, about the issue of global health security, for example, on what happened with both Ebola and Zika. And in fact, I was privileged to gather with Professor uh, uh, <laughs> Glenda uh, that we visited uh, the Emergency Operations Center of CDC in Atlanta way back in 2016. And it was at that time, in fact, in our own country, uh, 
they were moved to set up a National Public Health Institute of South Africa. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't had much of that, but the idea was essentially to have this institute known as NAPISA, which was going to incorporate a number of other institutions and work together with other research organizations, uh, be the heart of uh, data on research in the country. And unfortunately, I uh, haven't heard much about that, but at least uh, there are good examples of the Africa CDC and some regional uh, CDCs, which has sprung up, which basically share the same idea of collaborating and sharing information. So essentially the idea is that we should find ways, not only how entities under DSI work together, but across the board, because the other research entities reporting to other ministries, such as the National Department of Health, and agriculture, land reform, and rural development, among others. And of course, in government, uh, the Department of Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation is also uh, central. Uh, there is need uh, to, to really collaborate uh, across the board, uh, including with universities, uh, as well as professional societies. Again, uh, NPDO, which Professor Celesi will be an ex excellent example of how to respond timelessly. I will skip that. Um, to, to say what we need to do to speed up innovation uh, in terms of taking, and this really relates more to pharmaceuticals uh, going to market. I think we can learn a lot about how the US government approved vaccines for emergency use uh, to start with. Uh, I, I know we have our own local authority, which also worked pretty fast to approve uh, those vaccines once they have been approved elsewhere. Of course, they're their own processes, rather than wait uh, for very long processes of converting research into use. I think my time is up. I will stop there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Simbayi, for sharing your insight on the topic. Our next speaker is Dr. Niraj Mistry. Um, Dr. Niraj Mistry is a deputy director at the Future Africa University of Pretoria. He's also a global public health physician, trained medically as well as in economics. Over to you, Dr. Semester, you've got five minutes. When you see me standing, just know that your time is up, but no pleasure. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good morning, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, so very often as a public health physician, I'm asked the question, what was the most important thing we did in the response to COVID-19? And I think if we look at it from a biomedical point of view, we're going to say, firstly, we developed a vaccine, right? And it's interesting because there are many communities and, and, and countries around the world where prior to the administration or availability of the COVID vaccine, um, there was about 60 to 70% immunity in populations. There was one study in South Africa that showed that South Africans were widely exposed to the uh, vaccine uh, uh, to the virus and developed immunity to it. Now, I'm not saying the vaccine wasn't effective. We packed a one-two punch with exposure and the vaccine, but the biomedical model will tell us that the vaccine was important. The humanities and uh, sociologists will tell us it was social distancing. It was how communities organized. Um, the public health community will say it was the non-pharmaceutical interventions um, that worked well. So my response when people ask me what was the most important thing, it's often all of the above. And that's the way we really need to think about uh, innovation and policy. And I think with this particular panel or this particular colloquium, we're looking at science and we have a tendency to go with the natural sciences and technologies and uh, often at the cost of the social sciences, economic sciences, et cetera. And so, 
I bring this up because at Future Africa at the University of Pretoria, it's a transdisciplinary platform where we try to look at issues and complex problems from different angles and disciplines at the same time. And my favorite example as a public health physician is I ask people to wash their hands to prevent germ transmission for food and waterborne diseases. And only a few people wash their hands. But when I collaborate with a priest and he says cleanliness is next to godliness, lo and behold, most people wash their hands. And that's the outcome that I want. And this is the challenge that we have in actually taking technologies and making them implementable so that they're acceptable to communities who need to be the recipients of our science and technology innovations. So, so that's the context in which we approach um, these complex problems like COVID-19, but the transdisciplinary lens can be applied to many other global challenges, everything from climate to peace and security to conflict resolution uh, and food security, uh, for example. So for this panel, you know, looking at the questions, what were some of the lessons learned? And, and I speak uh, to this from a global context in which I was working, it's not just a uniquely South African problem, is that we don't learn from lessons learned, okay? We've had Ebola, H1N1, swine flu, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, Rift Valley fever, Marburg, et cetera. So this is not the first outbreak or pandemic we're facing. And after everyone, there's some sort of review. How was the response? What did we do right? And then it's put in a report that sits on a shelf and, and we don't go back to those reports. So the challenge we have now is how do we institutionalize these lessons and affect the baseline from which we can then respond to particular issues? Um, the second thing is science works in a context, right? Now, often we say as a transition economy or a developing country, oh, we don't have the resources to implement these scientific interventions. But take these rich countries like the US, the UK, Sweden, uh, Denmark. These were countries that had ample response, uh, uh, resources. They had advanced technologies, and yet they all had different responses to the epidemic. Uh, you know, Some said, well, let it just run wild. Let's see what herd immunity does. Some went for social distancing, et cetera. And, and so I think what we need to find is what is our uniquely South African context in which we want to diffuse our innovations. And as the Rainbow Nation, we did see that some communities were more resilient and some communities were more vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of their social and economic impact, but also purely from a virological standpoint, some communities were more vulnerable to mortality. Um, so understanding our local context could breed the world uh, uh, of information into what makes us resilient and what makes us vulnerable. Um, uh, so the other thing I wanted to add, just two more points, um, was that the um, communities that we have to engage needs to expand beyond the scientific community. I mean, as a physician, Sometimes I have trouble understanding a virologist or um, uh, I have trouble uh, understanding a pathologist. And each sector within medicine or discipline speaks their own language. That's within medicine. But when we get to economics, sociology, humanities, it's all different languages. So one of the most important things we need to do is find common language. And, and part of our challenge being in academics or, or deep in our disciplines is we speak the language of our discipline that only we understand. Um, this is nicely documented by uh, 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 Stephen Pinker in The Curse of Knowledge, where the more we know about our field, the less we're able to communicate about it. Uh, so I think this is really, really important where we distill our language in ways that everyone can understand. But how do we prepare for the next response by creating those enabling social environments and institutional collaborations um, that allow us to create that enabling environment for a response? How do we engage local indigenous communities? How do we actually tap into indigenous plants, for example? 
one of the stories I keep hearing in the South African context is there's this shrub that was used and it was boiled to make tea. And there were communities who swore by the fact that this protected them. I don't know if it was a placebo effect, but certainly they didn't report high mortality in their communities. And these are the types of things that we need to um, explore. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, based on that point of uh, communication, we saw, uh, especially now with social media, how misinformation, disinformation, and wrong information just can spread virally. Um, and I think it's really important that in any response, we look at timely communication, the right message at the right time, conveyed in the right way by the right uh, messenger. Um, and then uh, my last point, and I think this has been brought up on developing the pipeline for research and development. And as a transition economy that kind of has the best of both worlds, but we straddle both worlds, we have the opportunity of open science and innovation, as well as looking at intellectual property and market-based incentives to drive innovation. So with that, thank you. Wow. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mistry, for those great insights. Our last speaker is Prof. Sileti, Prof. Yona Sileti. He is the Chief Director of Science of science missions in the Department of Science and Innovation. He is resp responsible for implementing the protection, promotion, development, and management of Indigenous Knowledge Act. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Program Director. Um, I've been introduced in the context of IKS and Professor Misty also spoke to me as we were sitting here around IKS, but I am not going to speak on IKS today. I'm going to speak on the National Policy Data Observatory. We consider this to have been a unique reaction to the fight against COVID-19 uh, in terms of uh, the department leveraging the science institutions to strengthen the capabilities of the state in delivering their mandate in the combat, in the combating of the pandemic. And um, like uh, Professor Gray, I also got to be invited to a meeting by the Director General, but uh, the main player was the Minister of Science and Innovation. And um, in one of the topics that came up was uh, his observation that uh, it cannot be right that the only scientific platform that we are able to listen to on radio and television was from the biomedical perspective. So he pushed uh, us to consider a multi-dimensional approach to fill in the gap so that we can look at the, uh, at the behavioral side of the work, but also other factors that were not being considered. So it is during the COVID-19 pandemics that uh, the South African uh, Department of Science and Innovation was joined with the champions of the Statistician General, the current Statistician General, uh, and uh, the Commissioner for SARS, unlikely partners, but this became the champions for the establishment of the Data Policy Observatory. So in terms of its uh, purpose, it was to track socioeconomic and health impacts from COVID-19, to track policy responses and support decision-making that would lead to a long-term sustainable recovery in a post-COVID-19 uh, world. Through the observatory, the DSD established a small, high-level team of eminent knowledge institutions in the country to extract insights from existing data sets in order to provide live and actionable insights um, for policymakers, the public, and also while respecting the public, uh, the citizens' rights. It was a government-led in, uh, uh, initiative I've already spoken to the three leaders, not um, 
championed this, they championed it through strategic forum networks. One of them was through FOSAD, which is a director general's uh, meeting to get an endorsement. And then from which they went to NAT joints, which also uh, took it to the Corona Command Council. So I think that the first lesson to be picked up is the, the pitching of the intervention at the right level. We had written to Sachi chairs and centers of excellence initially to request them to participate in this. But their challenge was, how are we going to report? Who are we going to report to? So through this uh, approach, we cut down all the hesitance from these institutions to participate because we're going to have direct access to the city of powers, the NAT joints, the IMC on vaccines, and also the Corona Command Council. Our colleagues uh, were able to present this to all those areas. So the first probably point, the second point of uh, maybe what made this successful, apart from pitching it at the right end and having the right champions, was an acknowledgement of the work that had been done by the Department of Health around promoting science in the public domain. So having acknowledged that, it was easier and quicker to work with them because we did not pull them down because they did not look at the social sciences. So that was an important part of creating that forum. Probably the third lesson um, that we could draw from this is um, the, the, the channels of communication of the decisions of referred to the NAT joints, but went also to NEDLAC. We also went to communities. So it was important that uh, in terms of uh, the decision-making, we got to the right seats of power. The establishment of a fit-for-purpose vehicle for the NPDO, we didn't have a huge bureaucracy. We had the minister as the head, and then the three champions, but we also had a steering committee of all government departments as demand generators. What is it that they wanted to see so that it could go through the, uh, the NPDO? And then we also had anchor institutions, knowledge institutions. I see my colleagues, some of them in here, uh, such as the ASAF, HSRC, Dr. Simbai, and we also had the National Institute of the Humanities and Social Sciences. We had the South African uh, uh, Population Research Infrastructure. So we went quite broad and some chairs and some also centers of excellence were part of the performance of this research. So that was also quite helpful. We also had the data center as the core part of the secretariat with access to the high performance computing and also data sources and to analytics. Uh, and they were able to uh, assist in the achievement of uh, much of the goals. Maybe the next lesson is that we built on existing strength in an NSI. They, this observatory was going to be an observatory of observatories. So we recognized other observatories in this area. We also recognize that the CSSR and the data center had the platforms to visualize and also to do uh, 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 data analytics. Uh, and also they had the SunRen uh, through which we could do, take this information and the, the DERISA for storage and the like. We also recognized that the, the program of which I was as the DDG then, Research Development and Support, at the such chairs and the centers of excellence and research infrastructures, which were then mobilized as part of instruments to provide this data. And uh, maybe towards the, the end, we could also recognize the effort of the South African, of the statistics of Africa with the massive databases that they had. We also mobilized uh, a lot of other entities such as the Auditor General's Office, and we are in the process of having access to their data uh, as such. Maybe just a couple more, Chair, if you'd allow me. Um, the fact that we 
produced tangible uh, deliverables every week to the IMC and to the NAT joints. And that we responded to each request with the research. Uh, the HSRC did a lot of that uh, surveys and the like. Uh, and probably lastly, that we, the flexibility of the NPDO in meeting these needs was useful, but it is that flexibility that we can also position for the future. So in summary, unflagging support from DSA, Stats of Africa, SAD, and DPME. DPME were part of the secretariat and, NP, uh, and also a ability to support the state. It could be that, say that the integration and alignment and the coordination was optimal. The NPDO also had set immediate targets. They didn't want to do everything at one time. They had their own objective set. And then the NPDO had already marshaled capabilities fit for this purpose in terms of the institutions uh, and the infrastructure. Key government departments were also ready to subscribe to this work. The NPDO was modestly funded uh, through the Department of Science and innovation. And uh, lastly, it, 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 as a result of its work, the NPDO is beginning to interact with the new players, such as the Zondo Commission, the uh, uh, Special Investigating Unit. And so we, the agenda has gone beyond the fight for the pandemic. <laughs> We've been involved as well in the KwaZulu Natal disasters as the NPDO. So it is positioned to contribute to future uh, pandemics and challenges. We are waiting on the DPME to involve us in the work of the ERRP as part of our contribution to strengthening the state capabilities in coordinating the system uh, uh, and all government approach as such. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, what I liked about all our, um, our speakers is that they'll say, my last point, after they complete that point, my last point, my last point. <laughs> I used to think this only happens um, at churches, but yeah. Um, other, than, um, other than that, um, thank you so much for your great insight, uh, Prof. I would like Dr. Miss to join us in front. I'll now open the floor for questions. Tina, I would need your assistance to check online if you've got any comments or questions. So far, I'm aware of one comment by by Abida Dawood, it reads, totally agree with Prof Simbai and Dr. Mistry about transdisciplinar transdisciplinarity. The social sciences and humanities are critical for STI development and implementation. Thank you. Yes, I see we've got three hands. Can you help with mics? And yes, Tina will also pay attention to the online questions. I would start with you, Prof. Yeah, the mic is coming. Uh, thank you very much for really brilliant presentations on a very grim topic. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to make a point and then ask a question. The point is that I think what we have been seeing and we've experienced is a triumph of the Republic of Science. The Republic of Science held firm in the early 2000s against the intransigence of the then presidency on HIV. And they built expertise and they built institutions. And it is these that have taken us to where we are today in understanding and mitigating COVID. So thank you for that. The second is a stupid question. Uh, my back of envelope ca calculation suggests that the mortality the difference between 1918 and 2022 is by a factor of maybe one fifth or one tenth. So this gives you an incredible social experiment. How do you explain the difference? 
Is it greater wealth, better drugs, the absence of drugs? I'd love an answer because I'm clueless. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I suggest that we take all the questions, just pay attention to the question, we'll answer them at the end. And also Prof. Lenda and Prof. Simbayo online. Um, next question. Thank you for that question, Prof. Hello. Hi. Okay, uh, mine is just to make a comment. Uh, Dr. Musri, I, I agree with that, all of the above. It had to be multidisciplinary. But I think we kind of forgetting the one point where we ignored the family meetings and the news briefings. I think those also play the critical part for COVID. Thank you. Thank you. You Thank may go you. ahead. I will take you from Prof by standing. Uh, I'm Kumbulani from uh, public, discipline of public health at UKZN. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the panelists, I think they provided the rich presentations. Uh, however, I missed one important point in my view, mm -hmm. and it's an elephant in the room. Vaccine hesitancy, especially Prof. Simbai as a social scientist. I was hoping he will really touch on that. And uh, for record, I mean, vaccine hesitancy is not a new phenomenon. And it's still unfolding. And I'm not sure how much is happening in that space. You will recall, Chairperson, uh, when um, the vaccine was introduced at very early days at the pilot stages, I mean, I think there was an anticipation that everybody will be jumping and will be looting vaccine. Even the transportation were heavily guarded by heavily armed personnel. But the opposite was, uh, was true. In other words, there is something missing about human behavior that we are not taking our time to understand. And in fact, even Glenda Gray, uh, Prof Gray uh, did um, cover a nice uh, that uh, illustration about what we need to prepare for the next um, you know outbreaks but I still see this is missing perhaps they can comment thank you thank you thank you for that I knew a question of that nature will definitely come up yeah it will be addressed over to you um, Dr. Mipuli th th thank you for that um, uh opportunity uh, I, i'm going to perhaps make a quick um a anecdotal comment and try to link from the the presentation of uh professor gray and uh, and dr mystery um north america europe and the other countries have had a thing that they called uh, zapi which effectively stands for zoonotic anticipated anticipatory preparedness initiative uh, for quite a number of years, basically a preparedness initiative to conduct surveillance and, and, and develop new technologies uh, in anticipation of an outbreak of a pandem pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the point I'm making is, even with all of that, we, they, they, were, they, were, they actually missed this particular pandemic because they didn't have the tools in time for it, for them to actually respond. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, there were elements of it where they were actually almost ready because some of the technologies could actually be quickly uh, flipped towards uh, uh, developing um, new vaccines. But then there's the other aspect that actually has come through that actually, the, when you read a lot of this, the, the scientific, um, or you know, um, epidemiological studies um, that is, um, is, is, is unable to explain why a large component of developing countries' populations mm -hmm. have actually not died mm -hmm. in the wake of this particular pandemic and have actually also not flooded their, their, you know, their poorly resourced institutions. And the rationale for that has not actually come through quite well. Um, and, and the question is, um, if, I if we are thinking going forward, given this, the proposal for a pandemic preparedness initiative and what we have learned from what others have done, um, what is it that actually should we be doing uh, going forward? 
Okay, um, thank you for that. Before I hand over to the panelists, we have one comment by Olutoyin Olayten. It says, thanks very much for the presentations. Imagine if the strategy collaboration singleness of purpose and agency applied to tackling the COVID-19 pandemic was applied to the nagging problem of social, gender, and resource exclusion pervading the African continent. Um, thank you for that. I'll now hand over to our panelists. I'm not sure who's willing to go first. Maybe we can start with Prof Simbai since he's already ready. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, the comments and questions asked. I will leave some of them to Professor Gray, uh, those which are particularly of a medical nature. Just, just to agree, I only have two uh, comments. Uh, with regard to the impact of family meetings, yes, we must acknowledge that, as did social media. Um, I, I think the, the public was informed uh, largely by uh, um, such initiatives. Um, so in, in effort, in, in some of the research we did, questions were asked about how the perceived government we have dealt with uh, COVID-19. And most of them indicated they did have a lot of trust in what government had been doing. With regards to vaccine hesitancy, um, we undertook a lot of research on this issue as did uh, UJ, um, as well as uh, National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences um, and, and other, other organizations. We shared the data that we collected as Professor Saletti indicated uh, with uh, NPDO. Um, and this was discussed in fact, it went to the point of where this was shared with GCIS, who then mounted um, uh, campaigns addressing the issue of vaccine hesitance. It's, it's worth noting that the, the overwhelming majority of South Africans either accepted or were prepared to be vaccinated. I think we've kind of let our foot off the pedal a little bit with the excitement of uh, you know, uh, declining numbers. Uh, and uh, I pray that we won't have another wave happening because there are indeed still quite a, a lot of people who are yet to be vaccinated. But the important thing is there was communication led by GCIS and others directed at those people who are still uh, declining to be vaccinated. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you, Prof. Um, Prof. Linda Gray. Thanks. Um, these are excellent questions. And so I'm going to start off with the, the issue around the mortality and the excess deaths. And just to say that um, the MRC has been, um, has been following excess deaths year on year uh, since before the HIV pandemic. And that's why we were able to, to note that people were dying, you know, in, um, in their but in their reproductive ages and men and women are dying like they went before in comparison to people over 60. So we have a good year on year um, understanding from about the 1970s about um, excess mortality. And we can track like, like some parts of the world uh, who should be dying when and how. And that's why we were able to, to see that, you know, over 330,000 people died uh, due to COVID in our country, uh, probably one of the fifth highest mortality rate at a global level. So I think the issue around surveillance and, and investing in uh, uh, death data is imperative. And, and just goes on to the question about, well, what about the other developing countries in Africa? Um, South Africa is probably one of the only countries in on the southern on, on, on the continent of Africa that actually um, has the capability or has been tracking mortality and excess deaths. So when you look at excess deaths uh, above us, th there's no data. So we can't accurately say um, what impact the COVID pandemic had on, on countries north of our borders because we don't have that data. Um, and you know, given that we had the fifth highest mortality rate, um, it's unlikely that the other uh, 
um, African countries uh, had less than that didn't um, have a have a bad uh, had a bad effect. What could have mitigated against that is obviously the youth bulge, and also lower levels of HIV and comorbidities. But certainly in South Africa, uh, we saw that uh, poor socioeconomic status, um, poor provinces, um, um, and um, people with comorbidities and HIV uh, increased your, your chances of mortality. So, so, so um, the, the, the pandemic cost South Africa um, greatly. And those loss of lives now surpassed uh, that we have uh, from HIV and AIDS. So we should not underestimate uh, what happened to our country and the devastation um, of the, and the high, high mortality rates. So I think that's an important thing. In terms of uh, future pandemics and the issue of uh, zoonotic diseases, we do need to approach this in a one health approach. And the DSI, NRF um, have done uh, have a call out for a future pandemic um, response, which is a kind of a, a I think what they're looking for is a is a virtual collaboration with, from all institutions in South Africa. And certainly um, a, a One Health um, a zoonotic element is gonna be critical for the success of, of this program going forward. In terms of uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy, I think it's uh, there's an issue um, that, you know, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, why there is vaccine hesitancy. hesitancy. And first of all, is obviously is the, the trust, the lack of government trust, Lack of trust of, of Western medicine, and also um, the 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 um, sophisticated ability of anti vaxxers and conspiracy people, the theories to to hit the social media and and get to platforms that that are quite sophisticated, and we were quite lagging. So um, so you know the uh, uh, the. I uh, would say, you know, vaccine response, we were we were lagging, we were caught with our pants down in our inability to actually respond and be proactive, anticipate this and 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 improve issues around communication. And I think going forward, you know, in terms of a future pandemics, you know, government trust is going to have to be critical as well as the trust in in science and um and and medical and medical science as well. So I think that's, um, uh, you know, all I'm going to say on that, I think, I don't know if I've missed anything out uh, for which the other panelists can, can add to. Um, thank you, Prof. Well covered. Um, I'll hand over to our panelists on the floor. Um, thank you. I, I, I'll just add to the comments made. Uh, I think uh, Prof. Greg covered uh, the biomedical side uh, quite well. Um, I'm just going to respond from a public health point of view. I, I do like the idea of um, the family unit and looking at communities uh, when it comes to information. When it comes to public health, we always um, sort of uh, uh, fragmented by demographic group. Let's look at mothers, let's look at children, let's look at uh, the elderly, etc. And there is a move to actually address the family unit, which is multi-generational, which is different ages and see how we tackle public health issues um, at that family unit level and then expanding it to a community level. So it's a, it's a more sort of comprehensive approach uh, addressing everyone. Um, uh, so that's one. I, I think there's another public health angle that we need to look at. So I think you know everything from surveillance to research and development, et cetera, for new tools and, and picking things up is important. But in our response, we often talk about health system strengthening. And the response uh, that happened in New York City in Central Park was when they were putting up huge tents. When you look at China that was building, uh, uh, sort of putting thousands of beds in huge gymnasiums, et cetera, that's not a health system. And, and what we're talking about now is surge capacity. So yes, we have our health system, we have our lab and monitoring surveillance systems, but in the event where we're dealing with mass casualties, uh, um, uh, huge morbidity and mortality, what is the surge capacity that we need? What are the infrastructures? And it's interesting because the UN uses the blue helmets as peacekeeping forces, but in times of capacity, uh, uh, catastrophe, they become white helmets and they help out with these sort of uh, relief situations. And is there a way that we can repurpose our military in those sorts of situations? That's just an example, but that might be an innovative way of using existing infrastructure in, in response uh, from a surge capacity point of view. Just a couple of comments in terms of the family and all that. 
the NPDO took care that it brought in institutions that are for an orientation for long-term studies in rural communities. The South African uh, population research infrastructure has got households in KwaZulu-Natal, in Popo, Western Cape, and they've started another one as an urban one in, the, uh, in Gauteng. So they have contact telephonically and the questions that they featured were around family issues and our families were responding to that. So we were able to do that, uh, to bring in that. We also differentiated the inputs into the NPDO between the urban and even in the urban, between the suburbs and the townships. So we're able to collect information across so that we represent South African perspectives. And uh, on the hesitance, I think that uh, the data center was able to do a good work on trend, social media trend analysis. And they were able to advise the IMC and the Coronavirus Command Council around what, the, uh, what was emerging, but also they sat down physically with the, the HSRC and the GCIS to prepare strategies for communicating the uh, information to the public, especially the campaigns uh, against hesitancy. Just a note, hesitancy was not coming from the surveys carried out by the HSRC. It wasn't coming from rural communities and people that were not, it was the educated who had degrees and in good jobs. Uh, and that's why it was uh, coming from. So we need maybe to take a class analysis of why that is the case. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for answering all the questions that we are asked. And now I would give you one minute each just to, to say your final remark. Um, Prof. Zimbaye again. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in essence, it's strange to say that COVID-19 was a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have changed in the way we look, uh, even at research, uh, and how we collaborate with others. Uh, if, even the fact that uh, I only work one day a week at the office. Um, so th there are many lessons that we can draw from what has happened, and we can only improve going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Gray? So I think, I mean, for my, my response is that actually the, the scientific response in South Africa was a really decolonized response. Um, we could not rely on, on anyone for diagnostics, so we made our own plan. Um, everything that we did was organic and, and responded to our needs and what we needed to respond to. Um, and so I think it's a, it, was, it was very refreshing in that um, the response, I think that's why it was so successful, is because we did what we needed to do as a country in terms of science and not what any um, colonial master was telling us to do. Um, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, through the pandemic, uh, we all had this urge to get back to normal. And then um, this new phrase came up, the new normal. Uh, and I think we have the opportunity to reinvent that uh, in a more engaged, more deeply connected society um, uh, um, to focus on things that matter. So. To talk about uh, future preparedness means that we have to coordinate, plan, because even if we have shared the different uh, inputs that we have done here today, it's not coordinated. So we need to find a mechanism of how as a country, we can create such a platform that will bring all these efforts together. So the need for planning and coordination uh, SD, SG still is necessary for us to go forward. And maybe just to consider that the department is also considering 
possibilities of our pandemics institutes. So, so that uh, the question that was asked by the chair uh, around these uh, um, uh, diseases and all that, we can create a preparedness from a research perspective. Thank you. Okay, this brings us to the end of um, our session on STI, COVID-19 and future pandemics. Once again, I would like to thank all our panelists for your great insight, great presentation. Yes, <laughs> they did so well. They did so well. And thank you to the audience for bearing with us. Chair, I did try to manage the time well, but I struggled. I think next time we need more than just five minutes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, as long as it's not me who's acknowledging. Claire and your team, please come. Um, it's a conversation, so maybe you can also save us some, some minutes. So we want to decolonize the use of time. Thank you. Um, can we have some roving mics for up here? Boris, I'm sorry about this. Okay, great. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is thank you to Ilsa and her panel. Thank you for letting us um, go before you. Um, what I can say is this is going to be a very tightly managed um, session because one of our panelists has to catch a plane. So that's the good news. So what I'd like to say is that today, I'd like to welcome four women who are leaders in the innovation and entre entrepreneurship ecosystem here. And in Margaret Mead's words, famous 1930s woman um, who did research early on, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And what I'd like to say, these ladies are exactly such a group. They are the movers and shakers in the VC and SME funding world in South Africa. And they have been changing our world for the better. So at a colloquium like this, one of the most important questions we need to ask is how do we use technology and innovation to help South Africa's change challenges of inequality, poverty, unemployment, and sustainability. So how do we use SDI to increase our GDP growth? How do we copy what South Korea, China, Vietnam, all of them, how, what did they do? How did they use um, technology and innovation to massively grow their economies and reduce their unemployment? So Professor Tregena said, innovation is a driver of economic progress. And what I'd like to add to that is that entrepreneurship is a major driver of economic progress. So our theory of change is that actually entrepreneurship drives innovation, guys. We're sitting here in the NSI, but I'd like to put across to you guys that actually entrepreneurship drives innovation. So I'm very glad that we have such a panel with us today. And the, the issue is, is that entrepreneurship and innovation requires funding. And the problem is, is that access to funding for innovators and entrepreneurs is a major impediment everywhere in the world. Banks are prohibited from funding high-risk enterprises by BAL4, and institutional investors are pension funds who look after pensioners' money because it's high-risk, they shy away. And therefore, governments around the world have helped build the private sector-based SME and venture capital industries by providing grant funding or or subordinated funding. But what I can say is that what came out of our last decadal plan in South Africa was an emphasis on increasing PhDs, publications, and patents coming out of universities. And the bad news is, and I'm using Razagun, who said we can deepen our criticism, so I'm going to be saying this, 
is that that did not lead to innovation and that did not lead to increased employment. And one of the reasons being, and you guys need to know this, is that only 5% of innovation comes out of universities. 95% comes out of the private sector. So the point is, is I have a panel here from the private sector and I'm really pleased to have them. So my first question is going to go to Tish. Does the South African private sector have sufficient high-risk capital to support the innovation and entrepreneurship that South Africa needs? Yeah, this <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks Kate, for having me today. Um, and you know, the short answer is no, but there's also a long answer and a very, you know, very it's a very heavy question. So I do think um, that we have seen you know, awesome instruments coming into the market recently, um, like the Sovereign Innovation Fund. And I've been lucky enough to work with a couple of um, outcomes, if you'd like, from the DSI. So I was lucky enough to work on um, a technology that came out of the HISA program um, and work on, on, on commercializing that technology. So I've understood the effort that government has made in the market. Um, so it would be remiss to, to not acknowledge that in my answer. Um, and, you know, instruments like the Sovereign Innovation Fund is critical for fundraisers like us um, because that concessional funding gets us a shoe in with institutional investors. So the minute we, we have some sort of concessional funding alongside our own funding, pension funds are willing to listen to us. And more so recently, with the recent changes to Regulation 28, um, there's been a, a larger spotlight on venture capital. But unfortunately, pension funds are still very averse um, because of the perceived risk in the VC market. Um, and, you know, so, so that concessional funding really goes a long way in convincing them to come along and participate in the market. And obviously, pension funds themselves have large pockets of, of, of funding. Um, and investing in the VC market, the impact they can make with investments in the VC market is massive. So while we have seen these green shoots of positivity um, within the VC market from the pension fund side and even the DSI side, um, is, is it enough? No, it's most certainly not enough. Um, and I've, there's been a couple of instances where I felt that very acutely. Um, and I think, you know, if you, if you have gone into the more rural areas and you're speaking to a child in, the, in Karankua, that has an idea and wants to develop that idea into a commercialization opportunity. And you know, well, previously I wasn't aware a lot of a lot aware of a lot of the problems that these these rural communities face. So how would I understand the solutions that they have? Um, and when I grew to understand those, and I grew to understand the solutions they developed for that, unfortunately, I knew deep down that they weren't ever going to get any funding. Um, and that's just because you know, smaller buckets of capital, unfortunately, get allocated into urban areas and not necessarily rural areas. Um, and as a result, you know, those those opportunities don't see that, don't see funding. Um, so the larger the higher risk capital bucket, the more the proliferation of that capital, um, well, the more, you know, the capital will be distributed um, accordingly. Okay, can I really apologize to my panelists as well as to all of you? I've forgotten to introduce these amazing women. So you've just listened to, um, to Tish Naidu, who is setting up her own VC fund at 27.4. So um, I really apologize, guys. I, I was trying to, to cut us down. We have Alison Collier, who, um, who took on our um, Palo. Is, um, she heads up the South African chapter of Endeavor. It's a not-for-profit global organization that is successfully facilitating entrepreneurship throughout the world, but it's been particularly successful here in South Africa, and she'll talk more about that soon. We also have Thiru Patha, who's one of the founding members of the SASME Fund, um, which is supporting third-party fund managers and entrepreneurship and innovation. And we have Shelley Lotz, who is head of research at the South African Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. So I really apologize. Okay, Thiru, I understand that the SASME fund is acting as a funder fund 
to provide high-risk capital to entrepreneurs and innovators. The floor is yours. Thanks. Um, is it working? Okay, cool. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think it would be useful if I were to um, start with a bit of background on what the SASME Fund has done to date um, and what we're planning to do in the future thereafter. Um, so the background, uh, the SASME Fund was set up as part of the CEO initiative a few years ago to help grow the South African economy and uh, avert a ratings downgrade. Um, so the fund was set up by 50 corporates and the PIC um, and was capitalized with 1.4 billion rands. Um, we have been one of the most active investors into VC funds in SA and we've helped create a number of the venture capital funds that exist today. Um, so we're currently invested in seven venture capital funds. Um, and in addition to that, we felt that we needed to do a bit more to grow the broader ecosystem. Um, so we have supported two of the most effective accelerators in the country. Um, so one being Grindstone Ventures and the other being Allison's Endeavor. Um, we also supported the first fund manager development program um, that was delivered by Savka. And we have now recently um, supported the first program for venture capital managers specifically. So our experience in the VC industry has highlighted a clear lack of institutional capital into venture capital funds. Um, and this is evidenced by the fact that we are generally the only institutional investor in the funds that we have committed to. So this makes it difficult for VC funds um, to reach a sustainable fund size, given that there isn't sufficient institutional capital. Um, and it's also a deterrent to new fund managers entering the industry. So it's very important that this um, asset class be stimulated by some form of soft or subordinated capital. Um, and this is usually the role of government. Um, so what subordinated capital would do is seek to reduce the overall risk the actual risk and the perceived risk of the asset class. Um, and in doing so, and also properly structured and executed, hopefully um, attract more institutional capital. So I think with that in mind, the SASME fund has decided to raise a venture capital fund of funds taking these principles into account. Um, so what we did is offer some downside protection in the form of first loss capital. Uh, this is being provided by the SASME fund itself, as well as uh, USAID. In addition, we are um, managing the fund on a no fee, no carry basis. And we're able to do this due to the generosity of the SASME fund in covering the costs of the management of the fund as part of their industry building initiatives. So in summary, our fund offers a diversified, low risk, low cost platform for institutional investors to access venture capital in a very cautious prudent manner. That's great. I mean, I, I, I think don't underestimate how much this is needed. Can I maybe just add one thing, which I think that no, no, your fund you're is, doing, is doing exceptionally well that two didn't fall out, is the allocation of that capital. Okay, so what's really important is the SASME fund knows and understands which VC parties in South Africa 
are really investing that money into the right entrepreneurial businesses that are creating the most revenue, creating the most jobs, and therefore be able to attract even more capital from the global market, which is an incredibly important role that you've been doing and looking forward to see the performance step. Thanks, Alison. I'm not good at blowing our own trumpet. <laughs> okay, so now Alison is going to blow her trumpet. She's going to tell you about what Endeavor is getting up to, both in terms of the, um, the accelerator program, because innovators and entrepreneurs don't just need money. They need support. They, they have so many challenges, and they need support. So, so Endeavor is doing the acceleration, as well as they've set up their own VC funding. So keep going. Great. Thanks so much. And again, I just want to repeat, it's a real pleasure for us as private you know, business and private market to be here working, to, working together with um, the government and with DSI. And just the point that I want to highlight is these tech entrepreneurs that the SASME fund is investing in indirectly through the, the VC funds and that um, Tish is investing in directly. They create an incredible amount of jobs. They are driving huge amounts of revenue growth and attracting like what I think private capital from the international market. And the second piece that I want to call out about these tech entrepreneurs is that here in South Africa, they're solving real problems. So it's addressing why, why are they building their companies? They're building their companies to serve the mass market. So it's the lower income groups and the middle income groups that these businesses are built for because that's where the consumption is. So it's fintech businesses like Ozo, like Yoko, like Time Bank, who are significantly reducing the transaction cost for mass market South Africa to bank. Likewise, if we talk about you know, the other sectors in ed tech, there's Go One, there's Get Smarter, there's Spark Schools. Again, they're significantly bringing down the cost of education, not for the top end, but for the mass market. And it can keep going. So this is, I think, so well aligned with some of the goals that I heard called out yesterday evening in the minister's speech about poverty alleviation and job creation for the youth. So that's sort of just the start. And I want to say Endeavor as an NGO, we're here to drive high growth entrepreneurs for this very reason, because we're here to help support drive the economic growth in the emerging markets through accelerating the growth of these high growth entrepreneurs because they deliver over index job creation and revenue growth into the markets. So that's neat. And then what do we mean by that in terms of numbers? So what we've seen in this acceleration program we've been running here in South Africa close to the last 15, 15, 17 years now. For example, we work here in South Africa with 100 businesses. Globally, we work with probably 2,500. Our headquarters are in New York, but the, the top 30 of those 100 businesses that we work with here in South Africa, just to call it out, the last year they delivered more than 50% revenue growth um, themselves. What does that mean? That means um, that, you know, 10 billion up from 7 billion last year. And when you think about that's only coming from 30 businesses, and those, th those 30 businesses 10 years ago were the size of 2 million rand of, of annual revenue, the contribution that they're making is enormous. And then secondly, with jobs, those businesses are now delivering 6,000 jobs to the economy, up by 2,700 2, jobs from the same time last year. And again, it's only 30 businesses. So what I'm saying is the impact that these, high, these tech businesses have is enormous. But you know, that's when they've grown and they've, they're sort of five to 10 years old. They join Endeavor when they're smaller, when they're about 2 million rand in annual revenue. And the funds, like the innovation fund and, the, and tier, support the businesses in the early stage, but they're all founded in tech. Um, so I just want to say it's really important what's, what's um, happening with this collaboration and increasing the investment in these tech businesses at an early stage. So then how do we accelerate these businesses and how do we help their growth? Well, it's across three areas. We help them with access to markets, both here in South Africa, internationally. Um, then secondly, we help them with access to capital. There's a big shortage of capital, VC capital in South Africa. So we do a lot with encouraging international investors to invest into these businesses. And lastly, we support them with on-demand tailored mentoring. And we've got a mentor, pro bono mentor base of more than 5,000 people globally. Just to give you a feel for the caliber of the individuals, so Adrian Gore and Isaac Shangwe, they set up Endeavor in South Africa you know, 15 years ago. So, and they're very strong um, contributors to our mentor network. Globally, um, who sits on our board, Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn. And then I can go on and list out names from the, of the partners from the top VCs internationally. 
and they all freely give of their time to these up and coming entrepreneurs. Why? Because they really want to support the growth that these entrepreneurs can deliver into the emerging market economies. So I want to say it's, uh, it's wonderful to have SASME fund support, both in our fund and also working with us on the accelerator, because then, you know, we can do more. So in the earlier stage, we've now more than doubled the amount of entrepreneurs here in South Africa that we're supporting and have pulled out we up to 100 entrepreneurs now who are part of our program. Thanks, Claire. Okay, great. Look what the private sector does, guys, whilst, whilst no one's watching. Um, Shelley, you're at SAPCA, and you do the research, and you're an expert in policy initiatives. Please tell us what kind of policies we need to help facilitate more entrepreneurship and innovation in South Africa. Thanks, Claire. Um, so yes, um, at SAFCA, so the Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, so we're a nonprofit and our members are the private equity and venture capital fund managers. And I think it's very um, useful just to take a step back and to say, well, you know, what is, a, what is venture capital? Why, why do we really need it? And the, the point being is that actually we just need more capital. Um, at the end of the day, entrepreneurs and access to capital is really, really important. But exactly as was said by Alison is that you need those skills that go alongside it. You might have a, a fantastic idea, you know, wonderful, um, you know, uh, innovation, but actually running a business and, and trying to get that business to scale to a, a level where actually you can take it international, that might not be your skill set. And that's, the, that's really what a venture capitalist has brought to the table or can bring to the table. And I think that's why it's quite important. Capital on its own, probably not enough to actually help you to actually scale a business because running a business is really tough. And I think the point is that everybody needs quite a lot of support when it comes to that. So um, what do we look at it from a policy perspective? Risk capital in South Africa is essentially pretty scarce and it's not just government funding that's needed. It's a balance between government funding and private sector funding. Everybody has a part to play in terms of actually bolstering innovation in this country. So um, we're part of an initiative called the SA Startup Act. And really what that is, it's a collection of organizations as well as people that actually got together, entrepreneurs, et cetera, to say high growth, high impact businesses that really are based off innovation need to be a national policy imperative. And how do we go about supporting these businesses so that there's more of them, we can get capital to flow to them, and we can help them scale so they can compete with international counterparts. The problem we get to into South Africa is that actually they can't necessarily only be funded by South African venture capital. So we do an annual survey and as of our last survey, um, we had about 1.4 billion rand worth of investment. Um, and in total, the industry is about uh, in, in that calendar year. And in total, the investment size is about 6.7 billion. When you compare that against the international um, global uh, venture capital, that's $643 billion. It, it's huge. And the idea that actually, if you've got a great idea, a very innovative solution that can actually solve Africa's problems, you may actually need international funding. And actually, how do we set the policies to be able to attract that funding and to be able to give you that capital to grow and actually um, move across the continent? And I think those are the types of things that actually the Startup Act is looking at. So it's what are the types of policies that you need to put in place to be able to leverage all the, um, really the expertise as well as the capital that we can actually get to flow to these businesses so that they can thrive. And I think that's actually the important part to just, to just say that there's lots of people working on it and it's that collaboration because everybody has a part to play. Can I just make, yes. make one comment? Please go. So, so Shirley's was, comment was, we, you know, the size of the global market of capital, venture capital, that's there versus the South African market. And then these incredible South Africa founded tech entrepreneurs that we've got that are developing <coughs> solutions for both South Africa and then the Afri African continent. The reality is if we look, say, I'll just call out again, the top 30 entrepreneurs we work with, the same would be true for the top 100. Of the capital they raised last year in, you know, these South Africa founded businesses, 90% of that capital came from the international market. So it's, it's not like these businesses can't grow just with South African capital. They can't. Why? Because there's not enough. We, the work that's happening here is to grow the South Africa, you know, South, our investment into those businesses from South Africa. But as we stand today, if we would like those businesses to grow, create the jobs, 
you know, create the solutions for the, you know, the mass market here in South Africa. We need to create a path to make it easier for international capital to invest in these businesses. Okay, great. And uh, I mean, taking into account, if, if someone invests in through a VC fund, it's 10 year money. This is real FDI. This is not just people buying and selling our shares and our bonds. This is real, um, real investment into, into the local economy. Okay, so um, Tish, we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Why do we need in South Africa innovation and entrepreneurship to stay globally competitive? It's a really silly question, but it needs to be asked. I don't think it's a silly question. I just think um, we'll be preaching to the choir here because I think, you know, we all have a, a very good understanding of how important innovation um, and technology is to the, uh, to the progression of our economy and, and for the social impact um, that it you know could possibly achieve. Um, so I'm gonna try my best to add some value here because I'm pretty sure that you know everyone has a has has something to add on this on this topic. But um, before I, I ramble on, I think it's important to highlight that venture capital um, investors typically fund innovative or technology enabled solutions. Um, and that means a, a flow of funding into the thematics that underlie 4IR. Um, and so having said that, between 1980 and 2020, over a third of all IPOs globally were venture-backed opportunities. Um, and that, that, is, that is huge, right? So an IPO, for those who don't know, um, are, it, it happens when an unlisted company decides to list and raise public money. Um, and that is the ultimate realization of value for a venture capital fund and for our investees. Um, and it also is the achievement of commercialization of technology. Um, and so it's, it's something that we, we consider upfront. Like we, I'm sure Alison shares the sentiments on, on considering exit routes for us um, because exit routes means that technology commercializes and it scales. Um, so it's something we as a fund consider upfront. Um, and to give further context to this, eight of the largest companies in the world were actually venture backed. And these are all names we know. So it's Apple, Tesla, um, Alibaba, those were all venture backed opportunities. Um, and as we do know that those have changed our markets entirely in the last 10 years. So in the UK, for example, in 2018, 19.78 billion pounds were, was, was the contribution from the VC market or VC investees to the UK economy. And that's huge when you consider that actually there was a three times return on what was initially invested by those VCs and those angel investors. So, um, and, and to quantify kind of the social aspect of it, um, because we were a social impact investor, um, the 570,000 jobs were created out of that investment in 2018 alone. Um, and in the UK, for like context, um, that was the equivalent to the amount of people working across all rail, rail and road services. Um, and I mean, I know how hard it is to create one job. So 570,000 jobs is, is a significant feat in my opinion. Um, and so another paper that I was lucky enough to happen upon, um, and as a, like I said, an, an impact investor, it's like finding gold. Um, but this paper found that over a 10 year horizon, U.S. backed companies, or U.S. VC backed companies at least, grew their employment base by 475%, whereas their non-VC backed peers only grew their employment base by 230%. Um, and that finding was significant, and I think really demonstrates the impact that VC could have in an economy. So, you know, can South Africa, a de developing market, afford to lag? No, we can't. Um, and a lot of studies have also found that skills follows markets. So when we need a minus, we skill minus. If we, for, for some reason in the future, hopefully, we need female developers, we will skill female developers. Um, and so it's important for us to take YR into account so that we don't suffer from, um, you know, skills cannibalization as well. Um, so, and I think, you know, in general, South Africans are just very entrepreneurial people. It's entrenching us. We have massive solutions and we find big, big answers for those and we make a plan. Um, so if we do have the appropriate routes of funding, I think we could, we could really make similar impacts. 
Okay, great. Well, that that kind of seg segues into my next question, and that's both for Thuru and Alison. Let's talk about the transformation initiatives that have been happening in the SABC industry, because that's really important. Okay, um, thanks, Claire. Um, I think it's worth noting that the issue of a lack of institutional capital and the issue of a lack of transformation are circular issues. Um, so a lack of institutional capital actually is a deterrent for first time or emerging black fund managers to enter the industry because it's difficult for them to reach a sustainable fund size. Um, and if the lack of institutional capital is a deterrent to new managers entering the industry, it means we actually don't have enough managers for institutions to invest in. Um, so in addition to setting up our venture capital fund of funds platform for institutional investors um, to commit to, we also felt that there was a need to grow the grow and develop the fund manager landscape and also to ensure that there was some transformation happening in the fund manager landscape. Um, so the we decided to do a program, a fund manager program uh, tailored for venture capital fund managers. Uh, we're fortunate actually to have the technology innovation agency co-sponsor the program with us. Um, and we've been quite involved in the design of the program. So taking from our experiences and what we see is lacking in the industry um, and what's preventing fund managers from progressing. Um, so our first program um, that the SASME fund sponsored was very successful in that the participants were able to raise uh, in excess of 1.5 billion rands. So I think, you know, if our current cohort of eight venture capital fund managers can be half as successful, you know, we would have um, done the industry a lot of good. Yeah, great. Thanks. And just building on that, us as Endeavor, we set up our own um, venture capital fund last year. Um, and we were fortunate we raised close to 200 million rand. And what we're really proud of is that's a female run fund. And in addition to that, we were the most active fund in South Africa last year. What does that mean? That means we invested in the most South Africa um, founded entrepreneurs. It doesn't mean we invested the, the highest amount because the check sizes we write are relatively small, somewhere between 5 million rand and 10 million rand. And our role is not to lead a round, but rather to, as Endeavor, we go and find the right VC fund to lead the round, either locally here in South Africa. And then we use our fund to close the gap, to just fill the round quickly so the entrepreneur can get back to business, growing their business and creating the jobs that we think of them. So when we speak about transformation, I want to say that SASME fund is doing incredible work with transformation at the VC fund manager level. Something I wanted to really highlight is just back to some of the growth numbers of, the, of these tech entrepreneurs and the job creation. So if we just again, I'm going to use those same 30, the top 30 entrepreneurs we work with here in South Africa. They have 16,000 jobs this year. They created 3,000 of those last year. So that's, you know, a, a very significant growth rate. But the part that for us is most exciting is over 80% of those jobs are black South African youth. So we don't focus on the 30 entrepreneurs. We focus on the jobs that these entrepreneurs are creating in our economy and therefore have the positive fiscal benefits of the PAYE, one for our, for our tax system that all these employees are, are um, generating. But before that, just the employment itself. And so what my message is, is that these tech entrepreneurs are driving an incredible amount of transformation through the jobs that they're creating. Um, as they build their businesses. Okay, great. So transformation, we need transformation both in, in the VC fund managers, but specifically in the companies that they are investing in. And, and the issue is, is that you know, job creation is something that we need desperately. So, so what I'd really like to go to, and I'm, I, I'm 
Tish, I'm going to give you two minutes to do the pitch. This is going to be an elevator pitch. She's practicing it to get more funds for her um, VC fund. So I, I guess it's just important to highlight who 274 is at, at the heart of it, you know. Um, so when I joined 274 to, to start their VC fund, I joined from the PIC. Um, and 274 itself was funded by a phenomenal black um, female. She started the fund in 2007. And if any of us know what the market is like now, you'll know that in 2007, it was unheard of for a female to start a fund. Um, so I have a lot of admiration for her. Um, but she gave me a blank canvas for what we wanted for the VC fund. Um, and 27.4, I mean, by nature of who it is, so that the name itself speaks to Freedom Day, the 27th of April. Um, and she she prioritizes impact. So this was always intended to be an uh, you know, uh, impact fund at the heart of it. And that's what attracts me because before my days at the PIC, I worked for a hedge fund. And I really felt like my skills weren't having the impact of at least one other person. Um, and that's why I initially moved to the PIC and then, you know, subsequently now to, to 27.4. Um, so there's a lot of assets within the, I mean, there's a lot of good assets on the 27.4 VC fund, but I think we're most proud of the fact that it is a truly impact VC fund. Um, we invest in obviously innovative and technology driven solutions, we prioritize investment in females, black females in particular. Um, we, so it's basically high growth, high impact opportunities. We focus on B2B and B2C, but we have a we can consider B2C. Um, and yeah, we focus on founders. So what is most important for us is building the relationship with founders, understanding their needs, understanding that our values align um, with them. And that that is kind of what builds the relationship for us with, with the portfolio companies that we, we look to invest in. Um, so yeah, we, I, we have a, a network of partners that sit around us, government and non-government partners. Um, an example of that is AB4IR, which is um, a really based accelerator. Um, and they have both skills transfer programs as well as you know incubator and accelerator capability. Um, and for example, one of their drone um, skills labs generated 30 female entrepreneurs. Uh, 30 females who have now been able to build drones and fly them. And all of those, those um, ladies have been employed permanently. Um, and th that's just kind of the common theme with all of our partners. So yeah, that's, I hope was two minutes. <laughs> okay, well, it, it sounded great to me. So given the people that are in the room, I'm gonna get through to talk about SASME, we call it SASME. They hate us when we use that word. Um, there's me. Um, the University Technology Commercial Commercialization Program. So, SASME is talking directly to you guys. Thanks, Claire. I think this is going to be the one topic that people here may be able to relate to a bit more. Um, so, Claire mentioned this earlier in her intro. Um, in South Africa, we produce good research outcomes at our universities and science council. Uh, council. So these are actually, you know, in terms of the number of publications and so on, globally competitive. Um, but where we struggle is uh, developing these technologies further and commercializing um, into actual businesses or startups. Um, and the reason for this is due to the funding and incubation gap between the research stages and the commercialization stage of a business. So there's definitely a need to uh, provide funding at the seed and startup stages of a business uh, to help develop the technology and to help commercialize and spin out these businesses. So bridging these gaps will assist in building a pipeline of deals that are ready to engage with venture capital funds such as Endeavor 27.4 and the like. So this need um, for seed and startup funding was what prompted the SASME fund to set up the first university technology fund in SA 
and the rest of the continent. Um, so we drew on experiences from the UK when we um, started conceptualizing this fund. Um, and in the UK, government had provided funding to individual universities to kickstart their commercialization programs. So what we did was take what government did in the UK with individual universities and try and replicate this with private sector capital in a pooled vehicle for a number of universities. So as you can imagine, it was uh, quite a challenging task in having to bring a number of organizations together, um, especially organizations that typically compete with each other. Um, so some of the key features of the fund, uh, we, um, we uh, got an independent third party fund manager to manage the fund um, and put in place typical venture capital type incentives. Um, but in addition to that, we also shared some of those incentives with the universities. Um, we set aside a pool of capital for the more established universities who had advanced pipelines um, and got these universities to actually co-invest. So put their own money alongside their deals. We also recognized that there are some universities that are actually not as developed as your UCTs and Stellenbosch and so on. And so we set aside capital for those universities as well, where they could come to the fund and have their deals funded without the need to put in capital alongside um, the fund, because we recognize that those universities actually don't have the capital to invest themselves. Um, we also put in some softer grant type funding into the fund so that the manager could invest alongside earlier um, stage businesses. And in a year or two, uh, these businesses would then be ready for the main investment by the fund. And then recognizing um, that the universities themselves don't have sufficient funding to develop their technology in the earlier stages, we as the SASME fund provided funding directly to the universities where they um, send us their transactions, you know, um, that must comply with the predetermined set of criteria. Um, and we then disperse those funds directly to the universities, again, trying to build the pipeline for the fund. So the fund uh, is working well. Um, there's great collaboration amongst the different um, parties. And again, you know, we have had some uh, government involvement in the fund. So we were able to attract funding from the Technology Innovation Agency, as well as CIFA. Um, Professor Glenda Gray mentioned in her presentation, um, Hyrax Health Sciences. Um, so it's just uh, noteworthy that that is one of the investments of the University Technology Fund and the SASME Fund helped the DSI actually invest directly into that business as well. Okay, wonderful. Isn't that fantastic, guys? Okay, so Shelley, I'm going to put you on the spot now. She didn't want to talk about this, but I do want to put this in place, is that we had a venture capital 12J tax incentive, and um, it has recently been closed down. So I'd just like you to have a few comments about that. Sure, thanks so much, Claire. So what we've actually found is that tax incentives have been very good at attracting capital. So the, we, spoke, we spoke earlier about the fact that actually investing in an early stage business is a perceived risk reward balance. So investors will only invest in something that they feel like the risk that they're taking will be commensurately rewarded. That's just the nature of commercial investors. And in a lot of early stage um, businesses, 
you can't really get that to work. And therefore, in South Africa, we don't have a lot of risk capital where people are willing to invest in really early stage businesses because of the perceived risk. Now, what an incentive does is it helps to balance that risk. So the idea is that you, you're happy to take risk, but you don't want to take all the risk. So you want to have some form of risk reduction. And in order to do that, that's what the incentive does. So broadly what it is, you get a form of tax deduction when you invest into what they call the venture capital company. And there's a bit of a split in terms of saying, okay, I get a reduction from my taxable income and therefore the, the SARS is effectively partly compensating for that risk that I'm taking. Now, um, what we found is actually there were huge capital flows from um, individuals that then went into businesses. What we found on the other side, though, is that if those are not exceptionally well um, defined in terms of the types of businesses where you want that capital to flow, they will flow to the businesses that take the least amount of um, risk where you get the same offset in, in capital, or same incentive. So the balance between that risk reward is that if you give the private sector almost a, a whole lot of options, they're going to take the least risky option. <laughs> so the, the lessons learned was incentives definitely did work. It wasn't that it didn't work. It just what needed to be much narrowly, much more narrowly defined in terms of saying, okay, I need there to be no um, underlying asset underpin because actually that's not the risk I'm looking for people to take. It needs to be into businesses that are able to demonstrate innovation, for example, or have some form of balance. And if we had have potentially defined that a lot more narrow and been a lot clearer about where you can and can't invest, we maybe would have had a different outcome because businesses were saying, well, we created lots of jobs or we did this with the incentive. And, and it was, okay, with maybe abuse aside, because obviously um, that, that's one part, but for the most part, people were investing in businesses that created jobs or did add to the economy. But the problem was it wasn't to exactly where that market failure is. So we spoke about the fact that actually um, government is, is supposed to fund where there's a market failure. So if you think about like seed investment, which is really, really early stage where the private sector struggles to fund, well, potentially that's where government um, is able to come in and fix the gap and get it to the stage where commercial funders can take it from there. If you are able to create incentives where you can balance that risk with the private sector and very narrowly define where that investment needs to go, I think it is still catalytic and it can still work rather than saying, no, it's not a good idea. I don't want to do it at all. So the, the idea behind it was right intention. Maybe the execution could have been a lot um, better controlled and, um, and then take it from there. So I, I think Claire likes to say that, but for the first five years, the incentive was there and nobody actually invested because again, the way it was set up was not conducive for, for actually making actual venture capital investments. So the balance between making sure that investors understand what they're doing and they're willing to put the capital, but where do you want that money to go and be very clear as to how you define those, those types of entities and that will create a better alignment in terms of the outcomes you're looking to achieve and where you're actually putting the incentives. Okay, thank you. That was a curveball, guys. Okay, so I'm gonna give myself five minutes, even though I'm the chair of the panel. And what I'd like to speak about is some work that Naki did quite well. It, it took a while to get off the ground. We commissioned an econometric study and we used the data from SARS and National Treasury. Um, it was the first time that SARS and National Treasury allowed us to use, well, al allowed all the economists in South Africa to, to have a look at. And we commissioned a study. We used corporate income tax, we used employee income tax, and we used customs data. And what we were looking to um, find out was what are the benefits of importing technology? And the reason we did that is that over time, a number of our ministers, and I'm, Rezegan says I, I, I'm allowed to be um, combative. Over time, I've heard at least three ministers of the DSI say that our problem is, is that we have a negative technology balance of payments. And what that means is, 
is that we pay more for royalties and license fees for IP than we export. And we perceive that as being negative. So we did a whole research project on this. And what we found is that internationally, all the high growth countries all have negative technology balance of payments. In fact, their negative negativity is much higher than ours. In fact, we don't have sufficiently a negative technology balance of payments. So we've been saying this, but no one really believed us. And business, of course, understands this, but government feels that, that this is problematic. So we were able to look at 40,000 firms and um, we did a statistically significant econometric study. And what came out is that firms that import tech, and there are two ways of importing tech. One is, is that you import high tech capital equipment, and that's obviously where the um, DTIC comes in. Also, you import intermediate products, um, particularly if you, so they're high tech intermediate products, or, and those are really embodied um, uh, form of uh, technology imports, but disembodied is that you pay for royalties, you pay for license fees, or you actually have foreign ownership. So we looked at those 40,000 firms and what we found was amazing and very surprising. Some of it wasn't surprising to us. So one of it is you import high tech equipment and IP, those firms are much more productive much more productive than firms that don't. But it's, it's more interesting is that if those perm, firms that are importing um, um, IP, if they, if, if they are using royalties or licenses, they are 20% more productive. If they are foreign owned, they are 15% more productive. But if they are also doing their own R&D, then they are 6% more productive. So the point is, guys, is that actually firms are nearly three times more productive importing IP than doing their own research locally. We're not saying you shouldn't do your research locally, but if you import your IP, you will, um, you will be much more productive. The other thing that was very interesting is because the, you know, people believe a heuristic is, is that if you, if you import technology, you do it to actually reduce employment. And what we found is that across all firms, employment actually increased. The other thing that happened is that if you imported equipment, products, as well as IP, your exports went up. But not only did they go up um, in terms of volume, they went up in terms of value, and they went up in terms of over the over a six year period, the kinds you diversified your import your exports. And then what was really interesting is that out of those, those we looked at the forty thousand, those firms that imported technology paid seventy seven percent of the income tax income tax compared to even though they were only 9% of the firms. So they were much more profitable, they employed more people, they exported more, and they paid higher taxes. So what we also found is, because we could look at it, is that those out of those 40,000 firms, very few of them took up the R&D tax incentive. And so other work that's been done on the R&D tax incentive has shown that unfortunately our R&D tax incentive, the way we've structured it, is actually quite different to most other countries in the world in that we say you can only get a tax incentive for your R&D if you apply for it before you start your R&D. But it takes you three years to get the tax incentive, so now you've got to wait three years before you can actually start your R&D. And the reason it takes three years for them to even decide whether to give you the tax incentive is before you start your R&D, you have to have DSI tell 
revenue that actually your R&D is, is good R&D. They assess it. And they assess it as to whether your R&D is novel to the world and novel to the country. Now, internationally, R&D tax incentives are based on, is this R&D novel to you as a firm? Not to the world, not to your country. That R&D, so, so our R&D tax incentive actually has not been taken up. The other problem is, is that it is a tax incentive where you get a reduction of your profits. So all of, all of the, the firms, that we enterprises that these guys are investing in are pre-profit. So they can't ever access the R&D tax incentive. And internationally, what the other jurisdictions have done is that you apply as a small startup tech firm and they give you a grant to do R&D because you're not making profits. So our, our R&D tax incentive isn't working. Okay, so I am about to finish. You'll be glad to know. The point is, is that innovation and entrepreneurship needs high risk funding and support. And these amazing women sitting on this panel are individually and collectively making sure that the required funding and support is being made available. They are changing the trajectory of the South African economy. And I don't think you guys even knew how well they've been doing. They just quietly have been getting on with it. So what I'd like to say is please give a round of applause to my panel members who really are heroines in their own right. Okay, we do have a couple of questions, but they're not really questions. This is a really good one, is how can we access these VC funds in the Northern Cape? Please, can we talk to you guys? So, so what I can say is go to NACI. If you're looking for their email addresses, NACI will supply them. So any questions from the floor? Horace. On the issue of venture capital. As Naki produced a report, highlight talent that we face on that field and making suggestions for the development of uh, funds that, when uh, a situation fails, government funds that are going to be supported. Have we done something like that as Nike? Horace, you've just, I have to tell you, I did not ask him to ask that question. <laughs> so you just asked the perfect question. So Nike commissioned a report on how to set up the Sovereign Innovation Fund. And um, a massive report was, was delivered to DSI. It's one of the reasons why the DSI has actually instituted and implemented um, their Sovereign Innovation Fund. Treasury has allocated 500 million rand a year for the next three or four years. What our work has shown internationally is if you want this to work, then you must get the private sector to implement, both at the fund of fund level and definitely at the fund manager level. So for us, we've definitely done that report. Thank you for that question. Can I, can I maybe just build on that and just say, just look at the learnings of what we can see in the venture capital industry in South Africa over the past two years since the SASME fund has been managing that 1.4 billion that was granted to them from top 50 corporates in South Africa, supported a little bit by government. They've been doing an exceptional job of exactly what Chair has just expressed, managing that money and finding the right VCs in the market that know best how to allocate that capital. So. Just coming from working in this space, it would be wonderful if we can see a very similar process being applied to this generous 500 million that's been set aside on an annual basis. So, Okay, so thank you, everyone. 
And thank you to Ilsa and her team for letting us take your spot. Thank you. I'm taking instructions from Molangisi. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, may I request the two remaining panels? Um, the one led by Ilze Gaff and Himmler. If you could use um, the next, supposed to finish at two, but if we can just ask colleagues to give us extra 15 minutes, but just combine the, the, the two. So I'm leaving up to you, Himla and Ilze, to make sure that the panelists, um, uh, they share their insights, um, just target quarter past two, but maybe latest half past two. Um, so maybe um, the Ilze, please start. Colleagues, they, they are snacks outside, just to make sure that your sugar levels, um, you know, just grab and coffee, but let's proceed with the conversation. Eh? No, it's snacks, that's why I'm saying snacks outside, grab. Yeah, Michael, because we don't want you to accuse us. So, yeah. I mean, in Africa, you don't mind about time, but you know, yeah. Yeah, it's a combination. Ilza? Yes. Hi, it's it's David Kaplan here. I'm just checking to hear that to see that you can hear me. I'm I'm remote. I don't know if you can see me or hear me or whatever, but just checking. Um we can hear you um and see you. <laughs> you can see me. Okay. Okay. I can't see myself at this stage. I'm not quite sure why. But anyway, so we're on. We're on. Okay. You're going to turn the, power, the, the slides for me. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, this session is about um, the STI investment and incentive schemes. Um, and we have a number of um, panelists. Um, we have uh, Prof. David Kaplan that will do a presentation um, and then discussions um, that are um, joining us here. Um, Dr. Mweni um, Murphy and Prof. Um, Anastasius uh, Borders. Um, I don't know if you want to sit for the presentation. 
And then online, um, we have Vinesh Maharaj from PwC. Um, he's an industry expert. Um, and we are also joined by Nontombi Marule, um, who's um, a colleague of mine in the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Um, if we uh, talk about incentive schemes, um, I think that um, incentive schemes are part of um, policy tools that government uses to address uh, shortcomings and gaps in the market. So two questions comes to mind is what problem are we trying to address uh, with the incentive schemes? And then secondly, what is the return on investment um, for government? Um, not necessarily for the private sector, but what benefits are we deriving from the incentive schemes? So we've heard last night and several other times that um, um, in the 2022 SDI indicated report, um, R&D um, on uh, the business expenditure on R&D is declining um, at an alarming rate. And we are going to, to hear um, from Prof. David Kaplan um, more insights um, in, into this and findings. So I would like to hand over to Prof. Kaplan to do a presentation. Thank you, Prof. Um, maybe you're muted still, Prof? I, my apologies, my apologies. I'm no. sorry, I, I'm sorry that I'm not there with you and that I'm doing this remotely. Um, and I'm sorry to take the graveyard session on the Friday afternoon. But let me say, actually, it's quite a good thing that I come after the last session, which I think was very informative. And I think there was a lot said there that actually fits very well with some of the things that I will say. So I think I think actually, although we've changed the order, there's there's actually some some good reasons, some good logic in the change of order. So so thank you for inviting me. I'd, I'd particularly like uh, to, to thank Dr. Fehle for for inviting me to do a paper and to do this presentation. So we have two very eminent discussants. Uh, so I'm hoping that I won't take a long time. Chair, if I take too long, you will, you will please uh, uh, cut me down because I know time is of the essence. So let me move straight into the, uh, I think the, the presentation without ado. Uh, Tina is doing the slides for me, I think. The first, uh, no, I don't see the first slide. Tina. Um, we can see it, bro. Oh, you can. I, oh, I yes. can't. Oh, I can't. Oh, I get it. I get it now. That's fine. Okay. okay. So thank you. I think that's just the title slide. Tina, if you can go on. So what I'm doing in this, in this, uh, uh, in in the report and the paper you have in front of you, or the paper that has been distributed, there's there's three parts to what I'm going to do. The first thing is to look at the inputs which are really the expenditure of the personnel, the share, and others of the business sector investment in R&D. Then I'm going to look at the outputs, or maybe more correctly said to be the outcomes, the technology outcomes, the economic outcomes. And then finally, some observations, some suggestions for further research, some policy implications. And it's the last one that I think is really important, and I hope that we can have some time for discussion, discussion led by the eminent uh, discussions that we have. So if we go to the, to the next slide, uh, you'll see that that what is, and, and this has been referred to in the opening remarks for this colloquium, what we're seeing is a very substantive decline in business expenditure on R&D. You can see the numbers in front of you, but very, very low. So we're looking, we're looking at a decline of, in the last year, of 29%. Uh, it's true that uh, business investment also uh, uh, declined by, by, by 16%. So the decline in R&D is much larger than the business investment decline. It's very substantive. It was already occurring 2018, 2019. We don't know what COVID will give us, but likely we're going to see further declines. Uh, 
Now, you may say, well, this is sort of pretty inevitable. It's a hard time and whatever. But even during in COVID, during COVID, most of the OECD countries continue to expand their business sector investment in R&D. It, it has been expanding at the rate of around 5%, which is much more rapid. As you can see, ours have been declining. 5% increase in the OECD. And even in the, uh, even in the COVID years, there's, a, there's an increase of nearly 2%. In South Africa, we're likely to see decline. Next slide. So the, 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 this decline continues if we look at the, at the personnel. You see the, the numbers, I think, are plain, but there's a 20% reduction in numbers in the last, in, in between 2018, 19, 2019, 2020, latest data we have. But that follows also, as with the expenditure, a reduction in the year, in the previous year. So we're looking at very, very substantive reductions in expenditure and in personnel. Next slide, please. And what this means is if we look at the business expenditure on research and development as a share of good. Now, I want to say something about this because we often look at how much are we spending? We look at the good. And uh, we had this on a PowerPoint at the beginning of the, of the conference. But just as important as the amount that are in good is the composition of that. And we pay very little attention to the composition. Now, as countries develop, as they grow, what we see is that the bird, the, 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 the percentage that's done by the business sector expands. The public falls away, not it remains important, but falls away. So typically, a developed country has got 60% of its expenditures bird and sometimes more than that. In the United States, it would be more than two thirds. Now, if you look at South Africa, instead of seeing that trajectory of a changing composition whereby business is doing a greater percentage, you can see the fall very dramatically, very clear over a 10 year period with again, a very significant decline in the last year that we have measurement for. So essentially the business sector in 2010 accounted for approximately half of all research and development by 2019-20, by it's less than a third. Next slide, please. So if we, if, we, if we now look at other indicators, and I haven't, I haven't put them in here, but, but there are many other indicators which show the same downward direction. So the business sector funding of R&D, business funds R&D in other sectors is declining. Business is spending, putting less money into R&D in other sectors. The ability of the business sector to attract foreign funding is declining. So we can look at what share of business sector R&D is foreign funded, that's declining. And the share of, of, of R&D the business sector does, which is funded by foreign, is also declining. So all of these are other indicators of, uh, of significant decline, if you like, or things to worry us. So it's, it's, I think all the indicators are pointing in the same direction. If we go and look at the, at the actual uh, um, sectoral data, output data, et cetera, We'll see on the sectoral composition that manufacturing, which is the major area that, that does R&D, its share in, the glow, in our national economy is declining, deindustrialization, if you like, but declining in the manufacturing sector, which will have implications for R&D. And then the, if we look at the technology composition, this is what Fiona Trugenet referred to earlier. So if we divide our industry into high tech, medium and low tech, we find that the actual technology composition, uh, medium and high tech tends to be declining and there's an increasing share of low technology. This is not what we want to see. It's another indication. And so when we look to see, do we have high tech sectors? Do we have medium tech sectors which are growing and uh, their, their share? The answer is no. So there's no indication of any subsectors where there's significant and sustained growth. Now, in, 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 the, in the next, we would see, for example, sustained growth in, let's say, electronics or whatever, but we simply don't see that in South Africa. So the picture is pretty, is pretty negative. Um, it's particularly negative in this last year, but I'm, I'm raising a word of caution about the, our latest data, that 2019-2020 data. That data is collected by the HSRC, it may be, it may be that that decline is, has been overstated. The HSRC are convinced that it hasn't been. I'm not at all sure. Uh, 
And it's also clear that the decline that we're seeing has been evident well before 2019, 2020, as I've said. So if you look at the data, you'll see that by around 2015, 16, we see these declines. And the question is, you know, how much decline will we see? Essentially what happened was that the latest data we have actually predates COVID. So it goes to February uh, 2020, but COVID of course starts thereafter. But the data that is collected during the COVID period. So many people were away from work, many firms were closed, many things were happening. And, and, and so there was an undercount that HSRC tried to compensate for that undercount. They feel they have, but I'm not exactly sure. Time, time will tell. Um, and the last thing is, you know, the COVID and business sector R&D, is, is the decline inevitable? It's not inevitable. As I've said, in many countries, OECD countries, but other developing countries, even through COVID, we've seen business sector R&D continue to expand. So if we see this continuation in, 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 in South Africa, then, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's not an inevitable thing. It will be something that we need to really put at the front of our policy. How are we going to address this? So I, I, next slide, please. So the new technology-based startups, and this is where um, I, I feed in very closely what was said earlier, um, and just very, very, very much as what was said, we often use venture capital, investments in venture capital, as an indicator of how well startups are doing, because venture capital provides capital for startups. But as one of the speakers said, very importantly, uh, it may not be a good indicator because much of the investment in uh, through 12J that went into venture capital went into things like, I don't know, uh, um, hotels and, and, and student accommodation, things that weren't technology based. So, so the issue now we have is that you saw the panel, you saw that there is very considerable activity. We, I, think, I think that was very convincing. South Africa is a creative place. You'll see that all the people on the stage were young. Uh, you'll know that startups are done by young people. South Africa is open to the world. We have good universities. We have problems with, with, with capital, as was said, but it's not insuperable. There are organizations out there, as we've seen, that give capital. There are, uh, there are good people coming out of the universities, well-trained, et cetera. <clears throat> so there is... There clearly is the basis for uh, these new technology-based startups, and they are growing, but we don't have any clear data. So the, the people on the panel said a couple of things, but we don't have clear national data. We don't actually know how much is out there. We don't know what they do. We don't know how they differentiate it. And it's a clear research area that needs to be looked at. But it is encouraging. It is encouraging. And it's something that we need to grow to scale. And I think the last session suggested some ways in which that can be done. I would add only one thing to what was said earlier. And that is very often, most often, startups conglomerate in a region, in an area. So we get regional concentration, ecosystems. And in South Africa, that is principally in the Western Cape and in Gauteng, maybe in some other areas. But the fact that we get this regional concentration means that if we start to look at what, what should we do to encourage this area, the policy should not all be directed from Pretoria. I think that local governments, and this has come up before, I think some people have mentioned uh, uh, earlier the importance of local government. I think we need to think about uh, 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 whether our policies for s and are too concentrated, nationally concentrated uh, in Pretoria, and whether we don't devolve some of that uh, uh, policy activity to encourage the region, development of the regional ecosystem to the region. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to move on to the outputs, and I think much of this data is known to you, so I'm going to be moving very quickly. Uh, you can see the patent data for South Africa. We were getting some increases. Seems that we've dropped uh, lately. But you can see on the right-hand column, what I think is most important, is South Africa's percentage share is tending to decline. Next slide, please. So if you look at us compared to, our, to the BRICS, you will see that our, the BRICS 
each of the BRICS countries are increasing their shares over time. South Africa, its share is declining. Next slide, please. If we look at the intellectual property and Claire made uh, mention of this. Now I want to raise, uh, and, and it's very much in line with what Claire said. Uh, both, both columns here are important. Look at the payment side. The fact that our payments for uh, uh, intellectual property are declining, that helps our technology balance of payments, right? Because those are our payments are declining. And we think, oh, well, that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. Technology importation is absolutely critical to R&D. It's absolutely critical as Claire has outlined and as Claire summarized this uh, study that NACI did using the econometric data, using the SARS data, uh, combined with the with the with the national trade with the international trade data, you'll see that really what what is really important is that we have access to foreign capital to foreign inputs, and that this is not a this is this is this is what this is this is right for development. It's not just right for development; it's right for R and D companies that tend to import more to to pay more for for technology abroad also undertake more technology. So try to see that, that, that the, the payments for technology and R&D and payments for technology and further development are complementary and not rivalrous. They go together. As Claire said, countries that grow both import more technology, they also export more technology, but they do more, import more technology. So there's decline on our payments, which is of concern, and there's decline on our receipts, which is of concern because the receipts will tell us, okay, how much technology do we produce that's globally bought and valued? Next slide, please. So here's the charges for intellectual property. Uh, um, and you see how South Africa's share of the middle income countries has actually been, has actually been declining. Next slide, please. I'm going to uh, go quickly through the economic impacts the output, employment and exports, and spend quite a lot of time on the output side. Next slide, please. So Fiona Tregenham uh, 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 quite rightly stressed the importance of medium and high technology uh, industry. This is where much of the R&D is located, but these are also sectors that when they grow have spread effects to other to other sectors so when these these medium and high tech industries grow in your country it's not just that they grow it's that they that they have impact because they produce technologies that are used by other other sectors everything grows so there are strong linkage effects and also the medium and high technology sectors is where we expect to see growth and these are the are the sectors where um, which continue to grow as a country as a country develops. The lower tech areas tend to decline. Your clothing, uh, footwear, uh, furniture, whatever. But these these medium and high technology sectors continue to grow. But as we see in South Africa, growth has been very small. And if you look at MHT as a percentage share, you can see that it's declined. If anything, if we exclude motor vehicles at the bottom there, you can see the decline is also evident. Carry on, please. Next slide. Um, if you look at the employment side, well, there's been a little bit of growth here in employment and in, in employment share of, of medium and high tech, but it's 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 very small. There's no indication that there's a significant growth either in output or employment share of the medium and high tech sectors. Next slide, please. I'm going through these pretty quickly, but I know we, we're running out of time. So. The, the question of exports. Now, I want to stress this because I think that we underestimate the importance of exports as a key indicator of innovation. So if you think about product innovation, if you think about com companies producing new products, entering new markets, and becoming new exporters, that is really what we want to see. That is product innovation, new exporters, new products, new markets. And when countries grow, that's where most of the activity will be. So if you were to look at a Korea or Taiwan, et cetera, you'd see new exporters coming in, additional exporters, very high rate of growth, new products coming to operation, and you'd see them entering new markets. 
Process innovation is also important. It's most important for increasing the export volumes of existing products. If you uh, do innovation on your process, make it more efficient, you should be more competitive, you should be able to export more. So the, 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 the whole issue of exports, I think, is, is, is extremely important. Next slide, please. And so if we look at medium and high tech exports as a share of manufactured exports, you can see there's been some increase, but actually marginal. Next slide, please. If you look at South Africa and Brazil and high technology, you'll see our share in the left-hand column, you'll see our value has been declining over time. You'll see the Brazil numbers. You'll see that our share of manufactured exports is much lower than Brazil. It has been declining over time. Again, a negative, a negative feature. Next slide, please. If we benchmark South African high technology exports against many of our competitors, middle, other, other middle income countries, uh, you'll see South Africa is lower than, than most of those other countries. Uh, and that's, that's just what that table will show you. Next one, please. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on this uh, and the, this and the next PowerPoint. Because I said earlier that really what we're looking for as a country grows is for the number of exporters to rise, for the number of export products to rise, to enter new, ex to new, enter new market destinations, and then for the number of export transactions to rise. So, so really what, we, what we're looking for as a country grows, innovation, the, the major aspect of innovation for a country that is small, that as South Africa is, has a small domestic market, any real successful innovation, any, any innovation that carries a company into something substantive will find its way ultimately into exports. So exports are really key. We're stuck, if you like, as the National Development Plan has told us, in a middle income development trap. We need to produce higher value products. We need to have more exporters. We need the value of our exports to go up. We need more products. And if you look at this data, you'll see that, the, that uh, our, again, our picture is negative. We have some growth up to around 2016 or thereabouts. Just look at the number of exporters, look at the number of products. Those are most important. And you'll see that after 2016, numbers of products and numbers of exporters are actually starting to decline. Never mind any increase, we're starting to see some decline. Uh, next slide, please. So that was for total exports, for manufacturing exports. <clears throat> we, we particularly look at manufacturing, of course, because manufacturing is the most export-oriented sector that we have, and also the most R&D incentive. And you see the same position. Exporters, numbers of exports declining, number of products are declining. So it tells us the same story. So move next slide, please. So this data that we're presenting now is very new. Uh, uh, Claire referred to it, it's an econometric study that NACI commissioned. And what this does is it looks at the SARS database for firms. It matches up the income tax data with the trade and employment data. And so we can see what is happening at an individual firm level. This is the first time that this is available to us. It's in, the, in, our, in our indicators booklet, the South African uh, Science, Technology and Innovations Indicators booklet. It's very, very important uh, because it tells us where our problems are. So if you like to think about uh, exports, you can think about exports in two ways. Uh, the first one is uh, an intense, what we call intensive. So intensive means is it, is it the guys who are always exporting, just exporting more or exporting less? That's what we call the intensive margin. So intensive is actually what you, is the same firms either doing more or doing less. The other side is the extensive margin. That is new firms coming in, new exporters coming in. By definition, their products are new, or it may be existing guys, existing producers producing more products. And if we look at the extensive versus the intensive margin, then we see that really the intensive margin has accounted for most of our change in exports. So most of our change in exports is just because our established firms export more or they export less. 
What's not happening is very much on the extensive margin, i.e. we're not getting new exporters coming in, we're not getting new products coming in. That's playing a very small role in our export activity. Next, next PowerPoint, please. So uh, I, I, let me just say one more point about that. Uh, it, it is possible that our existing exporters uh, may be doing a lot of process innovation. Right? They're producing the same products, but they produce doing a lot of process innovation. Now, if they do that, we'd expect to see them be more efficient and then export more volumes. But actually, when we look at what's happening, wherever we see increase in exports, it's largely because prices have changed. They're not exporting more. They, if they're gaining in re export revenue, it's because the prices of their exports are rising, not that they're becoming more efficient through process innovation. So. This is the picture. Overall summary, it's a consistent picture of decline in both inputs and outputs with the strong proviso of the, the new technology-based companies, the small companies, et cetera, which is very vibrant. And we come back to that. We see overall in the, in the, in the, in the picture a slow growth to approximately 2015-16 and a decline thereafter. And latest data suggests the rate of decline is accelerating. Now, that I think is the overall picture. I, I just want to say a little bit more about the, about the startups because of the last session. So, so we're seeing lots of dynamism there. And we obviously, one of our policy issues is how we grow that. Sorry, maybe next, next slide, sorry. Um, Prof, yeah. um, we are running out of time. Okay. Um, so okay. Can you please wrap up? I'm going to have two minutes if I can. So we, we don't have enough knowledge about established uh, about both established firms and startups. Uh, the startups are important, but they're still very small off a very low base. So there's a strong performance, but it's off a very low base. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Just I think I've said much of what's on that slide. So the twin challenge is how do we help established firms enhance innovation? And secondly, how do we do startup? How do we scale up the startups? Now, next slide, please. Be careful because there are other channels for enhancing innovation. For example, access to foreign technology, as Claire has said earlier, may be more important, often is more important. In fact, our data suggests is more important than R&D itself. Secondly, so, so don't ignore the other areas. Don't concentrate only on R&D. FDI could also be important. We need to enhance the returns to innovation, the efficiency of our national system of innovation, there, also, there is indication that, the, that it's inefficient. If we improve the efficiency, that will improve the returns to innovation. And we need complementary changes in trade policy, in localization. We need to ensure that our firms get access to export markets. And we need to be very careful of, of policies. And I'm going to suggest there's not enough time, but I'm going to suggest that the policy of localization actually detracts from exports and detracts from uh, from R and D and innovation, but maybe we can take that up in the next in the next in the discussion. And then we need to lower the costs of innovation and the critical aspect of skill shortage, which I think impacts both on innovation at the general firm level, because firms often say they're constrained in innovation because they can't get the skills, but also in the new technology based space, we don't have if we if we could expand the number of people coming out of students coming out of our university with good skills, that would also make a major impact on the startup area. So to my last slide, I think innovation led exports is a key objective of government growth policy. I think this decline that we see, the decline that I've raised, needs to feature much more heavily in government thinking. It needs, this decline needs to inform what we do in our industrial policy, particularly our industry, industry master plans, which I think, and I could say more about this, are in some ways, I think, detract from our R&D and detract from innovation, but we can say more about that. But certainly DSI and DTI need to coordinate policy much further to ensure that we do get an increase in innovation, in research, and an accompanying increase in, 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 in exports, which I think the two go together. I'm sorry that's very rushed. I would have liked to have taken more time, but I do understand the time is limited. So I'll, I'll stop it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, while the gentlemen are joining me here, yeah?
Um, we have an industry expert online, um, and I would like to ask one question is, um, why do we need R&D investments? So um, if we can hear from Vinesh um, in two minutes, please. Um, and thank you for your patience in waiting um, to, to talk. Um, can we just hear from you? Thank you so much, Elsa. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah, two minutes. I see time is really short. Thank you so much, Professor. That was a really uh, enlightening uh, uh, presentation. From an industry point of view, you touched on some of the points, right? We really need export-driven growth in the country. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to be globally competitive. We cannot continue having uh, these uh, warehouses being built on our highways and byways with imported product, which obviously understanding that one job in manufacturing creates four other jobs jobs in the rest of the economy, it can be a big lever to pull to improve the uh, employment statistics in South Africa. So from our point of view, R&D is critical to make us globally competitive. And yes, I agree, you need to import technology that you can then use to help us become competitive. But also we need to do a lot of local research to also then create and simulate our own manufacturing capabilities. And one case in point is what's happening right now with the vehicle transitions from uh, internal combustion engines to new energy vehicles and the whole electric vehicle uh, value chain. South Africa doesn't have much knowledge in this area. It's all being developed in other parts of the world. But if we need to ensure that our uh, automotive sector, which as you saw, you, you, you purposely excluded from your figures there, Prof, because it's such a significant portion of our export and uh, manufacturing, will be in dire jeopardy. And I know the minister spoke about an entire NEV pivot, but what is the supporting activities below that? And we cannot always import all this technology from other parts of the world. What would our tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers in South Africa be contributing if they're only adopting previously developed technologies? We need some South African technology to be part of the NEV uh, chain. Uh, that's just my two minutes for now as one example of why we need it. Elza, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Um, let us give then uh, Dr. Morphy um, uh, time to uh, respond, please, um, and uh, taking into account uh, the time constraints. Um, and um, could you please uh, just shortly introduce yourself? Good uh, afternoon, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. My name is Mboneni Moafe. I'm from the Department of Science and Innovation. And I'm going to, I think there the, are a number of issues that have already been uh, addressed by the presentation by Professor Kaplan. So I'm just going to go straight to the issues of, of incentives. And, and I'm probably going to start by the incentives that we have had a lot uh, during the previous session except that this probably is probably gonna be different views from what were expressed. Um, we probably just, uh, firstly, the, the, the incentives is currently under review. It's not closed, it's not ended. Mm -hmm. So please, uh, those who want to apply, do go and apply. Um, there have been a number of challenges in the incentives implementation. Uh, a whole lot of them we've been able to deal with. Uh, and that includes the issue of the turnaround times, which we have improved so drastically. Of course, there is an acknowledgement that there needs to be a, a matter of looking into how do we make sure that we don't have a one size fits all in terms of dealing with are you looking at what the um, uh, smaller enterprises can afford and can do uh, and so on and so forth. But it's, it's, it's worth to reflect that the um, feedback that we're getting from the policy review is that the um, the incentives has the incentive has been beneficial uh, without uh, trying to uh, dismiss the issues that have been challenging. So we have been uh, even as a department as we engage with our counterparts in treasury and so on and so forth, been uh, very much um, pushing for the continuation of of this uh, incentive. So uh, regarding this, the uh, consultations with the public were done in April, 2022. Uh, we're hoping that the draft amendments will be 
published very soon uh, regarding this particular incentive. And then we'll see what, uh, what happens going forward. Uh, and I think it's important to also reflect that when we look at what the incentive has done over the past couple of years, it has been able to, uh, for example, uh, Treasury has forgone about 6 billion rand worth of um, revenue, which when you translate to what it means in terms of the amount of R&D investment by the private sector, it means that uh, there was an investment of about 42 billion rand by the private sector. So I think uh, in all fairness, uh, while we're not saying it has done extremely well, we probably will be able to say there has been benefits of this incentive, which is why even the um, beneficiaries are pushing us to say, let this incentive continue and we hope that it will continue. So the, there are a number of other incentives that we're running as a department. The other one being the sector innovation fund. This one is looking at specific industries. We've got a lot of that happening, for example, in the area of uh, agriculture and forestry, where we're looking at partnering the private sector and jointly investing in some of the uh, innovations and technology developments. And again, this has been one uh, initiative that we found to be very popular. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, because of the ongoing challenges around funding from our side uh, and government, um, you know, some of these funds, uh, you end up uh, having a situation where uh, you can't continue with them, but we're hoping that we'll be able to mobilize funding to continue um, with the uh, sector innovation fund, because the various industry sectors that we've been partnering with have indicated that it was very useful. Uh, the various in, uh, regional innovation support programs. And I think it does speak to some of the slides that were indicated in terms of what is the policy uh, concentration for innovation, whether we're looking at the Western Cape only and Houteng. And we've really been having this uh, very, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, active programs at regional level where we are now working with various provinces uh, making sure that they establish uh, some form of innovation of sort. And this is really relating to whatever is the uh, comparative or competitive advantage that they might have. You know, I was in a meeting last week with the uh, annual telecoms conference. And one of the things they, that was debated was the advantages for various provinces that they see and how technology can be used to enhance that. And that's the one thing that we want to get into in terms of the partnerships. For example, they say, if we're getting the bulk of our fruits and veggies from Limpopo, why don't we have technology enables systems around post-harvest treatment, even from cultivation and, uh, uh, you know, matters of, of, of um, uh, transportation of whatever and processing at that point of time. Now, the last, uh, uh, instrument that I'm going to talk to is the uh, Innovation Fund. And I think on the Innovation Fund, again, I, I need to just correct something. Uh, the Innovation Fund was not a product of, of, of NACI. Uh, the Department of Science and Innovation started working on the Innovation Fund um, concept paper in 2014, 2015. And we engaged for so long. Uh, it, sometimes takes long when you engage in government. And we're lucky in 2017, 18, we were then uh, allocated that 1.5 billion rands. And in terms of the implementation, I think uh, um, Dr. Kele around 2019, 2020, we then asked the NAGI to just provide some guidance on how we can go about implementing this fund. We have done very well in the implementation of the fund. I can indicate that having done two phases of it, where we have invested had to date 500 million rands, we have been able to uh, attract from other funders, other private funders and also government funders uh, from that 500 million, uh, about uh, 2.3 billion rands. So that just shows that when you are able to provide these incentives, you are also able to attract or leverage additional funding, and this funding will become to the likes of the PIC, to the other private sector, to the likes of the IDC, and so on and so forth. But what it has really helped brought is that other government funds have now then been directed to support 
the work around innovation, which we find very exciting. And uh, at the Innovation Summit uh, towards the end of this month, we'll be able to share with the um, uh, with people how uh, what 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 successes we are starting to see. Even though it is within that short period of time, we do know that the impact doesn't happen this shortly. But uh, some of these signs are there. So um, can you, can you the please? incentives are really quite important in our views. Uh, they are not everything. There is a whole lot that needs to be dealt with in order to make them effective. So I'm just going to stop it at that. And thanks very much for, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Professor Puris, and I'm going to make some comments about what we've heard from <clears throat> the previous speakers. Um, Professor Kaplan showed us a really depressing situation. And uh, we know that situation for the last 10 years, longer. The issue that we are not addressing, and it is critical for Nike, is why? Why these things are happening? And there is a simple solution. I'm going to give you an example of something that happened a few years ago. There was a program that some of you may remember that was called TRIP. It was unique in the country that it was getting money from the government and was asking industry to identify problems. And they were asking the universities to solve the problems of industry. The program was working really excellently, 300 million rands from the government were raising twice as much money, 600 million rands per year from the business sector. And the organization who was handling the program, the NRF at the time, it was saying that they could even double the amount of money if the government wanted it. And while the program is doing well and everybody's happy, one day the NRF receives a letter from the funders of the program, but it was the DTI at the time, and say to them that, thank you very much, but we're going to take the program back now because we would like to run it on our own. Oh, really? What do you think that it was your tablet that you take in the afternoon and you decided to put it on the other side of your bed. Um, the NRF sent a letter saying, thank you. If you are not going to send us the money, we are going to inform the people that they, the stakeholders and we are going to proceed. Uh, the program closed. There were certain voices on the Department of Science and Innovation, and after a few months, the minister threatened the DTI that she was going to go to the Treasury and ask the money so she can start the program again. Within less than a week, the DTI announced that they were going to start the program again on their own rules. Um, the program is still trying to survive and it's limping. But for me, it is a characteristic, not only of the three, because I can give you a whole list of programs that they close just like that. Somebody wakes up in the morning and says, close it down. I'm sorry, but without stability, we will never have economic growth. I'm not going to start my business and knowing that tomorrow one government official is going to wake up from the wrong side of the bed 
and is going to close the program that was helping me. Um, we are here to assist Naki. And it is very interesting that Naki is supposed to monitor the scene. And it produces a very interesting publication, the National Science and Technology Indicators every year. What is absent from that indicator is a list of incentives. What the government is doing for the business sector? We don't know. Different government departments, they have their own programmatic activities. And there is nobody who's trying to provide coordination among the different programs. And remember that in South Africa, we have a pluralistic system, which means that each government department, it's an empire on its own, and it operates, and they don't want anybody to touch their own ground. Um, they have a similar problem in the European Union, and the European Commission decided that because they could not do anything else, they were going to coordinate through information provision. So every year they provide for all countries how they perform, what are the incentives that they offer. Um, do we offer incentives in South Africa? It's a very interesting question. The European Commission undertook a study of their own countries, and they found that each sector was offering more than 20 incentives. Each sector, 20 incentives for each different country. At that time, I tried to find out what was happening. I could not find eight incentives for a couple of our sector. Because this is another trend that we like. We would like one program to fit everybody. So the administrators, they're going to have a quiet night. They don't like to start the program for one sector today and something else next week. We start one program for everybody, even it does not fit for everybody. Um, I would like to stop here and to suggest that Nagy should consider seriously to start monitoring the situation putting around all incentives and through the new system of coordination, we should make sure that when a government department or agency is trying to close a program, they will have to provide an evaluation of the program and good justification why they would like to close it or change it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, last two minutes, um, um, I would like to ask a government official, um, um, Nantombi, um, um, she's a colleague of mine, um, why do you think that um, incentive schemes are so important? Do we need um, incentive schemes? So um, can you please um, respond to that? Um, thank you, Ilse, and good afternoon, uh, colleagues, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this of this important session. Um, so to answer your question very briefly, Ilse, is to uh, say, yes, we do need incentives because as government, we need to be taking care of what the market is not taking care of. So if we had um, put up a policy that says small um, enterprises are going to be an engine of economic development in the country, we then need to support that with um, making sure that we make the environment conducive for those small um, businesses to thrive. 
over and above that is about the technology um, development that we know is directly proportional to economic development as well. Um, a lot of scholars and a lot of research has shown us that if you, 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 you increase your te technological capability, then you are able to increase your, your, your relative uh, competitiveness. Uh, but whilst I have um, the, the opportunity of being at the stage, um, I was, I was uh, um, a little bit um, disturbed by what uh, Prof. Torres had just said now. Um, if you will indulge me just a minute, just to say um, the, 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 the notion that um, the GTIC woke up one day and, 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 and removed strip from NRF is not really valid because there was an impact assessment study that was done, um, which clearly showed us output that over the years, THRIP ended up becoming a passary scheme. THRIP um, had no visible or tangible technological outputs that really drove um, competitiveness in the companies that were partner companies, but also the identity of the, of, of the, of the, of the scheme was um, was was not um, um, a, a very visible in terms of what it it, it, it intended uh, 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 objectives, and also there was this uh, political dance that needed to happen because at the time parliamentarians were were really dealing with why is the DTICs um, playing in the space of bursaries because that's all that that's all that uh, Thrip could show so so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, so that that is that is uh, how it then um, uh, uh, then moved. But um, just in a nutshell, it was just not abstract. It was really, really done under um, careful um, what um, a, a impact assessment that was done in partnership with TPNE. But uh, I, I hope I've answered you, um, Ilse. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that's that's a good conclusion um, to to carry the debate um, um, forward. Um, but I um, would like to agree with Prof on the system system of coordination. Um, I've been in government for a very long time, and one of the biggest challenges is alignment between the departments and the different policies. Um, and we definitely take note of, of that coordination and alignment that we need to work on. Um, and I think with um, in the interest of time, um, we are not going to take questions, but um, I would like to commit to the participants, um, if, if there's any burning questions, um, we would like to answer you um, and the secretariat can collect the questions and we will then respond to that. But thank you very much to the participants. Um, thank you. Right, everybody who's uh, been good enough to remain with us. I'm Himla Sudial. I'm uh, the executive officer at the Academy of Science of South Africa. And I'm also on the NACI Council. And you've probably been treated to uh, all the gender mainstreaming. You've noticed that all the moderators have been females on the NACI Council. So yeah, yeah, well done. I'd like to invite my uh, panelists to come through. Dr. Vijay Reddy, who is an education skills development expert affiliated with the HSRC. Professor Michael Khan, you've heard him throughout uh, the day. And he wears multiple caps, but he is a policy analyst par excellence. And um, Professor Lynn Morris, who used to be at the NICD, uh, uh, infectious disease specialist and uh, also wearing multiple caps, but now she lives on the 10th floor at Wits University as the DVC for research. And last but not least, uh, Professor Fulufelo Nelwan Mondo, 
who is the CEO of the National Research Foundation. And I'm also pleased to say that he was one of the founding members of the South African Young Academy of Science Science and is now an alumnus. So colleagues, uh, my panel uh, panelists are charged with the responsibility of sharing with us their thoughts and insights uh, with respect to education, training, and innovation. And because I know that these are all academics who can think standing on their feet, uh, I'm sure even though they've prepared presentations, they would have been able to assimilate the discussions that have been ongoing from the plenaries of yesterday into today and try to bring into perspective this pipeline of education from where we start to the point of innovation and entrepreneurships that we've heard of uh, recently. And just because you are such a good audience, I'm going to promise you that my colleagues are going to deliver to you the best tequila based margarita you've had in your life. Because between them, they're going to deliver with a bit of tequila, some contrio, some lime juice and ice, all shaken up nicely in a salt rimmed glass and with a garnish of a slice of lemon. Now imagine that, imagine that, because these guys are going to bring into perspective where education, uh, capacity, skills, enhancement and development, entrepreneurships are going to lead us into the next generation that we all dream about. So we've had lots and lots of talk lots of great policies, et cetera. We've had discussions about the lack of implementation thereof. So let's hear how our colleagues are going to shape this discussion for us. So I'm going to start with Dr. Vijay Reddy and ask her to share with us, given her background in the uh, education and skills development, how she, taking a blank canvas, will address some of the issues we've been talking about over the past two days. Over to you. And I'm sure whatever you've prepared, you will tweak it to what I've asked you. <laughs> That's quite a tall ask, uh, Himla, and I'm hungry at the moment. So if, if I can't function fully, please understand. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you to you for staying. Uh, you know, when one does a presentation, you spend a lot of time thinking about it and preparing. So at least there's an audience that's there. Uh, uh, sorry, I was just checking if the presentation is there. I'm going to start with my presentation first, and I'll come to, to your question, Himla. So I've entitled my presentation, School Mathematics as an Equalizer. It's very difficult to see this angle. Um, so the one thing I just need to know is... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, school mathematics as an equalizer. I want to say it's it's been very interesting to to listen to the ideas about a very glamorous science, technology, and innovation system. But I heard, I mean, this is the pr provocation you gave. Uh, I heard very little. I mean, a successful science, technology, innovation system is dependent on people. That's the centrality of it. And it's people with knowledge, skills, capabilities, et cetera. And, and that, uh, in terms of our own system, that is what I would like to, to focus on in, in my presentation. And I've called it school mathematics as an equalizer to, sig to signal very clearly that I want to talk about schooling and about the education for 12 million children, because that's the mass, the, the education, that's the big group, and that's the most important component for this, uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, for, for the, for the STI. I'm focusing on mathematics uh, because I think mathematics and performance in mathematics gives us an indication of the health of our education system. I want to equate mathematics to, with, with analytical skills. 
And as our uh, knowledge-based economy, 4IR, et cetera, it is those kinds of skills, numerical, computational, analytical, that are very important. I also, I see through the uh, NACI had, when they sent out the invitation, they talked about education futures, I think, or education as future or future of education, but words like transformation was uh, embedded in that letter to, to me, and I'm sure to the other panelists. One of the dimensions I want to propose for transformation is the state of mathematical skills, is the knowledge, the mathematical knowledge, competence, capabilities, et cetera, of the South African population, because it is a, a signal. And I, I've got three slides <laughs> that should uh, reassure you. But in terms of uh, pre pre preparing for those slides, uh, one, I, my own uh, background is maths and science, and I, I, I undertake I conduct the trends in international maths and science studies. So I want to draw on that data. So uh, forgive the brevity, but it does come from evidence. Secondly, I read through the this morning uh, the foresight report on education and, and what it said there. And uh, one of the things that you talk about is uh, the, one of the recommendations is monitoring the implementation of, of programs. And I want to try and link those two and respond more, not in general about what where education is, but how it what role NACI can play in this space. Okay, so where are we again? Now, in, in terms of the three points that I want to make, the first point, and this is well known, that the South African maths achievements are low and socially graded. That's, there's nothing new in that. But I want to illustrate it, and I'm wondering where, no, that's not the one. Uh, I want to illustrate it with the two graphs there, which uh, shows the performance of our students in what are called fee-paying schools and no fee-paying schools. Fee-paying, the broad cat characterization, the, come from, uh, the learners come from more affluent backgrounds and they go into schools that are better constructed and smaller class sizes, resources, teachers with knowledge, et cetera. The no fee schools are those that, uh, again, coming from home and community backgrounds, lower income, going into schools, 100 learners per school, very little teaching and learning happens. The no-fee schools, the, the total, 70% of our learners are in no-fee schools. And when we looked at the, in terms of terms, and we measured the mathematics achievements at the grade nine level for those two groups, uh, the difference between, the average achievement difference between those two groups is 70, I can't read five points or 71 points. So that is a measure of mathematical inequality in the country. And in terms of my recommendation and things that we should do and NACI should do as well, is to concentrate on the no fee schools. That, that's the focus of, of, of me measurements. That's because there's interventions will be at other places, but that's the the 70% and raising their mathematical level. By the way, the, the yellow bars to the left is an indication of those that have not met the minimum competencies. In other words, they, they didn't demonstrate the minimal mathematical competence for that grade, which means three quarters of learners in no fee schools versus one third of learners in fee paying schools have very little mathematical knowledge for that. And, and unless, as a society and every bit of it, we raise the levels of the no fee school, we are in, uh, it's, 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 it's a major risk to the country. And as I said, that in terms of all our mathematical achievement, or all measurements of achievement, it tells the familiar South African story of uh, advantage begetting advantage and compounding disadvantages on the other end of the spectrum. And anything that we, we can go the four I route, we can go any route and whatever we introduce robotics or, or so, the people that benefit the most are the affluent. It's always the advantaged that uh, benefit from, from it. 
And so again, these uh, achievement gaps, I don't have to tell you, are, are, are linked to school SE socioeconomic status. Now, trying to link it to, to NACI's goals and monitoring and evaluation, and my recommendation is one of the things is that we need to monitor the number of well-functioning schools. If they're 30%, and it's been at that flat level for a very long time, we need to set up a measure to say, are these schools functioning? And uh, it reminded me, I think in about 1990s, Michael, the FRD indicator report you know, try to measure the number of learners coming from how many schools that went to universities, et cetera. I think it would be good for the STI indicators to, to bring in that kind of indicator and measure well functioning, monitor it, use a proper indicator and report on it. The second point is that if we want to raise uh, the level of mathematics uh, um, capabilities, I want to propose, uh, well, it's it, through other studies, and this is a very important uh, uh, priority, is to prioritize the first thousand days of learning. In other words, grade R, R, grade R, and grade one. And this idea comes from the health sector who prior in their interventions prioritize the first thousand days of life in which they have very focused intervention of nutrition, sanitation, vaccinations as a way to ensure that child mortality decrease, uh, mother mortality, mother's mortality decreased, et cetera. And in the same way, borrowing on that model and recognizing that mathematical knowledge is hierarchical in nature. If you don't have basics, you can't build up and you can't fill up uh, in between. And all the research on, on cognitive development shows Already by grade three, and whatever the learners sort of demonstrated grade three for reading or mathematics, that already you can predict what's their educational trajectory is going to be, what's their social trajectory, what is their work trajectory going to be. So this investment in the first thousand days of schooling is very important. And and, and, and as we said, if the more math skills you come in, the more you would gain. And if we want to disrupt inter, uh, intergenerational poverty, this is where we need to focus on. And just to give you some sort of statistics that if we look at the homes, just one third of the learners, uh, parents do activities like reading books, playing with alphabets, uh, singing songs, et cetera. And so the two recommendations is, how do we create outside the schooling system a stimulating edu entertainment and, and using traditional and social media. And again, it's a role that if, if NACI is, um, works in a joined up government, a cross government kind of role, you can, commu you, you can uh, catalyze uh, such a thing. And further to, as we said, the, the other South African story besides achievement is that we're very good at policy, although the set. Uh, Pali will, will disagree of uh, implementation is poor. And again, for NACI to report through its STI indicators on how, no, nope, what happened there? Sorry, can you put the presentation on again, please? Okay. And, and for NACI to, to take on these kinds of uh, monitoring indicators. The last point I want to make is that we have a very perplexing trend about, you know, uh, students take mathematics up to grade nine. In grade 10, you choose to take either mathematics or mathematical literacy. And the, the mathematics, uh, straight mathematics is what you're gonna take you to your, technical subjects at university, et cetera, and maths literacy is supposed to be the, the less uh, difficult choice. Increasingly, more and more learners are taking maths literacy and very few are taking mathematics. And if we look, the, this is the data from, from the Western Cape. Uh, and if we look at last year or, so, or two years ago, 51,000 wrote the matric examination. Of that, uh, 16,000, that's just 30% took mathematics. 70% of the matriculants in the Western Cape, the best performing uh, province, took uh, mathematics. Of that 16,000, 
7,000, sorry, 5,700, that's 17%, I think, passed mathematics with more than 50%. And I can't see the figures on from me. I think about 3,000, which is about 700, which is about 4%, passed mathematics with more than 60%. So in the Western Cape, the best performing students, this is the caliber of students that are going to come out to go to medicine, engineering, thought leadership, et cetera. And again, uh, and, and this is surprising because if we look at their performance at grade nine, and uh, sorry, in the Tim study, the, the predictions are way more than those 30% should be, are capable to take mathematics and to pass mathematics. And so the subject choice is a big issue that we need to, to address because the potential is there. It's, the minister said, try to do things that's not gonna cost more money. So the potential is there. Why are they making these choices? And again, for NACI, how to incentivize, promote, and monitor mathematics choices. And I think the monitoring through the STI indicator will again raise prominence to this and could be a useful one. Thanks. Okay. Thanks uh, very much. I think that sets the scene from you know, the, the, the one end of the pipeline. I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Lynn Morris to maybe give us some insights as to what happens in tertiary environments and what is needed to effectively uh, promote education at that level. Thanks, Himla. Um, well, thanks all of you for staying. You obviously care about um, training and higher education, so thank you. And I'm not going to give a talk or, or I'm just going to talk about I guess a few key themes that we're thinking about at FITS which really apply to the higher education system uh, more broadly um, and that is about our particularly our PhD students and uh, the mode of training and uh, so one of the things that you know that we're thinking about is um, you know this I think this apprenticeship model that we mostly use um, you know is very supervisory intensive it keeps students in silos, um, and actually, it um, I think it's a lonely experience for a lot of our PhD students. And so one of the things we're seriously thinking about, you know, is this cohort PhD, where students all start together. Um, they have, you know, skills building sessions. They're monitored very closely. So I think one of the things, you know, that we, that we need to do is also identify very early on uh, the students that are not going to make it rather than let them drag on for years and years. Um, and so that will also, you know, help with the time, the, the, the duration of, of the study. So to have really early warning indicators for students that, uh, that really should be doing something else. So we really are thinking a lot about this cohort PhD. It's been done certainly in kind of niche areas. Certainly uh, many of you may know the Carter program has been very successful in public health. And the plan is now to start really thinking about this on a more institutional um, basis, because what it does do is it also encourages peer education, because they all start together. Um, and, uh, and also then it becomes multidisciplinary, because they're all coming from, you know, from different, different aspects. And it also solves our supervisor gap, because one of the things we've really had a problem with is just finding enough supervisors if you have this one-on-one -on -one, um, you know, mentoring program. So we think it's going to, you know, solve a few things. Of course, it does mean we have to change some rules <laughs> because obviously, um, uh, you know, there's there are going to be some, you know, some some changes. But anyway, that. So the other thing we also really thinking a lot about is mobility, networking, and collaboration, particularly on the African continent, and really creating these research hubs uh, that our students will uh, circulate between, and and again, you know, building up. Um, students who kind of have a broader view of things uh, and also um, you know a, um, think about their research in terms of you know the global south issues as well um, and I mean there's some of those net networks already starting those of you you know part of Arua for instance um, but to really make that much broader the other thing that we uh, you know are thinking about as well is actually the curricula what we're teaching our students um, and and with this new focus on innovation one of the things that we are wanting to do is introduce a PG dip in innovation. And this is a dual study program. So it's actually, they will actually get two degrees, a PG dip as well as the PhD, but they'll do this right at the beginning of their PhD. 
Um, and that's really to sensitize them to why they're doing their research. How does it matter? What's the, the next step? And to also involve the people who will give them a problem they have to solve and involve the people whose problem they're trying to solve you know, in, in, in the research. So to really just sensitize people to, you know, why they're doing this research and why does it matter? So, so and to do that as a one year um, PG dip um, before they start their PhDs. And again, that will require rules change because it does mean the, P the PhD will take an extra year. But, uh, you know, but that's the, that's the thinking there. I guess finally, I just wanna talk about, you know, changing the mindset of actually students and researchers to thinking about innovation and you know why they um, you know why they do research and and um, how they can make their research more impactful. I think you all know many researchers think the publication is the end result, um, and of course for some research it is that. But you know a lot of investment goes into to research, and so we really do need to support it actually. And I think a lot of it is about supporting to the next level and about, and about changing a mindset as well. Um, I mean, we saw it in, in COVID, you know, that, that universities made a major contribution, well, the major contribution to generating new knowledge uh, to deal with the COVID epidemic. So universities are those great melting pots where you've got lots of smart people and lots of different experts who can apply their, their minds to, you know, to solving a, a, a problem. And so, um, and so to really start getting more of that kind of interaction and, um, and, and getting, um, getting our researchers to think beyond just the, the academic uh, pursuits. And so we really do also have a program of trying to you know, sensitize um, our academics to, to this, but it's actually also about some structural changes. It's actually about making it easier for people to get to that next level. Of course, we talked a lot about funding, a lot of it is about funding, but are there also some other barriers? Um, you know, I think a lot of academics feel the intellectual property policy is a barrier, and we need to work around some of those, those issues. And one of the things we're also doing is we're going to be differentiating between how we treat our students and how we treat our staff, um, because, the, you know, the staff obviously on our payroll, the students aren't, and actually the students should own their own IP. And we think that that will also reduce the barrier um, for, for students to, you know, to engage in, in that. Um, and I mean, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, these earlier sessions um, talking about, um, you know, some of these funding opportunities, because I feel there's a huge gap between what we're doing at a university and actually all of this really exciting stuff that's going on in business and somehow we're not finding each other. And uh, perhaps, I don't know who, uh, <laughs> you know, that we can make that. So that's what I mean by a structural change you know, to try and um, make those links, uh, you know, uh, more solid, or to make it a condition, you know, the COEs that the NRF has invested years and years of money into, is uh, to not just have them end, but to actually think about how that research is um, taken forward. I mean, I know at WITS, in fact, Glenda mentioned it, you know, one of the, the spin outs that we have at WITS called Smart Spot, which was really important in COVID. Um, uh, some of you may know Prof. Bavesh Khanna, you know, it's actually stumbling and I'm not sure it's going to survive. And then when I hear about all these, you know, amazing opportunities, I just think we're not talking to the right people. And so thank you very much for setting this up and for this invitation, because it's given me a lot of ideas. And um, I hope that this is a regular event. So thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Lynn, for sharing those insights. I think there's a continuity. I'd like to call uh, um, for a fellow. I have I have a plan for Michael. Um, but, and if you could just tell us how the NRF fits into this ecosystem, but also share some of your thoughts. I've heard you speak previously about the impact of science and how can we use this education training pipeline for uh, promoting impact of science. Over to you. Good afternoon, Felix. I'll be very brief. I just go straight to the point. But since you just start by saying, um, I agree with what my colleagues have said, um, Vijay and Aline. So I'll just add just a few points 
before I then come to the NRF aspect. The first one is that the question around the education system being perhaps in a space where it's facing challenges, I think is a common cause across the world. Everyone knows that. And the bigger question is around what is the future of higher education and its purpose in the challenges that, that the globe is facing at the moment. But one of the particular problems that South Africa has faced has been around affordability of higher education or access. That was one of the issues that we've had. You may remember one of the presidents raised the free uh, higher education and so on, but that's one of the issues that we have. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we've picked recently has been that while the universities in the global north uh, are facing a decreasing number of students, when you come to the global south, the numbers have actually doubled over the last four years, with Africa and India uh, playing a very big, a big role in that context. So what then happens is that you then start saying, oh, this is Africa or the global south, there's different challenges that we have to address, which probably the global north doesn't really have those problems. So it's a question of how do we then tailor make our education system and its systems to ensure that we can address the challenges that are relevant for us. So of course, I'm not going to talk about technology. I think we all know technology can be a, you know, a, a conjunct that can assist us in closing this gap. We don't have enough university systems, in my view. I don't think we have enough universities for that matter on the African continent, but that's where we have these gaps. So one of the challenges that we have as well, before I just come to the point, it has been a point around um, the gap between basic education and higher education, which is what uh, VJ covered as well. If you look at the choice of mathematics and other subjects, I'm not going to get into that now. I think I fully agree with what she said. But when you look into that and you look at the number of students who actually fail at universities, the number is quite shocking. So there was a study that was done by the ad, um, not so long ago, and that looked at the intake of 2015 over a three year period. So of people who were doing BSc, just a normal BSc, by the end of their third year, only 31% had completed their degree which means it's almost less than one third will complete on time. The other one third almost completed in twice the time, while 32% completely dropped. That's the reality of what we face. So of course, if we want to then have enough capacity to address our problems in South Africa, we need to think differently about the education system. We have to think of how do we ensure that there's a good throughput throughout from you know, uh, undergraduate all the way to the uh, to the top. But the gap is not at university level. It starts at high school. It starts in, in, in the basic education sector. What MIT started doing uh, now, and I'm just gonna give this example. They've started this issue where they are saying, for those top learners who really want, who are doing very well in high school, they can actually choose to start doing university subjects while they're in high school. Once you do that, you get credit, to the point that when, by the time you come to university, already you have passed certain first year uh, modules or courses, therefore you, you can sort of be on the first track. I think that's something that South Africa has to think very thoroughly about. Then say, what can we really do to actually improve the throughput of learners who are coming from the basic education sector or space, going to the to the post uh, uh, school ed and and um, uh, uh, the higher education space? So I'm not going to get into that. The issue now, in terms of the NRF, we, we have a challenge that my take, again, this is something that I've, I know I have my bosses here, the board member and <laughs> Claire there. <laughs> the, one of the things that I've raised was that we need to actually make sure that we can actually translate research towards innovation. That's a critical aspect where we are saying we have challenges. How do we then make sure that the translation of the basic research, fundamental research that's done by a researcher at a university can end up addressing uh, joblessness that we're facing in the economy. How do you ensure that you can sort of have a, a complete conduit of you know, research going to products that will end up in the market? And that's the only way that we are going to create jobs. And that will then close the gap of funding that we have as a challenge. South Africa, I think you have seen the 0.69% of the GDP that we are spending the R&D is very, very, very small. That's about what, 40, I mean, that's about, uh, 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 yeah, about 45 billion rands per annum. That's a very small amount. If you look at that amount and you look at how much NRF gets in terms of funding the research, we only get about 4 billion rands of that 45. That's about 10% of 
the gross expenditure in R and D. That's very small. And within that four billion rands, part of it has to go to maintain high expensive infrastructure. You know the SKAs and the likes, which means the money that's going to research or funding research is very very small. It's about half of that, which is the five percent of that small number which we're saying it's, it has, has to be changed. So in terms of uh, what we do as an NRM, we, we are focusing on, of course, developing the capacity and making sure that uh, we have graduates, at least at postgraduate level, who are more relevant to the society, who can address the issue of you know, joblessness and all these issues, you know, poverty and employment and inequalities, big challenges to say, how do we ensure that we have a core that is very relevant in addressing those issues? But when you look into that and you look at what I just mentioned now, where we're finding shortfall. Now, as I'm talking to you, I have a, sh a, short, a shortage of 2 billion rand of students who meet all the requirements of funding that I cannot fund for no any other reason other than this, I just don't have money. 2 billion rand, they meet all the requirements. So access still remain a challenge. And the 2 billion rand that I'm talking about does not include the students who are discouraged, who are no longer applying to the NRF because they don't have, you know, they've lost faith because I have applied, I didn't get the money and so forth. So we also have funding shortfall for the researchers, but what we've been doing, we've been focusing on, and I'm closing here now, we've been closing, I mean, we've been looking into mobility, ensuring that students can then be exposed to the private sector. We have signed arrangements with Canadian entities, for instance, where we're saying, mm -hmm. can you take our graduate students and expose them to the private sector? We'll deal with how we pay that. But the idea is that as opposed to, to collaboration and mobility within the university system, how do we actually bring the private sector into that particular space? Because once they are more exposed, maybe more doors will then open. They can then start their own company that later on will employ, then later on funds research and so forth. That's the whole idea that we're looking into. So when we talk of the, the transformation or the translational element, we are saying basically, we want research that is publicly funded to make impact in society. Whether it's in the humanities and social sciences, whether it's in the same sciences, it doesn't really matter. We need to find a ways of coordinating all these sciences to the point that at the end, the education system, the higher education system, the research system is all responding to the challenges that South Africa is facing. That's the only way that we can survive. So I have addressed your question very briefly, but I think let me let me pause here for now. Thank you. Succinct and informative. Thank you. All righty, and now for the man of the moment. Did in did in din. <laughs> I'm going to ask Professor Michael Khan if uh, to paint a picture for us of his imagination of where STEM should go. Over to you. And the mic is on this side. Which uh, one? Okay, I'm going, to do hello, hello, I'm going to do something slightly different. You know, at the end of a long day, when everybody's energy is flagged and shouting, waving hands and that sort of nonsense, no. So what I, what I want to do is an auction. Okay, and the auction goes like this. Um, those of you who believe of the PhD graduates of our leading universities, who come from Africa. Those of you could, who believe that the African PhD graduates from our leading universities go to Europe on qualification, let's say 70 or 80 percent. Will you raise your hands, please? One. All right, if it's not 80 percent, is it 70 percent? Hands? 50%? No, no, they've completed and they are told by home affairs, get lost. Where do they go? Where do they go? Come on people, don't pretend you know because you do not know. Thank you. But Himla was in the presentation. 70% go home. Okay. So our leading universities, your little place included, contribute to brain circulation. And this has been a phenomenon of the last few years. Well, the last 15 years, at least. And it's now being messed up. 
because of the creeping xenophobia right across government. I'm going to say it like it is, it's the end of the day. So you asked for vision and I'd like to provide it. You cannot state in the decadal plan that we are committed to internationalization and international mobility if on the one hand, you are restricting the flow of knowledge, skills, and knowledge workers. It's fine to control borders, to manage borders, but if you want to grow, attract knowledge, get rid of the barriers. I'm looking very strongly at the DST people, DSI people, get rid of the barriers and recognize that every country that has become an innovation giant has attracted skills from wherever it can get them. Once you've reached high income status, you can stop it. But until then, grab what you can. That's what the Lisbon agenda in Europe was all about. So that's the first takeaway. The second, building on what Vijay was saying before me, is policy change takes a very long time. It's a long walk to policy fruition. If you have the energy, go back 10 years, go to the ministerial review, or Minister Pandor, 2012, virtually every sentinel recommendation of that uh, uh, committee is now being put into place. It starts with the presidential commission, whatever you want to call it, which would be the prioritization and agenda setting body that's happening. The next is for NACI to be recapacitated to fulfill the roles as beautifully outlined. The third was to introduce the sectoral innovation funds modeled on the Brazilians which is a sovereign wealth fund. Paddy, you've run away, but it is. The, third, the fourth was to recognize the only way you coordinate is through money, and it was to reinstate the science vote. Minister Pando announced that to the parliament uh, very even before the report was released, it hasn't happened. And I can go on and on. Now, the interesting thing about this all was when we uh, had the uh, public launch, and now we're waiting to see what the press would take up. Guess what the main headline in Business Day was the following day? It wasn't what wonderful genius came out of that committee headed by uh, 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 Nona, okay, Loyusu. It wasn't that at all. Minister's committee advises that uh, teaching should be declared an essential service. Amazing. And Colleagues in the room, that is, in fact, the elephant in this room that's not being recognized. Even Vijay did not mention the teachers. I'm going to mention the teachers. You mentioned uh, different modes of instruction. One of the keys to getting it right is, number one, to ensure that your instructors, and it's definitely not the case in architecture, and medicine, I'm looking very strongly because of where you work. It is to make sure that your instructors have recent relevant experience at the level they are training themselves, and it's got to be recent. This applies particularly to TVET. The TVET sector is broken. There are maybe three or four colleges that excel, but overall it is broken because the instructors do not have the competency background, they've got the academic background, and bless them all, the universities are not helping in giving them that skill because the universities themselves are culpable through their BEDs of not ensuring that their teachers and their trainers have recent relevant experience. You can't get away from it. I, these days I read quite a lot of military history. If you want to win a battle, you've got to send in properly trained troops. You've got to have trainers who train the troops and know what they're doing. Otherwise, it's a losing battle and you're simply going to slaughter people. I've strayed away from my own notes. The next one is, it was stated by, by Vijay that uh, education is central to the project. A lot has been said about the stasis of the innovation system. Why is it not happening? Purus asked the question, he was shot and he's left. Um, why is it not happening? Well, the truth is people, the innovation system, guess what? It relies on people. The way we assess, and I used to do the R&D survey, the way we assess for your benefit and yours, the way we assess it, we do accounting. We say, who have you got? How many hours a day do they work? And what does it cost? That's called labor cost. 
Then to labor cost, you add, what does it cost to keep your office going? Current expenditure. And lastly, infrastructure. And we get the numbers. So we can tell you quite accurately from the survey that the number of researchers in our blessed country has gone like that. Now, here is the tricky part of it. If the number of researchers, FTE researchers, has gone like that, but expenditure has gone like that, can you explain? It's the same number of people. The answer is they are being overpaid. Now, I can be very nice about it because no one pays me. I'm in the market and I earn my living out there. You're all overpaid. The researcher in South Africa by global standards is, is sitting, this can't be me, it's you, is, is sitting at the top of the tree. Civil servants in South Africa are the highest, among the highest paid in the world on PPP basis. So do not be surprised that the system can't grow because it's become unaffordable. And these are some of the underlying tensions that have not been discussed in this meeting. And I will argue them empirically if given the opportunity and put to the put to the stake to answer last two points uh, what kind of research leads to things in the marketplace it's use-oriented research what problem are you trying to solve so it comes down to critical selection at the beginning the nrf commissioned an impact evaluation six or seven years ago and the answer that came out of that, the COEs and others where there was impact, it had been designed in from day one. If you ask for it when it's all over, that's wishful thinking. What problem are you trying to solve? Tell us. If you convince us, we will fund you. Use-oriented research, absolutely vital. Um, the last is a real throw, throwaway. We heard a lot about econometrics. Uh, I'm, I'm mathematically trained. I don't do econometrics, but I can read it. And if the data set you're working with is flawed, then guess what? Your results are going to be flawed. So we, we had somebody saying that um, uh, firms who do R&D are less productive, clear, less productive than the others. The problem with that statement is it's based on a flawed data set because the people doing work on our treasury data set, and I need to explain, it goes back to 2004, when the HSRC, SESTI struck a deal with Status A and SARS to get access to the, ta the tax records in order to develop, Gerald, in order to develop the business register for the first official innovation survey. That principle was then established sometime after um, United Nations University wider in Helsinki got into bed with SARS and was given access out for anonymized records. And after that, other people got in on the act, including a company called Rebel, et cetera, et cetera, and the World Bank as well. Now, just bear with me for one last minute. This is particularly for, for Ilsa as well. If you look at the study by the World Bank, the, the lead author was Schaffer, 2018. They tell you with a straight face, that over a five-year period, the um, R&D expenditure by business was four billion. What? The HSRC found 20 billion. And now you want to use that survey, Ilza, to inform government policy? Please, 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 please get real. Get the data set right. Now, I'm not blaming the, research, the econometricians who work for it because the data set is what the data set is. And you are relying on a declaration from a company, somebody, a, a CA or someone else to put in a box R&D. They don't have a clue. Some will get it big, some will get it small. So on average, it's what it is, but it's not the way to do it. So I'm having a go. You gave me a platform. You made a big mistake, but I'm enjoying myself. And the last one is trust. Why are we as we are? Trust is broken down completely. Government, in all of the documents I read, there's a very, very low level of trust by government in business. If we don't control you, if we don't tell you what to do, you will not deliver the goodies. That is not the way to build a nation. You work with who you have to work under the conditions of the day. 
That's quite problematic. And this one is for any Marxist in the room. If you look at the industrialization program under Stalin, some lament him, some don't. Up to 1935, who built the factories, who designed the factories in the Soviet Union? It wasn't the Russians. It was the Germans, the Austrians, and believe it, the Americans. And they were in joint ventures until the Supreme Soviet said, you know what, it's time we did it ourselves, and they terminated the joint ventures. So you do what you have to do under the conditions you've got. I think I'm quoting Paddy uh, on Marx on history. Read widely, think critically, respect China, they experiment a lot, and when things don't work, they stop them. What we do when things don't work is we create a new institution, another one. How do we ever get away with it? It, it really beggars belief. So on a positive note, we have had an absolutely wonderful conversation. I treasure it, I value it. We've all participated beautifully. We've been treated to amazing people on the platform. Wonderful facilitation. Uh, I don't know about the food because I'm waiting for it still, and I'm a bit wobbly. <laughs> but um, let's go forward to the next stage. Let's look forward to a properly capacitated Naki that can fulfill its historic mission. It has not been enabled to do that to this day. Institutionalize foresight, have M&E that people respect, ask the right questions and make it all happen. So thank you very much. I don't know if I've usurped your role to close. Maybe I have, um, but I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. I promised you a good uh, cocktail, and I'm sure you will agree with me that everyone has delivered in their participation quota to make up this exotic tequila-based margarita. Uh, from my position as a moderator, I just want to add a few things that I never got to say during the context of the day. With respect to the STI COVID-19 and future pandemics, I, I'm sure most of you may be aware that uh, the uh, DPME, in collaboration with uh, the Government Technology Advisory Center, or GTAC, together with the NRF, uh, produced a COVID-19 country report that was launched in June this year. I strongly advise that you look at it because it's, it's, it's quite a, a good look at what we did right, what we got wrong, and recommendations for future pandemics. In the morning session, we heard from Don DeToy and from our Nigerian colleague. I also want to say that in 2019, the Inter-Academy Partnership produced a very good document on the way in which uh, medicine, science, and engineering can be utilized to address the challenges in Africa. And the reason I know about it, because I was part of it, not that I contributed exclusively, but I got to learn a lot about what the infrastructure on the African continent is and where we lack uh, uh, certain competencies. So for those of you who are scholars in that uh, region, or, or that area, I, I strongly recommend that. And also to say that ASAF uh, produced a COVID booklet for targeted primarily for young learners and school teachers, where we got some of our members and other uh, brilliant scientists to try to translate the, uh, the scientific jargon into easy to understand information regarding the COVID pandemic. And so that was also quite a nice uh, intervention during the pandemic. And uh, yeah, so thank you to our uh, chair and acting CEO for giving us this opportunity. And thank you to you, the audience, for staying with us, despite the fact that we went over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, Chairperson, I think you'll agree with me that one day session is not sufficient. I mean, you've seen from the deliberations and all that, that we need uh, 
I think maybe two days or so. But anyway, um, colleagues, I'm not going to take time. I'm not, I hope that uh, all of you obviously were present and those that were uh, on the virtual platform, you've taken notes. I have uh, prepared about eight pages of notes but I think it's just too much. Maybe what I will do is that I'll just uh, pick just one or two from, from, from each page. But I think important is just to say that, um, you know, we've had two days of interesting, exciting, and, and, and really incisive, uh, you know, knowledge exchange uh, sessions, um, you know, focusing on presentations, uh, focusing on interactive discussions that we've had, and, and also on the panel discussion. So what I will say is that um, just, you know, broadly, we looked at different areas. And in terms of uh, the DKL plan, as we know, um, the goal is just to increase the NSA contribution, uh, you know, to achieve national objectives and international cooperative co cooperation through pen uh, uh, Africanism. So I'm not going to say much except that, um, I mean, the Tatele indicated that um, the two economies, big economies, South Africa and Nigeria, if we work together, obviously we can achieve much in terms of uh, STI issues. So on the STI development, uh, sustainability and transitions and inclusivity, I think we had very interesting discussions there, discussions centered around politics, economics, um, you know, social matters. And what Dr. Lehutla indicated earlier was that our macroeconomic system is not inclusive, it's not developmental, it's also not transformative, and mainly because of um, the system is very uh, capitalistic, and um, which by, uh, by design uh, is obviously a perpetrator of, uh, you know, uh, of poverty. But what came out, I think, uh, what was interesting that came out was the transformative innovation policy, which, which, which is centered around societal and environmental uh, you know, um, uh, challenges. And um, you know, it puts innovation at the center of, 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 of really um, you know, addressing those particular challenges. And I think what was also indicated was that um, we need to look at mainstreaming um, you know, gender and, um, and looking at really you know, uh, having the majority of our people um, understanding STI and also, um, you know, participating in S STI discussions. On the STI COVID-19 and future pandemics, uh, what was noted was that uh, South Africa has really benefited a lot in terms of uh, new technologies. We've, you know, produced our own diagnostics. We've also benefited in terms of investments and funding. But I think importantly is just to say that uh, what we've also learned that uh, was that Natural sciences are not um, the only important sciences, but importantly, we need to look at the human and also uh, economic sciences. And um, in, for, for future uh, pandemics, we need to, uh, to institutionalize the lessons learned so that we are in, in, in a position to, to use our experiences to tackle uh, the future pandemics. On the STI investment and incentive uh, schemes, um, we have noted the deadlines in terms of business expenditure, personnel, foreign funding, and the share of foreign, uh, you know, uh, what is it? The share of uh, patents at UST, uh, USPTO offices. And, um, you know, so there has been consistent deadline in terms of uh, both the inputs and, and outputs. And I think it's something that we need to ponder on and look at um, ways of addressing, uh, uh, you know, those particular challenges. And um, from the DSI, there are many incentives that are being provided, R&D, tax incentive sector in, uh, innovation fund, um, and, and um, also the innovation fund amongst, um, uh, you know, the many that are being uh, provided by the department. Um, on the innovation and entrepreneurship, um, those two aspects, um, innovation and entrepreneurship, are obviously drivers of economic development, as we all know. And I think what came out importantly from the discussion was that institutional capital, um, which is uh, subordinated capital from government, you know, it's important because it helps in terms of de-risking projects. And it, it, it also it is important in terms of closing the uh, innovation chasm. So once we have that, then we are in a position then to leverage some funding from venture capitalists. And it was importantly noted that techno entrepreneurs create um, real impact through job creation, uh, through localization, industrialization, and also you know accelerating uh, growth in the economy. 
And then lastly, on the ed education, training, and innovation, um, we understand that a successful STI is dependent on people, knowledge, and, and also systems. And um, uh, the doctor indicated that um, he's, uh, she's recommending that Nike should uh, focus and concentrate on a no fee schools um, in an effort to address meds uh, inequality. And in terms of the higher education sector, um, uh, Prof mentioned that uh, participatory peer education and um, multidisciplinary uh, mentorship programs uh, for PhD, mobility and networking in the form of research hubs are quite important. And uh, those are things that are being introduced at Bates University. And I do believe that um, the entire national system of innovation will uh, take some nuggets from that. And um, I think lastly, um, we need to come up with new strategies to improve um, the throughput of learners from basic education to higher education. Um, we also need to create a conducive environment to attract skills and knowledge all over the world. So I think that's uh, that's uh, broadly what was discussed today. And I think from us, Chairperson, um, as Nike, our responsibility now is to consolidate all the information that we have uh, received from 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 um, the sessions that we had today. We need to obviously synthesize that information, uh, strategically critique it, and extract whatever that is useful from that, and 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 and, and um, share with the entire NSI. And I think importantly to uh, you know craft some recommendations. Uh, to the minister. Um, again, colleagues, um, just to mention that obviously we've had two uh, interesting days last night, uh, gala dinner, today, um, whole day of um, you know interesting sessions and all that. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for participating. Of course, all of you that are still stay uh, are still behind. You are obviously waiting for lunch. Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I, let me also extend my um, gratitude to the Secretariat for organizing this um, this auspicious event. Uh, we do believe that we're going to have uh, some more in the you know uh, you know in the future, and um, to the chairperson and uh, the the Nike councillors, um, professors you know from universities, from science councils, uh, stakeholders in the industry all of the actors in the national system of innovation, let me thank you for, for, for participating and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>